Section 0 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Beeswax Candle. Tracts for the Times, Volume 1, by John Henry Newman et al. Advertisement by John Henry Newman. The following tracts were published with the object of contributing something towards the practical revival of doctrines, which, although held by the great divines of our Church, at present have become obsolete with the majority of her members, and are withdrawn from public view even by the more learned and orthodox few who still adhere to them. The Apostolic Succession, the Holy Catholic Church, were principles of action in the minds of our predecessors of the 17th century. But, in proportion as the maintenance of the Church has been secured by law, her ministers have been under the temptation of leaning on an arm of flesh instead of her own divinely provided discipline. A temptation increased by political events and arrangements which need not here be more than alluded to. A lamentable increase in sectarianism has followed, being occasioned, in addition to other more obvious causes, first by the cold aspect which the new church doctrines have presented to the religious sensibilities of the mind, next to their meagerness in suggesting motives to restrain it from seeking out a more influential discipline. Doubtless obedience to the law of the land, and careful maintenance of decency and order, the topics in usage among us, are plain duties of the gospel, and a reasonable ground for keeping in communion with the established church. Yet, if providence has graciously provided for our weakness more interesting and constraining motives, it is a sin thanklessly to neglect them. Just as it would be a mistake to rest the duties of temperance or justice on the mere law of natural religion, when they are mercifully sanctioned in the gospel by the more winning authority of our Saviour Christ. Experience has shown the inefficacy of the mere injunctions of church order, however scripturally enforced, in restraining from schism the awakened and anxious sinner, who goes to a dissenting preacher because, as he expresses it, he gets good from him. And though he does not stand excused in God's sight for yielding to the temptation, surely the ministers of the church are not blameless if, by keeping back the more gracious and consoling truths provided for the little ones of Christ, they indirectly lead him to it. Had he been taught as a child, that the sacraments, not preaching, are the sources of divine grace, that the apostolical ministry had a virtue in it which went out over the whole church when sought by the prayer of faith, that fellowship with it was a gift and privilege as well as a duty, we could not have had so many wanderers from our fold, nor so many cold hearts within it. This instance may suggest many others as the superior influence of an apostolical over a mere secular method of teaching. The awakened mind knows its wants, but cannot provide for them, and in its hunger will feed upon ashes, if it cannot obtain the pure milk of the word. Methodism and popery are in different ways the refuge of those whom the church stints of the gifts of grace. They are the foster mothers of abandoned children. The neglect of the daily service, the desecration of festivals, the Eucharist scantily administered, insubordination permitted in all ranks of the church, orders and offices imperfectly developed, the want of societies for particular religious objects, and the like deficiencies, lead the feverish mind, desirous of event to its feelings and a stricter rule of life, to the smaller religious communities, to prayer and Bible meetings, and ill-advised institutions and societies, on the one hand, on the other, to the solemn and captivating services by which popery gains its proselytes. Moreover, the multitude of men cannot teach or guide themselves, an injunction given them to depend on their private judgment, cruel in itself, is doubly hurtful, as throwing them on such teachers as speak daringly and promise largely, and not only aid, but supersede individual exertion. These remarks may serve as a clue, for those who care to pursue it, to the views which have led to the publication of the following tracts. The Church of Christ was intended to cope with human nature in all its forms, and surely the gifts vouchsafed it are adequate for that gracious purpose. There are zealous sons and servants of her English branch, 
who see with sorrow that she is defrauded of her full usefulness by particular theories and principles of the present age, which interfere with the execution of one portion of her commission. And while they consider that the revival of this portion of truth is especially adapted to break up existing parties in the church, and to form instead a bond of union among all who love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity, they believe that nothing but these neglected doctrines, faithfully preached, will repress that extension of popery for which the ever-multiplying divisions of the religious world are too clearly preparing the way. Oxford, The Feast of All Saints, 1834 End of section 0《ト Tract I of Tracts for the Times, Volume I》by John Henry Newman et al. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Thoughts on the Ministerial Commission Respectfully Addressed to the Clergy by John Henry Newman I am but one of yourselves, a presbyter, and therefore I conceal my name, lest I should take too much on myself by speaking in my own person. Yet speak I must for the times are very evil, yet no one speaks against them. Is this not so? Do we not look one upon another, yet perform nothing? Do we not all confess the peril into which the church has come, yet sit still each in his own retirement, as if mountains and seas cut off brother from brother? Therefore, suffer me, while I try to draw you forth from those pleasant retreats, which it has been our blessedness hitherto to enjoy, to contemplate the condition and prospects of our Holy Mother in a practical way, so that one and all may unlearn that idle habit which has grown upon us, of owning the state of things to be bad, yet doing nothing to remedy it. Consider a moment. Is it fair, is it dutiful, to suffer our bishops to stand the brunt of the battle without doing our part to support them? Upon them comes the care of all the churches, this cannot be helped. Indeed, it is their glory. None of us would wish in the least to deprive them of the duties, the toils, the responsibilities of their high office. And black event as it would be for the country. Yet, as far as they are concerned, we could not wish them a more blessed termination of their course than the spoiling of their goods and martyrdom. To them we willingly and affectionately relinquish their high privileges and honours. We encroach not upon the rights of the successors of the apostles. We touch not their sword and crozier. Yet surely we may be their shield-bearers in the battle without offence, and by our voice and deeds be to them what Luke and Timothy were to St. Paul. Now, let me come at once to the subject which leads me to address you. Should the government and country so far forget their God as to cast off the church, to deprive it of its temporal honours and substance, on what will you rest the claim of respect and attention which you make upon your flocks? Hitherto you have been upheld by your birth, your education, your wealth, your connections. Should these secular advantages cease, on what must Christ's ministers depend? Is not this a serious practical question? We know how miserable is the state of religious bodies not supported by the state. Look at the dissenters on all sides of you, and you'll see at once that their ministers, depending simply upon the people, become the creatures of the people. Are you content that this should be your case? Alas, can a greater evil befall Christians than for their teachers to be guided by them instead of guiding. How can we hold fast the form of sound words and keep that which is committed to our trust if our influence is to depend simply upon our popularity? Is it not our very office to oppose the world? Can we then allow ourselves to court it? To preach smooth things and prophesy deceits? To make the way of life easy to the rich and indolent? and to bribe the humbler classes by excitements in strong, intoxicating doctrine. Surely it must not be so. And the question recurs, on what are we to rest our authority when the state deserts us? 
Christ has not left his church without claim of its own upon the attention of men. Surely not. A hard master he cannot be, to bid us oppose the world, yet give us no credentials for so doing. There are some who rest their divine mission upon their own unsupported assertion. Others who rest it upon their popularity. Others on their success. And others who rest it upon their temporal distinctions. This last case has perhaps been too much our own. I fear we have neglected the real ground on which our authority is built, our apostolical descent. We have been born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The Lord Jesus Christ gave his spirit to his apostles. They, in turn, laid their hands on those who should succeed them, and these again on others. And so the sacred gift has been handed down to our present bishops, who have appointed us as their assistants, and in some sense representatives. Now, every one of us believes this. I know that some will at first deny they do. Still, they do believe it. Only it is not sufficiently, practically, impressed on our minds. They do believe it, for it is the doctrine of the ordination service, which they have recognised as truth in the most solemn season of their lives. In order then, not to prove, but to remind and impress, I entreat your attention to the words used when you were made ministers of Christ's church. The office of deacon was thus committed to you. Take thou authority to execute the office of a deacon in the church of God committed unto thee, in the name, etc. And the priest taught thus, Receive the Holy Ghost for the work and office of a priest in the church of God, now committed unto thee by the imposition of our hands. Whose sins thou dost forgive, they are forgiven, and whose sins thou dost retain, they are retained. And be thou a faithful dispenser of the word of God, and of his holy sacraments, in the name, etc. These, I say, were words spoken to us, and received by us, when we were brought nearer to God than at any other time of our lives. I know the grace of ordination is contained in the laying on of hands, not in any form of words. Yet in our own case, as has ever been usual in the church, words of blessing have accompanied the act. Thus we have confessed before God our belief that from the bishop who ordained us we received the Holy Ghost, the power to bind and to loose, to administer the sacraments and to preach. Now how is he able to give these great gifts? Whence is his right? Are these words idle, which will be taking God's name in vain? Or do they express merely a wish, which surely is very far below their meaning? Or do they not rather indicate that the speaker is conveying a gift? Surely they can mean nothing short of this. But whence, I ask, is his right to do so? Has he any right except as having received the power from those who consecrated him to be a bishop? He could not give what he had never received. It is plain, then, that he but transmits, and that the Christian ministry is a succession. And if we trace back the power of ordination from hand to hand, of course, we shall come to the apostles at last. We know we do, as a plain historical fact. And therefore all we who have been ordained clergy, in the very form of our ordination, acknowledge the doctrine of the apostolical succession. And for the same reason, we must necessarily consider none to be really ordained who have not thus been ordained. For if ordination is a divine ordinance, it must be necessary. And if it is not a divine ordinance, how dare we use it? Therefore all who use it, all of us, must consider it necessary. As well might we pretend the sacraments are not necessary to salvation while we make use of the offices of the liturgy. For when God appoints means of grace, they are the means. I do not see how anyone can escape from this plain view of the subject, except, as I have already hinted, by declaring that the words do not mean all that they say. But only reflect what a most unseemly time for random words is that in which ministers are set apart for their office. 
Do we not adopt a liturgy in order to hinder inconsiderate idle language? And shall we, in the most sacred of all services, write down, subscribe, and use again and again forms of speech which have not been weighed and cannot be taken strictly? Therefore, my dear brethren, act up to your professions. Let it not be said that you have neglected a gift. For if you have the spirit of the apostles on you, surely this is a great gift. Stir up the gift of God which is in you. Make much of it. Show your value of it. Keep it before your minds as an honourable badge. Far higher than that secular respectability or cultivation or polish or learning or rank, which gives you a hearing with the many. Tell them of your gift. The times will soon drive you to do this if you mean to be still anything. But wait not for the times. Do not be compelled by the world's forsaking you to recur as if unwillingly to the high source of your authority. Speak out now before you are forced, both as glorying in your privilege and to ensure your rightful honour from your people. A notion has gone abroad that they can take away your power. They think they have given and can take it away. They think it lies in the church property, and they know that they have politically the power to confiscate that property. They have been deluded into a notion that present palpable usefulness, producible results, acceptableness to your flocks, that these and such like are the tests of your divine commission. Enlighten them in this matter. Exalt our holy fathers the bishops as the representatives of the apostles and the angels of the churches, and magnify your office as being ordained by them to take part in their ministry. But if you will not adopt my view of the subject, which I offer to you, not doubtingly, yet I hope respectfully at all events, choose your side. To remain neuter much longer will be itself to take a part. Choose your side, since side you shortly must, with one or other party, even though you do nothing. Fear to be of those whose line is decided for them by chance circumstances, and who may perchance find themselves with the enemies of Christ, while they think but to remove themselves from worldly politics. Such abstinence is impossible in troublous times. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. End of Tract 1《Tract Two, of Tracts for the Times, Volume One, by John Henry Newman et al. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. The Catholic Church by John Henry Newman. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. It is sometimes said that the clergy should abstain from politics, and that if a minister of Christ is political, he is not a follower of him who said, My kingdom is not of this world. Now, there is a sense in which this is true, but as it is commonly taken, it is very false. It is true that the mere affairs of this world should not engage a clergyman, but it is absurd to say that the affairs of this world should not at all engage his attention. If so, this world is not a preparation for another. Are we to speak when individuals sin, and not when a nation, which is but a collection of individuals? Must we speak to the poor, but not to the rich and powerful? In vain does St. James warn us against having the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ with respect of persons. In vain does the prophet declare to us the word of the Lord, that if the watchman of Israel speak not to warn the wicked from his way, his blood will be required at the watchman's hand. Complete our Lord's declaration concerning the nature of his kingdom, and you will see it is not at all inconsistent with the duty of our active and zealous interference in matters of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, he says, then would my servants fight. Here he has vouchsafed so to explain himself, that there is no room for misunderstanding his meaning. No one contends that his ministers ought to use the weapons of a carnal warfare. But surely, to protest, to warn, to threaten, to excommunicate, are not such weapons. Let us not be scared, 
from a plain duty by the mere force of a misapplied text. There is an unexceptional sense in which a clergyman may, nay, must be political. And above all, when the nation interferes with the rights and possessions of the church, it can with even less grace complain of the church interfering with the nation. With this introduction, let me call your attention to what seems a most dangerous infringement on our rights on the part of the state. The legislature has lately taken upon itself to remodel the Diocese of Ireland, a proceeding which involves the appointment of certain bishops over certain clergy, and of certain clergy under certain bishops, without the church being consulted in the matter. I do not say whether or not harm will follow from this particular act with reference to Ireland, but consider whether it be not in itself an interference with things spiritual. Are we content to be accounted the mere creation of the state, as schoolmasters and teachers may be, or soldiers, or magistrates, or other public officers? Did the state make us? Can it unmake us? Can it send out missionaries? Can it arrange dioceses? Surely all these are spiritual functions, and laymen may as well set about preaching and consecrating the bread and wine as assume these. I do not say the guilt is equal, but that, if the latter is guilt, the former is. Would St. Paul, with his good will, have suffered the Roman power to appoint Timothy, Bishop of Miletus, as well as Ephesus? Would Timothy, at such a bidding, have undertaken the charge? Is not the notion of such an order, such an obedience, absurd? Yet has it not been realised in what has lately happened? For in what is the English state at present different from the Roman formerly? Neither can be accounted members of the Church of Christ. No one can say the British legislature is in our communion, or is even Christian. What pretense then has it for, not merely advising, but superseding the ecclesiastical power? Bear with me while I express my fear that we do not as much as we ought, consider the force of that article of our belief, the one Catholic and Apostolic Church. This is a tenet so important as to have been in the creed from the beginning. It is mentioned there as a fact, and a fact to be believed, and therefore practical. Now what do we conceive is meant by it? As people vaguely take it to the present day, it seems only an assertion that there is a number of sincere Christians scattered throughout the world. But is this not a truism? Who doubt it? Who can deny that there are people in various places who are sincere believers? What comes of this? How is it important? Why should it be placed as an article of faith after belief in the Holy Ghost? Doubtless, the only true and satisfactory meaning is that which our divines have ever taken, that there is on earth an existing society, apostolic, as founded by the apostles, catholic, because it spreads its branches in every place, i.e. the church visible with its bishops, priests, and deacons. And this surely is a most important doctrine, for what can be better news to the bulk of mankind than to be told that Christ, when he ascended, did not leave us orphans but appointed representatives of himself to the end of time? The necessity of believing the Holy Catholic Church, says Bishop Pearson in his exposition of the Creed, appeareth first in this, that Christ hath appointed it as the only way to eternal life. Christ never appointed two ways to heaven, nor did he build a church to save some and make another institution for other men's salvation. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, but the name of Jesus. And that name is no otherwise given under heaven than in the church. This is the congregation of those people here on earth which shall hereafter meet in heaven. There is a necessity of believing the Catholic Church, because except a man be of that, he can be of none. Whatsoever church pretendeth to a new beginning, pretendeth at the same time to a new churchdom, and whatsoever is so new is none. This, indeed, is the unanimous opinion of our divines, that as the sacraments, so communion with the Church, is generally necessary to salvation, in the case of those who can obtain it. 
If then we express our belief in the existence of one church on earth from Christ's coming to the end of all things, if there is a promise it shall continue, and if it is our duty to do our part in our generation towards its continuance, how can we with a safe conscience countenance the interference of the nation in its concerns? Does not such interference tend to destroy it? Would it not destroy it if consistently followed up? Now, may we sit still and keep silence when efforts are making to break up, or at least materially to weaken, that ecclesiastical body which we know is intended to last while the world endures, and the safety of which is committed to our keeping in our day? How shall we answer for it if we transmit that ordinance of God less entire than when it came to us? Now, what am I calling on you to do? You cannot help what has been done in Ireland, but you may protest against it. You may as a duty protest against it in public and private. You may keep a jealous watch on the proceedings of the nation, lest a second act of the same kind be attempted. You may keep it before you as a desirable object that the Irish Church should at some future day meet in synod and protest herself against what has been done and then proceed to establish or rescind the state injunction as may be thought expedient. I know it is too much the fashion of the times to think any earnestness for ecclesiastical rights unseasonable and absurd, as if it were the feeling of those who lived among books and not in the world. But it is our duty to live among books, especially to live by one book, and a very old one. And therein we are enjoined to keep that good thing which is committed unto us, to neglect not our gifts. And when men talk, as they sometimes do, as if in opposing them we are standing on technical difficulties, instead of welcoming great and extensive benefits, which would be the result of their measures, I would ask them, letting alone the question of their beneficial nature, which is a question, whether this is not being wise above that is written whether it is not doing evil that good may come. We cannot know the effects which will follow certain alterations, but we can decide that the means by which it is proposed to attain them are unprecedented and disrespectful to the Church. And when men say, the day is past for stickling about ecclesiastical rights, let them see to it whether they do not use substantially the same arguments to maintain their position as those who say, the day is past for being a Christian. Lastly, is it not plain that by showing a bold front and defending the rights of the Church, we are taking the only course which can make us respected? Yielding will not persuade our enemies to desist from their efforts to destroy us root and branch. We cannot hope by giving something to keep the rest. Of this surely we have had of late years sufficient experience. But by resisting strenuously and contemplating and providing against the worst, we may actually prevent the very evils we fear. To prepare for persecution may be the way to avert it. End of Tract 2 Tract 3 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1 by John Henry Newman et al. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle Thoughts Respectfully Addressed to the Clergy on Alterations in the Liturgy by John Henry Newman Attempts are making to get the liturgy altered. My dear brethren, I beseech you, consider with me whether you ought not to resist the alteration of even one jot or tittle of it. Though you would in your own private judgments wish to have this or that phrase or arrangement amended, is this a time to concede one tittle? Why do I say this? Because, though most of you would wish some immaterial points altered, yet not many of you agree in those points, and not many of you agree what is and what is not immaterial. If all your respective emendations are taken, the alterations in the services will be extensive, and though each will gain something he wishes, he will lose more from those alterations which he did not wish. Tell me. Are the present imperfections, as they seem to each, of such a nature, and so many, that their removal will compensate for the recasting of much which each thinks to be no imperfection, 
or rather an excellence. There are persons who wish the marriage service amended. There are others who would be indignant at the changes proposed. There are some who wish the consecration prayer and the Holy Sacrament to be what it was in King Edward's first book. There are others who think this would be an approach to popery. There are some who wish the imprecatory psalms omitted. There are others who would lament this omission as savouring of the shallow and detestable liberalism of the day. There are some who wish the services shortened. There are others who think we should have far more services and more frequent attendance at public worship than we have. How few would be pleased by any given alterations, and how many pained. But once begin altering, and there will be no reason or justice in stopping till the criticisms of all parties are satisfied. Thus will not the liturgy be in the evil case described in the well-known story of the picture subjected by the artist to the observations of passers-by? And even to speak at present of comparatively immaterial alterations, I mean such as do not infringe upon the doctrines of the prayer book, will not it even with these be a changed book? And will not that new book be for certain an inconsistent one, the alterations being made, not on principle, but upon chance objections urged from various quarters? But this is not all. A taste for criticism grows upon the mind. When we begin to examine and take to pieces, our judgment becomes perplexed, and our feelings unsettled. I do not know whether others feel this to the same extent, but for myself I confess there are few parts of the service that I could not disturb myself about and feel fastidious at if I allowed my mind in this abuse of reason. First, e.g., I might object to the opening sentences. They're not evangelical enough. Christ is not mentioned in them. They are principally from the Old Testament. Then I should criticise the exhortation as having too many words, and as antiquated in style. I might find it hard to speak against the confession, but the absolution, it might be said, is not strong enough. It is a mere declaration, not an announcement of pardon for those who have confessed and so on. Now I think this unsettling of the mind a frightful thing, both to ourselves and more so to our flocks. They have long regarded the prayer book with reverence as the stay of their faith and devotion. The weaker sort will make it sceptical, the better it will offend and pain. Take, e.g., an alteration which some have offered in the creed to omit or otherwise word the clause he descended into hell. Is it no comfort for mourners to be told that Christ himself has been in that unseen state? Or paradise, which is the allotted place of sojourn for departed spirits? Is it not very easy to explain the ambiguous word? Is it any great harm if it is misunderstood? And is it not very difficult to find any substitute for it in harmony with the composition of the creed? I suspect we should find the best men in the number of those who would retain it as it is. On the other hand, will not the unstable learn from us a habit of criticising what they should never think of but as a divine voice supplied by the church for their need? But as regards ourselves, the clergy, what will be the effect of this temper of innovation in us? We have the power to bring about changes in the liturgy. Shall we not exert it? Have we any security, if we once begin, that we shall ever end? Shall we not pass from non-essentials to essentials? And then, on looking back after the mischief is done, what excuse shall we be able to make for ourselves for having encouraged such proceedings at first? Were there grievous errors in the prayer book, something might be said for beginning. But who can point out any? Can we not very well bear things as they are? Does any part of it seriously disquiet us? No. We have before now freely given our testimony to its accordance with Scripture. But it may be said that we must conciliate an outcry which is made, that some alteration is demanded. By whom? No one can tell who cries or who can be conciliated. Some of the laity, I suppose. 
Now consider this carefully. Who are these lay persons? Are they serious men? And are their consciences involuntarily hurt by the things they wish altered? Are they not rather the men you meet in company? Worldly men, with little personal religion, of lax conversation and lax professed principles, who sometimes, perhaps, come to church, and then are wearied and disgusted. Is it not so? You have been dining, perhaps, with a wealthy neighbour, or fall in with this great statesman or that noble aristocrat, who considers the church two centuries behind the world, and expresses to you wonder that its enlightened members do nothing to improve it. And then you get ashamed, and are betrayed into admissions which sober reason disapproves. You consider, too, that it is a great pity so estimable or so influential a man should be disaffected to the church, and you go away with the vague notion that something must be done to conciliate such persons. Is this to bear about you the solemn office of a guide and teacher in Israel, or to follow a lead? But consider what are the concessions which would conciliate such men. Would immaterial alterations? Do you really think they care one jot about the verbal or other changes which some recommend, and others are disposed to grant? Whether the unseen state is substituted for hell, condemnation for damnation, or the order of Sunday lessons is remodelled? No, they dislike the doctrine of the liturgy. These men of the world do not like the anathemas of the Athanasian creed, and other such peculiarities of our services. But even were the alterations which would please them small, are they the persons whom it is of use, whom it is becoming to conciliate by going out of our way? I need not go on to speak against doctrinal alterations, because most thinking men are sufficiently averse to them. But I earnestly beg you to consider whether we must not come to them if we once begin. For by altering immaterials, we merely raise without gratifying the desire of correcting. We excite the craving, but withhold the food. And it should be observed that the changes called immaterial often contain in themselves the germ of some principle, of which they are thus the introduction. E.g., if we were to leave out the imprecatory psalms, we certainly countenance the notion of the day, that love, and love only, is in the gospel the character of Almighty God and the duty of regenerate man. Whereas, that gospel, rightly understood, shows his infinite holiness and justice, as well as his infinite love, and it enjoins on men the duties of zeal towards him, hatred of sin, and separation from sinners, as well as that of kindness and charity. To the above observations it may be answered that changes have formerly been made in the services without leading to the issue I am predicting now, and therefore they may be safely made again. But waiving all other remarks in answer to this question, is not this enough, viz. that there is peril, no one will deny that the rage of the day is for concession. Have we not already granted political points without stopping the course of innovation? This is a fact. Now, is it worth while even to risk fearful changes merely to gain petty improvements, allowing those which are proposed to be such? We know not what is to come upon us, but the writer, for one, will try so to acquit himself now that if any irremediable calamity befalls the church, he may not have to vex himself with the recollections of silence on his part and indifference, when he might have been up and alive. There was a time when he, as well as others, might feel the wish, or rather the temptation, of steering a middle course between parties. But if so, a more close attention to passing events has cured his infirmity. In a day like this, there are but two sides, zeal and persecution, the church and the world. And those who attempt to occupy the ground between them at best will lose their labour, but probably will be drawn back to the latter. Be practical, I respectfully urge you. Do not attempt impossibilities. Sail not as if in pleasure boats upon a troubled sea, not a word falls to the ground in a time like this. 
speculations about ecclesiastical improvements, which might be innocent at other times, have a strength of mischief now. They are realised before he who utters them understands that he has committed himself. Be prepared, then, for petitioning against any alterations in the prayer book which may be proposed. And should you see that our fathers the bishops seem to countenance them, petition still. Petition them. They will thank you for such a proceeding. They do not wish these alterations, but how can they resist them without the support of their clergy? They consent to them, if they do, partly from the notion that they are thus pleasing you. Undeceive them. They will be rejoiced to hear that you are as unwilling to receive them as they are. However, if, after all, there be persons determined to allow some alterations, then let them quickly make up their minds how far they will go. They think it easier to draw the line elsewhere than as things now exist. Let them point out the limit of their concessions now, and let them keep to it then. And, if they can do this, I will say, though they are not as wise as they might have been, they are at least firm, and have at last come right. The Burial Service We hear many complaints about the burial service as unsuitable for the use for which it was intended. It expresses a hope that the person departed, over whom it is read, will be saved. And this is said to be dangerous when expressed about all who are called Christians as leading the laity to low views of the spiritual attainments necessary for salvation, and distressing the clergy who have to read it. Now, I do not deny... I frankly own, it is sometimes distressing to use the service. But this it must ever be in the nature of things, wherever you draw the line. Do you pretend you can discriminate the wheat from the tares? Of course not. It is often distressing to use this service, because it is often distressing to think of the dead at all. Not that you are without hope, but because you have fear also. How many are there whom you know well enough to dare to give any judgment about? Is a clergyman only to express a hope where he has grounds for having it? Are not the feelings of relatives to be considered? And may there not be a difference of judgments? I may hope more, another less. If each is to use the precise words which suit his own judgment, then we can have no words at all. But it may be said, Everything of a personal nature may be left out from the service. And do you really wish this? Is this the way in which your flock will wish their lost friends to be treated? A cold edification, but no affectionate valediction to the departed? Why not pursue this course of supposed improvement and advocate the omission of the service altogether? Are we to have no kind and religious thoughts over the good, lest we should include the bad? But it will be said that at least we ought not to read the service over the flagrantly wicked, over those who are a scandal to religion. But this is a very different position. I agree with it entirely. Of course we should not do so, and truly the Church never meant we should. She never wished we should profess our hope of the salvation of habitual drunkards and swearers, open sinners, blasphemers, and the like not as daring to despair of their salvation, but thinking it unseemly to honour their memory. Though the Church is not endowed with a power of absolute judgment upon individuals, yet she is directed to decide according to external indications, in order to hold up the rules of God's governance, and afford a type of it, and an assistance towards the realising it. As she denies to the scandalously wicked the Lord's Supper, so does she deprive them of her other privileges. The Church, I say, does not bid us read the service over open sinners. Hear her own words introducing the service. The office ensuing is not to be used for any that die unbaptized or excommunicate or have laid violent hands upon themselves. There is no room to doubt whom she meant to be excommunicated. Open sinners. Those, therefore, who are pained at the general use of the service should rather strive to restore the practice of excommunication than to alter the words used in the service. Surely, if we do not do this, 
we are clearly defrauding the religious for the sake of keeping close to the wicked. Here we see the common course of things in this world. We omit a duty. In consequence, our services become inconsistent. Instead of retracing our steps, we alter the service. What is this but, as it were, to sin upon principle? While we keep to our principles, our sins are inconsistencies. At length, sensitive of the absurdity which inconsistency involves, we accommodate our professions to our practice. This is ever the way of the world. But it should not be the way of the church. I will join heart and hand with any who will struggle for a restoration of that godly discipline, the restoration of which our church publicly professes she considers desirable. But God forbid any one should so depart from her spirit as to mould her formularies to fit the case of deliberate sinners. And is not this what we are plainly doing if we alter the burial service as proposed? We are recognising the right of men to receive Christian burial about whom we do not like to express a hope. Why should they have Christian burial at all? It will be said that the restoration of the practice of excommunication is impracticable, and that therefore the other alternation must be taken, as the only one open to us. Of course it is impossible if no one attempts to restore it. But if all wielded, how would it be impossible? And if no one stirs because he thinks no one else will, he is arguing in a circle. But after all, what have we to do with probabilities and prospects in matters of plain duty? Would a man, the only member of the church who felt it a duty to return to the ancient discipline, yet a duty is a duty, though he be alone? It is one of the great sins of our times to look to consequences in matters of plain duty. Is not this such a case? If not, prove that it is not. But do not argue from consequences. In the meanwhile, I offer the following texts and evidence of the duty. Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 to 17. Romans, chapter 16, verse 17. 1 Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 7 to 13. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 6, 14 and 15, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5, Titus chapter 3 verses 10 and 11, 2 John verses 10 and 11. The Principle of Unity Testimony of St. Clement, the Associate of St. Paul, Philippians chapter 4 verse 3, to the Apostolical Succession. The Apostles knew, through our Lord Jesus Christ, that strife would arise for the Episcopate. Wherefore, having received an accurate foreknowledge, they appointed the men I before mentioned, and have given an orderly succession, that on their death other approved men might receive in turn their office. Epistle, chapter 1, verse 44. Testimony of Ignatius, the friend of St. Peter, to Episcopacy. Your celebrated presbytery, worthy of God, is as closely knit to the bishop as the strings of a harp, and so by means of your unanimity and concordant love, Jesus Christ is sung. Ephesians 4 There are those who profess to acknowledge a bishop, but do everything without him. Such men appear to lack a clear conscience. Magnesians 4 he for whom I am bound is my witness, that I have not learnt this doctrine from mortal man. The Spirit proclaimed to me these words, Without the bishop, do nothing. Philadelphians 7 With these and other such strong passages in the Apostolical Fathers, how can we permit ourselves in our present practical disregard of the Episcopal authority? Are we not apt to obey only so far as the law obliges us? Do we support the bishop and strive to move all together with him as our bond of union and head? Or is not our everyday conduct as if, except with respect to certain periodical forms and customs, we are each independent in his own parish? End of track three. Track four of Tracts for the Times, volume one, by John Henry Newman, et al. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
read by beeswax candle. Adherence to the Apostolical Succession, The Safest Course, by John Keeble. We who believe the Nicene Creed must acknowledge it a high privilege that we belong to the Apostolic Church. How is it that so many of us are, almost avowedly, so cold and indifferent in our thoughts of this privilege? Is it because the very idea is itself overstrained and fanciful, apt perhaps to lay strong hold on a few ardent minds, but little in accordance with the general feelings of mankind? Surely not. The notion of a propagated commission is as simple and intelligible in itself as can well be, is acted on daily in civil matters, the administration of trust property, for example, and has found a most ready, sometimes an enthusiastic acceptance in those many nations of the world which have submitted and are submitting themselves to sacerdotal castes, elective or hereditary. Priests self-elected or appointed by the state is rather the idea which startles ordinary thinkers, not priests commissioned successively from heaven. Or is our languor rather to be accounted for by the want of express spiritual encouragement to the notion of a divine ministerial commission? Nay, scripture at first sight is express. Whether we take the analogy of the Old Testament, the words of our Lord, or the practice of his apostles. The primitive Christians read it accordingly, and cherished with all affectionate reverence the privilege which they thought they found there. Why are we so unlike them? I fear it must be owned that much of the evil is owing to the comparatively low ground which we ourselves, the ministers of God, have chosen to occupy in defence of our commission. For many years, we have been much in the habit of resting our claim on the general duties of submission to authority, of decency and order, of respecting precedents long established, instead of appealing to that warrant which marks us exclusively for God's ambassadors. We have spoken much in the same tone as we might had we been mere laymen, acting for ecclesiastical purposes by a commission under the great seal. Waving the question... Was this wise? Was it right, in higher respects? I ask, was it not obviously certain in some degree to damp and deaden the interest with which men of devout minds would naturally regard the Christian ministry? Would not more than half the reverential feeling with which we look on a church or cathedral be gone if we cease to contemplate it as the house of God, and learn to esteem it merely as a place set apart by the state, for moral and religious instruction? It would be going too deep in history were one now to enter on any statement of the causes which have led, silently and insensibly, almost to the abandonment of the high ground, which our fathers of the primitive church, i.e. the bishops and presbyters of the first five centuries, invariably took in preferring their claim to canonical obedience. For the present, it is rather wished to urge, on plain positive considerations, the wisdom and duty of keeping in view the simple principle on which they relied. Their principle, in short, was this, that the holy feast on our Saviour's sacrifice, which all confessed to be generally necessary to salvation, was intended by him to be constantly conveyed through the hands of commissioned persons. Except, therefore, we can show such a warrant we cannot be sure that our hands convey the sacrifice. We cannot be sure that souls worthily prepared, receiving the bread which we break, and the cup of blessing which we bless, are partakers of the body and blood of Christ. Piety, then, and Christian reverence, and sincere, devout love of our Redeemer, nay, and charity to the souls of our brethren, not good order and expediency only, would prompt us at all earthly risks to preserve and transmit the seal and warrant of Christ. If the rules of Christian conduct were founded merely on visible expediency, the zeal with which those holy men were used to maintain the apostolical succession might appear a strange, unaccountable thing. Not so if our duties to our Saviour be, like our duties to a parent or a brother, the unalterable result of certain known relations— previous to all consideration of consequences. Reflect on this, and you presently feel what a difference it makes in a pious mind, 
where the ministerial prerogatives be traced to our Lord's own institution, or to mere voluntary ecclesiastical arrangement. Let two plans of government, as far as we can see, be equally good and expedient in themselves. Yet, if there be but a fair probability of one rather than the other proceeding from our blessed Lord himself, those who love him in sincerity will know at once which to prefer. They will not demand that every point be made out by inevitable demonstration or promulgated in form, like a state decree. According to the beautiful expression of the psalmist, they will consent to be guided by our Lord's eye. The indications of his pleasure will be enough for them. They will state the matter thus to themselves. Jesus Christ's own commission is the best external security I can have, that in receiving this bread and wine I verily receive his body and blood. Either the bishops have that commission, or there is no such thing in the world. For at least bishops have it with as much evidence as presbyters without them. In proportion, then, to my Christian anxiety for keeping as near my Saviour as I can, I shall, of course, be very unwilling to separate myself from Episcopal communion. And in proportion to my charitable care for others, will be my industry to preserve and extend the light consolation and security to them. Consider the analogy of an absent parent or dear friend in another hemisphere. Would not such an one naturally reckon at one sign of sincere attachment if, when he returned home, he found that, in all family questions, respect had been shown especially to those in whom he was known to have had most confidence? Would he not be pleased when it appeared that people had not been nice in inquiring what express words of command he had given, whether they had good reason to think that such and such a course would be approved by him? If his children and dependents had searched diligently where and with whom he had left commissions, and having fair cause to think they had found such, had scrupulously conformed themselves as far as they could to the proceedings of those so trusted by him, would he not think this a better sign than if they had been dexterous in devising exceptions, in explaining away the words of trust, in limiting the prerogatives he had conferred. Now certainly the gospel has many indications that our best friend in his absence is likely to be well pleased with those who do their best in sincerity to keep as near to his apostles as they can. It is studiously recorded, for example, by the evangelists in the account of our Lord's two miraculous feasts, that all pass through his disciples' hands, his twelve disciples, as is in one instance plainly implied in the twelve baskets full of fragments. I know that minute circumstances like this in a parable or symbolical act must be reasoned on with great caution. Still, when one considers that our blessed Lord took occasion from this event to deliver more expressly than at any other time the doctrine of communion with him, it seems no unnatural conjecture that the details of the miracle were so ordered as to throw light on that doctrine. But not to dwell on what many will question, though on docile and affectionate minds I cannot but think it must have its weight, what shall we say to the remarkable promise addressed to the twelve at the Paschal Supper? Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptation, and I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father has appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Thus much nobody will hesitate to allow, concerning this apostolical charter, that it bound all Christians whatever to be loyal and obedient to Christ's apostles, at least as long as they were living. And do not the same words equally bind us, and all believers to the world's end, so far as the mind of the apostles can yet be ascertained? Is not the spirit of the enactment such as renders it incumbent on everyone to prefer among claimants to church authority those who can make out the best title to a warrant and commission from the apostles? I pass over those portions of the gospel which are often as quoted in this controversy. They will occur of themselves to all men, and it is the object of these lines rather to exemplify the occasional indications of our Lord's will than to cite distinct and palpable enactments. On one place, however, the passage in the Acts, which records in honour of the first converts, that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, one question must be asked. Is it really credible 
that the privilege so emphatically mentioned of being in communion with the apostles ceased when the last apostle died? If not, who among living Christians have so fair a chance of enjoying that privilege as those who, besides purity of doctrine, are careful to maintain that apostolical succession, preserved to them hitherto by a gracious and special providence? I should not much fear to risk the whole controversy on the answer which a simple, unprejudiced mind would naturally make to these two questions. Observe, too, how often those principles, which are usually called, in scorn, high churchmanship, drop, as it were, incidentally from the pens of the sacred writers, professedly employed on other subjects. How shall they preach, except they be sent? Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. No man taketh this honour to himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. I do not think it possible for any one to read such places as these with a fair and clear mind, and not to perceive that it is better and more scriptural to have, than to want, Christ's special commission for conveying his word to the people, and consecrating and distributing the pledges of his holy sacrifice, if such commission be anyhow attainable better and more scriptural, if we cannot remove all doubt, at least to prefer that communion which can make out the best probable title, provided always that nothing heretical or otherwise immoral be inserted in the terms of communion. Why then should any man here in Britain fear or hesitate boldly to assert the authority of the bishops and pastors of the church, on grounds strictly evangelical and spiritual, as bringing men nearest to Christ our Saviour, and conforming them most exactly to his mind, indicated both by his own conduct and by the words of his spirit in the apostolic writings. Why should we talk so much of an establishment and so little of an apostolical succession? Why should we not seriously endeavour to impress our people with this plain truth, that by separating themselves from our communion, they separate themselves not only from a decent, orderly, useful society, but from the only church in this realm which has a right to be quite sure that she has the Lord's body to give to his people. Nor need any man be perplexed by the question, sure to be presently and confidently asked, do you then unchurch all the Presbyterians, all Christians who have no bishops? Are they to be shut out of the covenant for all the fruits of Christian piety, which seem to have sprung up not scantily among them? Nay, we are not judging others, but deciding on our own conduct. We in England cannot communicate with Presbyterians, as neither can we with Roman Catholics. But we do not therefore exclude either from salvation. Necessary to salvation and necessary to church communion are not to be used as convertible terms. Neither do we desire to pass any sentence on other persons of other countries, but we are not to shrink from our deliberate views of truth and duty, because difficulties may be raised about the case of such persons, any more than we should fear to maintain the paramount necessity of Christian belief, because similar difficulties may be raised about virtuous heathens, Jews, or Mohammedans. To us such questions are abstract, not practical, and whether we can answer them or no, it is our business to keep fast hold of the church apostolical, whereof we are actual members, not merely on civil or ecclesiastical grounds, but from real personal love and reverence, affectionate reverence to our Lord and only Saviour. And let men seriously bear in mind that it is one thing to slight and disparage this holy succession where it may be had, another thing to acquiesce in the want of it where it is, if it be anywhere, really unattainable. I readily allow that this view of our calling has something in it too high and mysterious to be fully understood by unlearned Christians. But the learned, surely, are just as unequal to it. It is part of that ineffable mystery called in our creed the communion of saints, and with all other Christian mysteries, is above the understanding of all alike, yet practically alike within reach of all, who are willing to embrace it by true faith. Experience shows, at any rate, that it is far from being ill-adapted to the minds and feelings of ordinary people. On this point, evidence might be brought from times, at first glance the most unpromising. 
from the early part of the 17th century. The hold which the propagandists of the holy discipline obtained on the fancies and affections of the people, of whatever rank, age, and sex, depended very much on their incessant appeals to their fancied apostolical succession. They found persons willing and eager to suffer or rebel, as the case may be, for their system, because they had possessed them with the notion that it was the system handed down from the apostles, a divine episcopate. So Beza called it. Why should we despair of obtaining, in time, an influence far more legitimate and less dangerously exciting, but equally searching and extensive, by the diligent inculcation of our true and scriptural claim? For it is obvious that among other results of the primitive doctrine of the apostolical succession, thoroughly considered and followed up, it would make the relation of pastor and parishioner far more engaging, as well as more awful, than it is usually considered at present. Look on your pastor as acting by man's commission, and you may respect the authority on which he acts. You may venerate and love his personal character, but it can hardly be called a religious veneration. There is nothing, properly, sacred about him. But once learn to regard him as the deputy of Christ for reducing man to the obedience of God, and everything about him becomes changed. Everything stands in a new light, in public and in private, in church and at home, in consolation and in censure, and above all, in the administration of the holy sacraments, a faithful man naturally considers, by this his messenger, Christ is speaking to me. By his very being and place in the world, he is a perpetual witness to the truth of the sacred history a perpetual earnest of communion with our Lord to those who come duly prepared to his table. In short, it must make just all the difference in every part of a clergyman's duty, whether he do it and be known to do it, in that faith of his commission from Christ or no. How far the analogy of the ironical priesthood will carry us, and to what extent we must acknowledge the reserve imputed to the formularies of our church on this whole subject of the hierarchy, and how such reserve, if real, may be accounted for, these are questions worthy of distinct consideration. For the present, let the whole matter be brought to this short issue. May it not be said both to clergy and laity, put yourselves in your children's place, in the place of the next generation of believers, Consider in what way they will desire you to have acted, supposing them to value a right, as you must wish them, the means of communion with Christ, and as they will then wish you to have acted now, so act in all matters affecting that inestimable privilege. On Alterations in the Prayer Book The 36th Canon provides that no person shall hereafter be received into the ministry except he shall first subscribe certain three articles. The second of these is as follows. That the book of common prayer and of ordering of bishops, priests, and deacons containeth in it nothing contrary to the word of God, and that it may lawfully so be used, and that he himself will use the form in the said book prescribed in public prayer and administration of the sacraments, and none other. Now here is certainly a grave question to all who have subscribed this article. We need not say it precludes them from acquiescing in any changes that are lawfully made in the common prayer, but surely it makes it most incumbent on them to inquire carefully whether the parties altering it have a right to do so. E.g., should any foreign power or legislature, or any private nobleman or statesman at home, pretend to reform the prayer book? Of course. We should all call it a usurpation, and refuse to obey it. Or rather, we should consider the above subscription to be a religious obstacle to our obeying it. So far is clear. The question follows. Where is the competent authority for making alterations? Is it not also clear that it does not lie in the British legislature, which we know to be composed not only of believers, but also of infidels, heretics, and schismatics, and which, probably in another year, may cease to be a Christian body, even a formal profession. Can even a committee of it 
ever so carefully selected absolve us from our subscriptions? Whence do laity derive their power over the clergy? Can even the crown absolve us, or a commission from the crown? If then some measure of tyranny be practised against us as regards the prayer book, how are we to act? End of Tract 4 Tract 5 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1, by John Henry Newman et al. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. A short address to his brethren on the nature and constitution of the Church of Christ and of the branch of it established in England, by a layman. By John William Bowden. I believe one Catholic and apostolic church. Nicene Creed. There are many persons who have the happiness of being members of that pure and apostolical branch of Christ's Holy Church, which, as it is established in this our country, we call the Church of England. Persons who attend with regularity and devotion to her services, and have participated in the benefits of her sacraments, who may yet have no very clear idea either of the nature of that body, which we call the Church in general, or of the peculiar circumstances and events which have led to the present position and constitution of that portion of it to which we belong. To such persons it may not be unacceptable if we present them in these pages with a short account of the Church, of that institution which, previous to his return to the regions of his heavenly glory, our Lord bequeathed to the world, to be cherished and enjoyed as a precious legacy until his coming again of that body which he framed for the reception of the first gifts of his almighty spirit, and for the transmission of those precious gifts from age to age to the end of time. Such an account will naturally lead to a brief statement of the manner in which it has pleased Providence to bless us, in this our own island, with a branch of that holy institution, and thus to have established, and to continue among us, a body of men bearing a commission direct from himself to admit us into his fold by the waters of baptism, and to nourish us in the same, not only with the pure word of his doctrine, but with the spiritual nourishment of his most blessed body and blood. It would have been in vain that the two sacraments had been instituted, had no persons, no set of men, been appointed to administer them. You cannot suppose that you or I, for he who thus addresses you is a layman like yourselves, that is, has never received the ordination of a clergyman. You cannot, I say, suppose that any one of us might, with no other authority than his own good pleasure, proceed to baptise or to administer the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper. Such a proceeding would, it is evident, involve the highest degree of arrogance and impiety, and would be nothing short of a mockery of that great and awful being, of whose gifts these sacred ordinances are alike the appointed means and pledges. And if, as men, as simple members of Christ's Church, we have not this power, the next question to ask is, who could give us this authority? If admission to the great Christian congregation is the promise confirmed to us in baptism of the assistance of Christ's Holy Spirit, cannot give it, is it to be supposed that any act emanating from men, from sinful creatures like ourselves, should be a force to convey it? Clearly not. No command of an earthly king, no ordinance of an earthly legislature, could invest us with power over the gifts of the Holy Ghost. For such may we well term the power duly to administer the sacraments which Christ has ordained. No act of Parliament, however binding the provisions of such acts may be with regard to the temporal affairs of the nation, could make any one of us a priest or clothe us with one jot or one tittle of power over the things of the unseen world. As little, surely, could popular election invest us with this power from on high. Men may express their readiness to receive the gifts of heaven at our hands, but is it not absurd that those who are to be the receivers from us of any boon whatsoever should themselves be the persons to supply us with the means of bestowing it? It cannot be, then, that those to whom we are to administer the sacraments should themselves confer upon us the power of their ministration. To cut this inquiry short, 
He alone is evidently entitled to confer the power of conveying, by the appointed means, the gifts of his spirit, who himself gave, in the first instance, that spirit to his church. It is to him that such commission must be traced in the case of every individual who would establish his right to this holy office. Constitution of the Church of the Apostles He appointed in the first place, as is well known to every reader of the Scriptures, the Apostles, to whom he, at different periods, entrusted all such powers as were necessary to the formation and continued protection of his Church, which they, under his Spirit, were to establish. He gave them the power of admitting members into it, and he put into their hands that power of expulsion from it, which it was necessary for the well-being of the society, should be vested somewhere, assuring them, at the same time, that their decrees in this respect should be ratified on high, that what they bound on earth should be bound in heaven. To them it was that he entrusted the power of baptizing all nations, and, still more exclusively, the power of celebrating the sacred rite which commemorates his passion. They undertook the sacred trust, preached to all, and at first baptized all converts, though when the number of these increased, when the church could reckon its three thousand and its five thousand members, and when thus, to borrow the prophetic language of Daniel, the stone began to swell which was destined in time to become a great mountain and to fill the whole world, it was plainly impossible that the small band of apostles, employed as they were in the business of teaching the word, should suffice themselves to baptize all who should accept their office of salvation. For this, among other purposes, the formation of a class of ministers, distinct from and subordinate to themselves, became necessary. A class, of the first establishment of which we read in the sixth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. The members of this new class were called deacons. They were at first only seven in number. They were chosen, at the suggestion of the apostles, by the believers in general, or, in the language of the church, by the laity. But they were ordained to the office by the apostles themselves, by the laying of their hands on them, accompanied by prayer. A principal part of their office, when they were first appointed, was the distribution of the charitable gifts of the more wealthy believers among their poorer brethren but that the power of administering baptism was a part of their commission is evident from the history of Philip the deacon, contained in Acts chapter 9. There were thus two classes of guides and teachers to the Church of Christ, apostles and deacons, the first bearing authority over the general flock by the direct word of Christ himself, the second by commission from those thus directly authorised a commission given by them when the Holy Spirit was most abundantly poured out upon them, and solemnly ratified by that Holy Spirit himself in the miraculous powers and graces vouchsafed to Stephen and his colleagues. But as the limits of the church began to extend, and the believers, instead of dwelling in one body in the city of Jerusalem, began to spread over the adjoining regions, the want was felt of another class, to superintend the scattered divisions of Christ's flock to act in some measure as the substitutes of the apostles in their absence, and as their deputies and subordinate officers in their presence. This class, of higher rank in the church than the deacons, and forming a connecting link between them and the apostles, bears in scripture the name of elders, or bishops, and is, by one or other of these names, the subject of frequent mention in the later books of the New Testament. The constitution of the church was then, for the time being, complete. The apostles, as in the exercise of their high office, they founded congregations from city to city, ordained, always by the laying on of hands, elders and deacons, in whom each congregation recognized the ministers set over them by their Lord and Master in heaven, from whom they received the blessings conveyed in his sacraments, and to whom they looked for guidance and example in the holy course on which they had entered, the Christian warfare which they had undertaken. The apostle himself, however, who had planted each of these congregations, continued to exercise over it a general superintending authority, and to interfere, where the case required it, in the most solemn and decided manner. 
The nature and extent of the power thus assumed over each local church, in view of his heavenly commission by its apostolic head, will be manifest from a study of the two epistles written by St. Paul to the church of the Corinthians, and from a comparison of the second of these epistles with the first, it will be seen how fully this authority was recognized, and the directions thus sanctioned were obeyed by the primitive believers. It may not be amiss here to point out a circumstance from which we may most decidedly infer it to have been the will of the Holy Spirit that ordination, or the solemn ceremony above mentioned of the laying on of hands, should be the only mode of admission to the ministration of his gifts in the church. Were there any one person who might, in the very peculiar circumstances of his call and conversion, have had grounds for conceiving himself entitled to dispense with this ceremony, that person was undoubtedly St. Paul. Yet we find that, favoured as he had been, when it was seen meet to send him as an apostle to the Gentiles, the Holy Ghost deigned to give express directions that he should be separated to the purpose, ordained, that is to say, to such ministry, and that, in compliance with those directions, the heads of the church at Antioch, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on him, sent him and Barnabas away. The Apostolical Commission The church, under the government of its apostles, elders, and deacons, was, as we have already stated, for the time being, complete. One thing, however, was still wanting to give perpetuity to its constitution, and that was a provision for the supply of ordained ministers to distribute the gifts of the Spirit to the generations who should live when the apostles themselves, and those who had received ordination from their hands, should have alike passed away from the scene of their labours. It was necessary that the apostles should appoint successors to themselves, persons to be armed with at least all that portion of their authority which did not depend on their miraculous powers or extraordinary gifts of the Spirit with neither of which was the power of ordination to any rank of the ministry necessarily connected. They felt this necessity, and they did appoint such persons, but from the altered condition of the church and the number of converts in each particular place, it became expedient, instead of giving to each person so appointed that species of general commission with which the apostles themselves had commenced their labours, to fix the residence of each in some particular city and to give him the peculiar superintendence of the church therein and of the districts adjoining. It was thus that St. Paul appointed Timothy to preside, as what we now call bishop, over the church at Ephesus, and Titus over that of Crete, and the Holy Spirit, by dictating to the apostle those directions to them for the discharge of the duties of these offices which form the epistles bearing their names, gave the fullest and most solemn ratification not only to their individual appointment, but also to the establishment in perpetuity of the Episcopal order in the Church. Though this event in the history of the Church has been narrated as occurring subsequently to the appointment of the lower classes of ecclesiastical ministers, it must not be supposed that it was an afterthought, or that the Apostles were not from the first aware that their office was to be perpetuated by succession. Our Lord ended the sentence in which he endued them with the power to baptise, with the promise of his assistance and the discharge of their functions through all time. Go, said he, baptize all nations, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. A phrase which, as addressed to mortal men, must clearly have been understood as a promise of continual assistance to them and to their successors. We find, accordingly, that so far were they from understanding this gracious promise as applying solely to the individuals to whom the words were spoken, that one of their very first joint acts, when deprived of the presence of their Lord, was to select a person to be associated with themselves in the apostolic office, that the number originally named to that office by our Saviour might be complete. They did not, it is true, ordain him in the manner afterwards adopted by the laying on of hands, they were not indeed themselves consecrated to the exercise of this power till the descent upon them of the Holy Ghost. But in the pouring out of the gifts of Pentecost upon the head of Matthias, as well as upon those of the eleven, the Spirit bore a testimony, which could hardly be misunderstood, to the will of the Almighty that the apostles should from time to time, as it became necessary, 
nominate such associates in their general apostolic toils and powers as they might select. Associates on whom, as they themselves were gradually withdrawn from the world, the whole government of the church, and the whole care of providing for its further continuance, must ultimately devolve. The miraculous gifts and graces which God in the first instance showered upon his church answered their purpose in giving it its first footing in the world, and when no longer necessary for that purpose, were consequently withdrawn. But it should never be forgotten that these, wonderful and striking as they must have been, were but secondary and subsidiary to those invisible spiritual gifts, which are the real fulfilment of God's promise of constant aid to his church. With regard to these latter, it was indeed necessary that they should be her portion through all ages. But the others derived in truth their sole value from the evidence which they bore to the existence of these more precious boons, and evidence which, though immediately addressed to converts in the first ages, was intended to convince, not them alone, but all those to whom their report of these miraculous gifts should come, of the reality of God's promises with regard to those gifts which were not palpable to earthly senses, of the truth of Christ's saying, already quoted, that he would be with his church even unto the end of the world, and of his declaration that the Comforter, whom he would send, should abide with that church for ever. What name was originally applied to the office, borne by Timothy and Titus, of destined successors to the apostles, is not very clear. There was perhaps at first no one name specially used to designate it. They may sometimes have been called evangelists. See Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 5. Sometimes from their bearing in some measure the character of heavenly messengers to mankind, the angels of their respective churches. By this name, at least, the heads of the different churches of Asia were addressed in the second and third chapters of the book of Revelations. Consecrated as they were by different apostles in different parts of the world, some little time would necessarily elapse before one general name would be applied by the whole Christian church to the associates and successors of its first inspired governors. Of the powers entrusted to these persons, a good idea may be formed from the study of the epistles addressed to two of them. Timothy, it appears, had apostolic authority to superintend and arrange the celebration of divine service, to prescribe the nature of prayers to be used therein, and to give general directions for the decent and orderly behaviour of the congregation. See 1 Timothy chapter 2. Copious instructions were given him as to the persons whom he should choose to ordain as bishops, or elders, and deacons, chapter 3. He had power to select among the elders such as should rule, verse 17, probably over different portions of his congregation, and to hear and decide upon any accusations brought against them in the discharge of their office, verse 19. He was reminded by St. Paul to stir up the gift that was in him by the putting on of his hands, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, and of the hands of the presbytery, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. To ordain no man suddenly, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22, or without due examination into his character, but to commit the doctrine which he had learnt of St. Paul to faithful men, who should be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Titus was left in Crete, that he might set in order the things that were wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as St. Paul had appointed him. Titus chapter 1 verse 5. He was taught what sort of characters befitted those whom he should make bishops. He was to exhort and rebuke with all authority, and let no man despise him. Chapter 2 verse 15. He was to be the general instructor of his flock, and to have the power of expelling thence obstinate heretics. Chapter 3 verse 10. But it is unsatisfactory to quote particular passages. The whole of these three epistles should be seriously studied by those who wish to form a good general idea of the powers with which the apostles, or rather the Holy Ghost, by their means invested those who were to bear rule in the church in times when they themselves should have gone to their reward. Those times came. St. John, the last of the glorious company of the apostles, entered into his rest, and the church found itself committed 
under heaven, entirely to the charge of the three established orders of its ministers. To each of these a specific title was now ascribed, and applied with greater exactness than before. The title Bishop, which had at first been used indifferently with elder, became the exclusive property of the highest class of functionaries, the colleagues of Timothy and Titus. The word elder served to designate the second, and from its Greek equivalent, presbyteros, we have formed our English word priest, by which elder is now in common use superseded. The third class preserved its original and appropriate name of deacons. Such then was the constitution of which the church, when first deprived of outward supernatural aid, found herself possessed. Such the machinery at her disposal for the dispensation to mankind of those glorious gifts and privileges, which it was hers, and hers alone, to confer. As priests or deacons were required for the ministration of the word and sacraments to the different parts of her flock, the bishops, in exercise of the heavenly gift confided to them, laid hands upon such individuals as they deemed suited to the charge. And as vacancies occurred among the angels of the churches, the successors of the apostles themselves, or as additions were required to their number, the existing members of the sacred band, consecrated new individuals to the participation of their privileges, candidates for the office being presented to them by the laity for their approval, or fit and proper persons being selected by themselves. The gift conferred by their ordination was now no longer confirmed by outward ocular demonstration. But, while they reverently complied with all the particulars and forms of these holy rites, as established under the guidance of inspiration by their predecessors, they would have held it a most guilty instance of want of faith, had they presumed to doubt the continued fulfilment of the Redeemer's promise, or the continued abiding with the church which he had framed of the Almighty Comforter. The Apostolical Succession Since the Apostolic Age, 17 centuries have rolled away. Exactly 1,800 years have elapsed since the delivery of Christ's recorded promise. And blessed be God, the Church is with us still. Amid all the political storms and vicissitudes, amid all the religious errors and corruptions which have checkered during that long period the world's eventful history, A regular, unbroken succession has preserved among us ministers of God, whose authority to confer the gifts of his Spirit is derived originally from the laying on of the hands of the apostles themselves. Many intermediate possessors of that authority have, it is true, intervened between them and these, their hallowed predecessors, but the gifts of God are without repentance. The same Spirit rules over the Church now who presided at the consecration of St. Paul, and the eighteen centuries that are past can have had no power to invalidate the promise of our God. Nor, even though we may admit that many of those who formed the connecting links of this holy chain were themselves unworthy of the high charge reposed in them, can this furnish us with any solid ground for doubting or denying their power to exercise that legitimate authority with which they were duly invested, of transmitting the sacred gift to worthier followers. Ordination, or as it is called in the case of bishops, consecration, though it does not precisely come within our definition of a sacrament, is nevertheless a right partaking, in a high degree, of the sacramental character, and it is by reference to the proper sacraments that its nature can be most satisfactorily illustrated. And with respect to these, it would lead us into endless difficulties were we to admit that, when administered by a minister duly authorised according to the outward forms of the Church, either baptism or the Lord's Supper depended for its validity either on the moral and spiritual attainments of that minister, or on the frame of mind in which he might have received at his ordination the outward and visible sign of his authority. Did the sacraments indeed rest on such circumstances as these for their efficacy in each case of their ministration? Who would there be of us, or of any Christian congregation, who could positively say whether he had been baptized or not? Or what preparation or self-examination could give to a penitent the confidence that he had truly partaken of the body and blood of Christ, with the reality of that partaking to depend upon something of which he had no knowledge? 
and over which he could exercise no control. Upon the spiritual state, not only of the officiating minister himself, but of every individual bishop through whom that minister had received his authority, through the long lapse of 1,800 years. He who receives unworthily, or in an improper state of mind, either ordination or consecration, may probably receive to his own soul no saving health from the hallowed rite. But while we admit, as we do, the validity of sacraments administered by a priest thus unworthily ordained, we cannot consistently deny that of ordination in any of its grades when bestowed by a bishop as unworthily consecrated. The very question of worth, indeed, with relation to such matters, is absurd. Who is worthy? Who is a fit to meet dispenser of the gifts of the Holy Spirit? What are, after all, the petty differences between sinner and sinner when viewed in relation to him whose eyes are too pure to behold iniquity, and who charges his very angels with folly. And be it remembered that the apostolic powers, if not transmitted through these, in some instances corrupt channels, have not been transmitted to our times at all. Unless, then, we acknowledge the reality of such transmission, we must admit that the church which Christ founded is no longer to be found upon the earth and that the promise of his protection, so far from being available to the end of the world, is forgotten and out of date already. The unworthiness of man, then, cannot prevent the goodness of God from flowing in those channels in which he has destined it to flow. And the Christian congregations of the present day, who sit at the feet of ministers duly ordained, have the same reason for reverencing in them the successes of the apostles, as the primitive churches of Ephesus and of Crete had for honouring in Timothy and in Titus the apostolical authority of him who had appointed them. The Church of England A branch of this holy Catholic, or universal, church has been, through God's blessing, established for ages in our island. A branch which, as has been already stated, we denominate the Church of England. Its officiating ministers are divided into the three original orders of bishops, priests and deacons, and into no other. In the exercise of that authority, which is inherent in every society, of making salutary laws and regulations for its own guidance, it has been found expedient to vest in two of the principal members of the Episcopal order in England a certain authority over the rest, and to style them archbishops. But this is not by any means to be understood as constituting them another order in the church. They are but, in strictness of language, the first and leading bishops of our land. The priests and deacons, whom we usually class together under the common name of clergymen, who officiate in the churches and chapels of our establishment, have each received ordination to the discharge of their holy office by the laying on of the hands of a bishop, assisted in the case of priests, by members already admitted to the presbytery or priesthood, as was St. Paul in the ordination of Timothy. Chapter 4, verse 14. And each bishop of our church has, at the hands of another bishop, himself similarly called to the office, received in the most solemn manner the gift of the Holy Ghost, and that apostolical power over the church, for the support of which the Redeemer pledged himself that his assistance should never be wanting to the end of time. Wonderful indeed is the providence of God, which has so long preserved the unbroken line, and thus ordained that our bishops should, even at this distance of time, stand before their flocks as the authorised successors of the apostles, as armed with their power to confer spiritual gifts in the church, and in cases of necessity, to wield their awful weapon of rejection from the fold of Christ. As commissioned, like Titus, to bid, on heavenly authority, no man despise them, and to point out to those who, as a class, as bishops of the church, do despise them, the solemn words, He that despiseth you, despiseth me, and he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. The mode in which new candidates for the Episcopal station have been presented to existing bishops for consecration has differed in different ages and countries. They have sometimes been chosen by the laity, sometimes selected by other bishops, and sometimes by civil magistrates. In our own country, the latter mode has for some centuries prevailed, 
and the King of England has presented to the prelates of its church persons for their approval and consecration. As the King and legislature were the pledged defenders of the purity and integrity of that church, this was perhaps a mode as unobjectionable as any which could have been substituted for it, and it possessed the advantage of being free from the turmoil and party feeling which have always been generated by proceedings in the way of popular election. The mode, however, in which this presentation is made is, after all, of minor importance, being understood that it is upon the responsibility of the bishop himself that the solemn rite at last takes place. No earthly authority can compel him to lay his hands upon what he may conceive an unworthy head, or can presume to dispense with his concurrence, and arrogantly assume to itself the power to confer the Holy Ghost. The solemn words in which the offices of bishop, priest, and deacon are respectively conferred are annexed to these pages, and from their perusal it will be seen how impious it would be in any one but the deputed minister of heaven to utter them over a fellow mortal, or to conceive that he, whatever his earthly rank or station, could bestow or even aid in bestowing the gifts imparted thereby. Many ages ago, the civil rulers of our country recognized the principle that a Christian nation should, as such, consider itself a branch of the apostolical church of Christ. They therefore acknowledged and gave temporal dignity and a voice in the general councils of her state to her ministers, privileges which they to the present day enjoy. And the church, on her part, the above principle having been adopted by the state, acknowledged in the head of that state her king, her temporal head, investing him with that general supremacy in ecclesiastical affairs, which he already possessed in civil. But we are not thence to infer that she gave, or that she could give, to an earthly monarch or to his temporal legislature, the right to interfere with things spiritual, with her doctrines, with her liturgy, with the ministration of her sacraments, or with the positions relative to each other of her bishops, priests, and deacons. When corruptions, prevalent among the professedly Christian world, render it necessary for her to state the substance of her faith in articles, as was done in A.D. 1562, or when circumstances appear to require any change or variation either in the forms of her liturgy or in her general internal government, the king has the constitutional power of summoning the houses of convocation, a sort of ecclesiastical parliament composed of bishops or clergy from which alone such changes can fitly or legally emanate. Such are the circumstances under which a branch of Christ's church is domiciled among us, and claims over us, while acting according to his spirit, the delegated authority of her founder. She makes no pretensions to that immediate inspiration of the spirit, which, by positively securing her ministers from error, would clothe her decisions with absolute infallibility. She puts the Bible into the hand of every member of her communion, and calls upon us to believe nothing is necessary to salvation which shall not appear, upon mature examination, to be set down therein, or at least to be capable of being proved thereby, but showing, at the same time, her authority as its appointed interpreter. She warns him not rashly, or without having fully weighed the subject, to dissent from her expositions, the results of the accumulated learning and labour of centuries. She warns him not, without cause, to run the risk of incurring the fearful sin of schism, or unnecessary separation from, and violation of the unity of Christ's fold. A sin of which surely none can think lightly, who remembers the Saviour's affecting and repeated prayer. See John chapter 17. That his followers may be one, even as he and his almighty Father were one. She bids him, in that Bible itself, read her credentials. There she exhibits in the recorded indications of her Lord and Master's will, the rock on which she is built, the foundation which, whatever changes may convulse the globe around it, is to abide, unmoved and immovable, till time shall be no more. The duties, which our knowledge of these things, brethren of the laity, makes incumbent upon us, are almost too clear to need recapitulation. Filial love and affectionate reverence toward the collective church, and towards those, her pastors and masters, 
who are set in spiritual authority over us, a zeal for the inculcation of her pure doctrine and the extension of her heavenly fold, a determination in evil report and in good report to stand by her, and to approve ourselves her faithful members and children. These and such feelings as these are, by a bond of communion with her, peremptorily required of us. These let us make it the business of our lives to cultivate and comply with, and if tempted, as any one of us may be, hastily and needlessly to forsake her hallowed pale, let us reply to the temptation by addressing her in words somewhat similar to those of Peter to his divine master. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe, and are sure that thou art the minister and representative of Christ, the Son of the living God. Appendix the following are the words addressed respectively to bishops, priests, and deacons when their offices are conferred upon them by the laying on of hands. To a bishop, receive the Holy Ghost for the work and office of a bishop in the Church of God, now committed unto thee by the imposition of our hands, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And remember that thou stir up the grace of God, which is given thee by this imposition of our hands, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and love, and soberness. To a priest. Receive the Holy Ghost for the office and work of a priest in the Church of God, now committed unto thee by the imposition of our hands. Whose sins thou dost forgive, they are forgiven. And whose sins thou dost retain, they are retained. And be thou a faithful dispenser of the word of God and of his holy sacraments. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. To a deacon. Take thou authority to execute the office of a deacon in the Church of God committed unto thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. End of Tract 5。Tract 6 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1, by John Henry Newman et al. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Beeswax Candle. The Present Obligation of Primitive Practice by John Henry Newman When we look around upon the present state of the Christian Church, and then, turning to ecclesiastical history, acquaint ourselves with its primitive form and condition, the difference between them so strongly acts upon the imagination that we are tempted to think that to base our conduct now on the principles acknowledged then is but theoretical and idle. We seem to perceive, as clear as day, that as the primitive church had its own particular discipline and political character, so have we ours, and that to attempt to revive what has passed is as absurd as to seek to raise what is literally dead. Perhaps we even go on to maintain that the constitution of the church, as well as its actual course of acting, is different from what it was. That episcopacy now is in no sense what it used to be. That our bishops are the same as the primitive bishops only in name, and that the notion of an apostolical succession is a fond thing. I do not wish to undervalue the temptation which leads to this view of church matters. It is the temptation of sight to overcome faith, and of course not a slight one. But the following reflection on the history of the Jewish Church may perhaps be considered to throw light upon our present duties. 1. Consider how exact are the injunctions of Moses to his people. He ends them thus. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. Keep therefore the words of this covenant, and do them, that ye may prosper in all that ye do. Neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him that standeth here this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us this day. Deuteronomy chapter 29 2. Next, Survey the history of the chosen people for the several first centuries after taking possession of Canaan. The exactness of Moses was unavailing. Can a greater contrast be conceived than the commands and promises of the Pentateuch, 
and the history of the judges? Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Judges chapter 17 verse 6 Samuel attempts a reformation on the basis of the Mosaic law, but the effort ultimately fails, as being apparently against the stream of opinion and feeling then prevalent. The times do not allow of it. Again, contrast the opulent and luxurious age of Solomon. Though the covenant was then openly acknowledged and outwardly accepted, more fully than at any other time, was the vision of simple piety and plain, straightforward obedience, which is the scope of the Mosaic law. Lastly, contemplate the state of the Jews after their return from the captivity, when their external political relations were so new the internal principle of their government so secular, God's arm apparently so far removed. This state of things went on for centuries. Who would suppose that the Jewish law was binding in all its primitive strictness at the age when Christ appeared? Who would not say that length of time had destroyed the obligation of a projected system, which had as yet never been realised? Consider, too, the impossible nature so to say, of some of its injunctions. An infidel historian somewhere asks scoffingly whether the ruinous law which required all the males of the chosen people to go up to Jerusalem three times a year was ever observed in its strictness. The same question may be asked concerning the observance of the sabbatical year, to which but a faint allusion, if that, is made in the books of Scripture subsequent to the Pentateuch. 3. And now, with these thoughts before us, reflect upon our Saviour's conduct. He set about to fulfil the law in its strictness, just as if he had lived in the generation next to Moses. The practice of others, the course of the world, was nothing to him. He received and he obeyed. It is not necessary to draw out the evidence of this in detail. Consider merely his emphatic words at the beginning of Matthew chapter 23 concerning those whom as individuals he was fearfully condemning. The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. Again, reflect upon the praise bestowed upon Zacharias and his wife, that they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless, and upon the conduct of the apostles. Surely, these remarkable facts impress upon us the necessity of going to the apostles, and not to the teachers and oracles of the present world, for the knowledge of our duty, as individuals and as members of the Christian Church. It is no argument against a practice being right, that it is neglected. Rather, we are warned against going the broad way of the multitude of men. And now, is there any doubt in our minds as to the feelings of the primitive church regarding the doctrine of the apostolical succession? Did not the apostles observe, even in an age of miracles, the ceremony of imposition of hands? And are we not bound, not merely to acquiesce in, but zealously to maintain and inculcate the discipline which they established? The only objection which can be made to this view of our duty is that the injunction to obey strictly is not precisely given to us, as it was in the instance of the Mosaic law. But is not the real state of the case merely this, that the gospel appeals rather to our love and faith, our divinely illuminated reason, and the free principle of obedience, than to the mere letter of its injunctions? And does not the conduct of the Jews just prove to us that though the commands of Christ were put before us ever so precisely, yet there would not be found in any extended course of history a more exact attention to them than there is now? That the difficulty of resisting the influence which the world's actual proceedings exert upon our imagination, would be just as great as we find it at present. A sin of the church. Remember from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do thy first works, or else I will come to thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, 
except thou repent. The following extract is from Bingham, The Antiquities of the Ancient Church, Book 15, Capitulum 9. In the primitive ages, it was both the rule and practice of all in general, both clergy and laity, to receive the communion every Lord's Day. As often as they met together for divine service on the Lord's Day, they were obliged to receive the Eucharist under pain of excommunication. And if we run over the whole history of the three first ages, we shall find this to have been the Church's constant practice. We are assured, Father, that in some places they received the communion every day. Is there anyone who will deny that the primitive Church is the best expounder in this matter of our Lord's will as conveyed through his apostles? Can a learned Church, such as the English, plead ignorance of his will thus ascertained? Do we fulfil it? Is not the regret and concern of pious and learned writers among us, such as Bingham, at our neglect of it upon record? And is it not written, That servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes? And putting aside this disobedience, can we wonder that faith and love wax cold, when we so seldom partake of the means, mercifully vouchsafed us, of communion with our Lord and Saviour. End of Tract 6 Tract 7 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1, by John Henry Newman et al. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. The Episcopal Church Apostolical there are many persons at the present day who, from not having turned their minds to the subject, think they are churchmen in the sense in which the early Christians were, merely because they are Episcopalians. The extent of their churchmanship is to consider that episcopacy is the best form of ecclesiastical polity, and again, that it originated with the apostles. I am far from implying that to go thus far is nothing, or is not an evidence, for it is, of a reverent and sober temper of mind. Still, the view is defective. It is defective because the expediency of a system, though a very cogent, is not the highest line of argument that may be taken in its defence, and because an opponent may deny the fact of the apostolicity of episcopacy, and so involve its maintainer in an argument. Doubtless, the more clear and simple principle for a churchman to hold is that of a ministerial succession, which is undeniable as a fact, but it is most reasonable as a doctrine, and sufficiently countenanced in Scripture for its practical reception. Of this, episcopacy, i.e. superintendence, is but an accident, though for the sake of conciseness it is often spoken of us as synonymous with it. It shall be the object of the following tract to insist upon this higher characteristic of our Church. My position, then, is this, that the apostles appointed successors to their ministerial office, and the latter in turn appointed others, and so on to the present day. And further, that the apostles and their successors have in every age committed portions of their power and authority to others, who thus became their delegates, and in a measure their representatives, and are called priests and deacons. The result is an episcopal system, because of the practice of delegation. But we may conceive their keeping their powers altogether to themselves, and in the same proportion in which this was done, would the church polity cease to be Episcopalian. We may conceive the order of apostolic vicars, so to call it, increased until one of them was placed in every village and took the office of parish priest. I do not say such a measure would be justifiable or pious, Doubtless it would be a departure from the rule of antiquity, but it is conceivable, and it is useful to conceive it in order to form a clear notion of the essence of the church system, and the defective state of those Christian societies which are separate from the church Catholic. It is a common answer made to those who are called high churchmen to say that if God had intended the form of church government to be of great consequence, he would have worded his will in this matter more clearly in Scripture. Now enough has already been said to show the irrelevancy of such a remark. 
we need not deny to the church the abstract right, however we may question the propriety, of altering its own constitution. It is not merely because episcopacy is a better or more scriptural form than Presbyterianism, true as this may be in itself, that Episcopalians are right and Presbyterians are wrong. But because the Presbyterian ministers have assumed a power that was never entrusted to them, they have presumed to exercise the power of ordination and to perpetuate a succession of ministers without having received a commission to do so. This is the plain fact that condemns them, and is a standing condemnation from which they cannot escape, except by artifices of argument, which will serve equally to protect the self-authorized teacher of religion. If they may ordain without being sent to do so, others may teach and preach without being sent. They hold a middle position, which is untenable as destroying itself. For if Christians can do without bishops, i.e. commissioned ordainers, they may do without commissioned ministers, i.e. the priests and deacons. If an imposition of hands is necessary to convey one gift, why should it not be to convey another? 1. As to the fact of the apostolical succession, i.e. that our present bishops are the heirs and representatives of the apostles by successive transmission of the prerogative being so, this is too notorious to require proof. Every link in the chain is known from St. Peter to our present metropolitans. Here, then, I only ask, looking at this plain fact by itself, is there not something of a divine providence in it? Can we conceive that this succession has been preserved all over the world, amid many revolutions, through many centuries, for nothing? Is it wise or pious to despise and neglect a gift thus transmitted to us in matter of fact, even if Scripture did not touch upon the subject? 2. Next, consider how natural is the doctrine of a succession. When an individual comes to me claiming to speak in the name of the Most High, it is natural to ask him for his authority. If he replies that we are all bound to instruct each other, this reply is intelligible, but in the very form of it excludes the notion of a ministerial order, i.e. a class of persons set apart from others for religious offices. If he appeals to some miraculous gift, this too is intelligible, and only unsatisfactory when the alleged gift is proved to be a fiction. No other answer can be given, except a reference to some person who has given him license to exercise ministerial functions. Then follows the question, how that individual gained his authority to do so? In the case of the Catholic Church, the person referred to, i.e. the bishop, has received it from a predecessor, and he from another, and so on, till we arrive at the apostles themselves, and thence our Lord and Saviour. It is superfluous to dwell on so plain a principle, which in matters of this world we act upon daily. 3. Lastly, the argument from Scripture is surely quite clear to those who honestly wish direction for practice. Christ promised he would be with his apostles always, as ministers of his religion, even unto the end of the world. In one sense, the apostles were to be alive till he came again but they all died at the natural time. Does it not follow that there are those now alive who represent them? Now who are the most probable representatives of them in the generation next their death? They surely, whom they have ordained to succeed them in the ministerial work. If any persons could be said to have Christ's power and presence, and the gifts of ruling and ordaining, of teaching, of binding and loosing, and comparing together the various scriptures on the subject, all these seem included in his promise to be with the church always. Surely those on whom the apostles laid their hands were they. And so in the next age, if any were representatives of the first representatives, they must be the next generation of bishops, and so on. Nor does it materially alter the argument, though we suppose the blessing upon ministerial offices made, not to the apostles, but to the whole body of disciples, i.e. the church. For even if it be the church that has the power of ordination committed to it, 
Still, it exercises it through the bishops as its organs. And the question recurs, how has the presbytery in this or that country obtained the power? The church certainly has from the first committed it to the bishops, and has never resumed it. And the bishops have nowhere committed it to the presbytery, who therefore cannot be in possession of it. However, it is merely for argument's sake that I make this allowance as to the meaning of the text in Matthew chapter 28. At the same time, let it be observed what force is added to the argument for the apostolic succession by the acknowledged existence in Scripture of the doctrine of a standing church or permanent body corporate for spiritual purposes. For if Scripture has formed all Christians into one continuous community through all ages, which I do not here prove, it is but according to the same analogy that the ministerial office should be vested in an order propagated from age to age on a principle of succession. And if we proceed to considerations of utility and expedience, it is plain that, according to our notions, it is more necessary that a minister should be perpetuated by a fixed law than that the community of Christians should be, which can scarcely be considered to be vested with any powers, such as to require the visible authority which succession supplies. End of Tract 7《Tract Eight of Tracts for the Times, Volume One, by John Henry Newman, et al. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. The Gospel, a Law of Liberty, attributed to John Henry Newman. It is a matter of surprise to some persons that the ecclesiastical system under which we find ourselves is so faintly enjoined on us in Scripture. One very sufficient explanation of the fact will be found in considering that the Bible is not intended to teach us matters of discipline so much as matters of faith, i.e. those doctrines, the reception of which are necessary to salvation. But another reason may be suggested, which is well worth our attentive consideration. The gospel is a law of liberty. We are treated as sons, not as servants not subjected to a code of formal commands, but addressed as those who love God and wish to please him. When a man gives orders to those who he thinks will mistake him or are perverse, he speaks pointedly and explicitly. But when he gives directions to friends, he will trust much to their knowledge of his feelings and wishes. He leaves much to their discretion, and tells them not so much what he would have done in detail, as what are the objects he would have accomplished. Now this is the way Christ has spoken to us under the new covenant, and apparently with this reason, to try us, whether or not we really love him as our Lord and Saviour. Accordingly, there is no part, perhaps, of the ecclesiastical system which is not faintly traced in Scripture, and no part which is much more than faintly traced. The question which a reverend and affectionate faith will ask is, what is most likely to please Christ? And this is just the question that obtains an answer in Scripture, which contains just so much as intimations of what is most likely to please him. Of course, different minds will differ as to the degree of clearness with which this or that practice is enjoined. Yet I think no one will consider the state of the case, as I have put it, exaggerated on the whole. Many duties are intimated to us by example, not by precept. Many are implied merely. Others can only be inferred from a comparison of passages, and others perhaps are contained only in the Jewish law. I will mention some specimens to assist the reflection of the reader. The early Christians were remarkable for keeping to the Apostles' fellowship, who are more likely to stand in the Apostles' place since their death than that line of bishops which they themselves began? For that the Apostles were, in some sense, or rather, to remain on earth to the end of all things, is plain from the text, Lo, I am with you, etc. St. Paul set Timothy over the church at Ephesus, and Titus over the churches of Crete, i.e. as bishops. Therefore, it is safer to have bishops now, it is more likely to be pleasing to him who has loved us, and bids us in turn love him with the heart, 
not with formal service. Our Lord committed the administration of the Lord's Supper to his apostles. Do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, the church has ever continued it in the hands of their successors and the delegates of these. On the other hand, the command to baptize was given in the presence of the disciples, and so indirectly to them. And therefore, the church has allowed lay baptism in cases where an ordained minister could not be obtained. From Christ's words, suffer the little children, etc., and from his blessing them, we infer his desire that children should be brought near to him in baptism, as we do also from St. Paul's conduct on several occasions. Acts chapter 16, verses 15 and 33, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 16. So also we continue the practice of confirmation, from a desire to keep as near the apostles' rule as possible. Again, what little is there of express command in the New Testament for our meeting together in public worship? Yet we see what the custom of the apostolic church was from the book of Acts, 1 Corinthians, etc. In like manner, the words in Genesis chapter 2 and the practice of the apostles in the Acts are quite warrant enough for the sanctification of the Lord's day, even though the fourth commandment were not binding upon us. For the same reason, we continue the patriarchal and Jewish rule of paying tithe to the church. Some portion of our goods is evidently due to God, and the ancient divine command is a direction to us in a case where reason and conscience have no means of determining. These may be taken as illustrations of a general principle, and at this day it is most needful to keep it in view, since a cold spirit has crept into the church of demanding rigid demonstration for every religious practice and observance. It is the fashion now to speak of those who maintain the ancient rules of the ecclesiastical system, not as zealous servants of Christ, not as wise and practical expounders of his will, but as inconclusive reasoners and fanciful theorists, merely because, instead of standing still and arguing, they have a heart to obey. Are there not numbers in this day who think themselves enlightened believers, yet who are but acting the part of the husbandman's son in the gospel, who said, I go, sir, and went not? Church Reform Surely, before the blessing of a millennium is vouchsafed to us, the whole Christian world has much to confess in its several branches. Rome has to confess her papal corruptions and her cruelty towards those who refuse to accept them. The Christian communities of Holland, Scotland and other countries then neglect the apostolical order of ministers. The Greek church has to confess its saint worship, its formal fasts and its want of zeal. The churches of Asia, their heresy. All parts of Christendom have much to confess and reform. We have our sins as well as the rest. Oh, that we would take the lead in the regeneration of the Church Catholic on Scripture principles. Our greatest sin, perhaps, is the disuse of a godly discipline. Let the reader consider. 1. The command. Put away from yourselves the wicked person. A man that is a heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. Mark them which cause divisions and offences, and avoid them. The example, viz. in the primitive church, the persons or objects of ecclesiastical censure were all such delinquents as fell into great and scandalous crimes after baptism, whether men or women, priests or people, rich or poor, princes or subjects. Bingham, The Antiquities of the Christian Church. Book 16, Capitulum 3. The Warning. Whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. End of Tract 8. Tract 9 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1, by John Henry Newman et al. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. On Shortening the Church Services, by Richard Harrow Fruder. There is a growing feeling that the services of the Church are too long, 
and many persons think it is a sound feeling, merely because it is a growing one. Let such as have not made up their minds on the subject suffer themselves, before going into the arguments against our services, to be arrested by the following consideration. The services of our church, as they now stand, are but a very small part of the ancient Christian worship, and though people nowadays think them too long, there can be no doubt that the primitive believers would have thought them too short. Now I am far from considering this as a conclusive argument in the question, as if the primitive believers were right and people nowadays wrong, but surely others may fairly be called upon not to assume the reverse. On such points it is safest to assume nothing, but to take facts as we find them, and the facts are these. In ancient times, Christians understood very literally all that the Bible says about prayer. David had said, Seven times a day do I praise thee. And St. Paul had said, Pray always. These texts they did not feel at liberty to explain away, but complying with them to the letter, praised God seven times a day besides their morning and evening prayer. Their hours of devotion were, in the daytime, 6, 9, 12, and 3, which were called the Hori Canonici. In the night, 9, 12, and 3, which were called the Nocturnes. And besides these, the hour of daybreak and of retiring to bed. Not that they set apart these hours in the first instance for public worship. This was impossible. But they seem to have aimed at praying with one accord and at one time, even where they could not do so in one place. The Universal Church, says Bishop Patrick, anciently observed certain set hours of prayer that all Christians throughout the world might at the same time join together to glorify God. And some of them were of opinion that the angelical host being acquainted with those hours took that time to join their prayers and praises with those of the Church. The hymns and psalms appropriated to these hours were in the first instance intended only for private meditation. But afterwards... When religious societies were formed, and persons who had withdrawn from secular business lived together for purposes of devotion, chanting was introduced, and they were arranged for congregational worship. Throughout the churches which used the Latin tongue, the same services were adopted with very little variation, and in Roman Catholic countries they continue in use, with only a few modern interpolations even to this day. The length of these services will be in some degree understood from the fact that in the course of every week they go through the whole book of Psalms. The writer has been told by a distinguished person, who was once a Roman Catholic priest, that the time required for their performance averages three hours a day throughout the year. The process of transition from this primitive mode of worship to that now used in the Church of England was gradual. Long before the abolition of the Latin service, the ancient hours of worship had fallen into disuse. In religious societies, the daily and nightly services had been arranged in groups under the names of matins and vespers. And those who prayed in private were allowed to suit their hours of prayer to their convenience, provided only that they went through the whole services each day. Neither is it to be supposed that this modified demand was at all generally complied with. Thus, in the course of time, the views and feelings with which prayer had been regarded by the early Christians became antiquated. The forms remained, but stripped of their original meaning. Services were compressed into one, which had been originally distinct. The idea of united worship, with a view to which identity of time and language had been maintained in different nations, was forgotten. The identity of time had been abandoned, and the identity of language was not thought worth preserving. Conscious of the incongruity of primitive forms and modern feelings, our reformers undertook to construct a service more in accordance with the spirit of their age. They adopted the English language. They curtailed the already compressed ritual of the early Christians, so arranging it that the psalm should be gone through monthly instead of weekly. And carrying the spirit of compression still further, they added to the matin service what had hitherto been wholly distinct from it, the Mass service, or Communion. Since the Reformation, the same gradual change in the prevailing notions of prayer has worked its way silently but generally. 
The services, as they were left by the reformers, were, as they had been from the first ages, daily services. They are now weekly services. Are they not now in a fair way to become monthly? Sunday lessons. There are persons who wish certain Sunday lessons removed from our service, e.g. some of those selected for Lent. Nay, Jeremiah chapter 5 and 22. And on this, on the ground that it is painful to the feelings of clergymen to read them. Waiving other considerations which may be urged against innovation in this matter, may we not allow some weight to the following, which is drawn from the very argument brought in favour of the change. Will not the same feeling, which keeps men from reading the account of certain sins in their punishment from the Bible, much more keep them from mentioning them in the pulpit? Is it not necessary that certain sins, which it is distressing to speak of, should be seriously denounced as not being the less frequent in commission because they are disgraceful in language? And if so, is it not a most considerate provision of the Church to relieve her ministers of the pain of using their own words and to allow them to shelter their admonitions under the holy and reverent language of inspired Scripture? End of Tract 9 Tract 10 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1, by John Henry Newman et al. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Heads of a weekday lecture delivered to a country congregation in Blankshire by John Henry Newman. Before we meet again, we shall have celebrated the feast of St. Simon and St. Jude the Apostles. You will be at your daily work and will not have the opportunity to attend the service in church. For that reason, it may be as well you should lay up some good thoughts against that day, and such, by God's blessing, I will now attempt to give you. As you well know, there were twelve apostles. St. Simon and St. Jude were two of them. They preached the gospel of Christ, and they were like Christ, as far as sinful man may be accounted like the blessed Son of God. They were like Christ in their deeds and in their sufferings. The gospel for the festival shows us this. They were like Christ in their works, because Christ was a witness of the Father, and they were witnesses of Christ. Christ came in the name of God the Father Almighty. He came and spoke, and did works which none other man did. In like manner, the apostles were sent to bear witness of Christ, to declare his power, his great mercy, his sufferings on the cross for the sins of all men his willingness to save all who come to him. But again, they were like Christ in their sufferings. If the world hates you, he says to them, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said to you, the servant is not greater than his lord, if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Thus they were like Christ in office. I do not speak of their holiness, their faith, and all their other high excellences which God the Holy Ghost gave them. I speak now not of their personal graces, but of their office, of preaching, of witnessing Christ, of suffering for being his servants. Men ought to have listened to them and honoured them. Some did, but many the world did not. They hated them. They hated them for their office sake. Not because they were Paul and Peter and Simon and Jude, but because they bore witness to the Son of God and were chosen to be his ministers. Here is a useful lesson for us at this day. The apostles indeed are dead. Yet it is quite as possible for men to still hate their preaching and to persecute them as when they were alive. For in one sense, they are still alive. I mean, they did not leave the world without appointing persons to take their place. And these persons represent them, and may be considered with reference to us, as if they were the apostles. When a man dies, his son takes his property and represents him. That is... In a manner, he still lives in the person of his son. Well, 
This explains how the apostles may be said to be still among us. They did not indeed leave their sons to succeed them as apostles, but they left spiritual sons. They did not leave this life without first solemnly laying their hands on the heads of certain of their flock, and these took their place and represented them after their death. But it may be asked, are these spiritual sons of the apostles still alive? No. All this took place many hundred years ago. These sons and heirs of the apostles died long since. But then they in turn did not leave the world without committing their sacred office to a fresh set of ministers, and they in turn to another, and so on, even to this day. Thus the apostles had first spiritual sons, then spiritual grandsons, then great-grandsons, and so on from one age to another down to the present time. Again, it may be asked, who are at this time the successors and spiritual descendants of the apostles? I shall surprise some people with the answer I shall give, though it is very clear and there is no doubt about it. The bishops. They stand in the place of the apostles, and whatever we ought to do, had we lived when the apostles were alive, the same ought we to do for the bishops. He that despises them, despises the apostles. It is our duty to reverence them for their office's sake. They are the shepherds of Christ's flock. If we knew them well, we should love them for the many excellent graces they possess, for their piety, loving kindness, and other virtues. But we do not know them. Yet still, for all this, we may honour them as the ministers of Christ, without going so far as to consider their private worth. And we may keep to their fellowship, as we should to that of the apostles. I say, we may all thus honour them without even knowing them in private, because of their high office. For they have the marks of Christ's presence upon them, in that they witness for Christ and suffer for him, as the apostles did. I will explain to you how this is. There is a temptation which comes on many men to honour no one, except such as they themselves know, such as have done a favour or kindness to them personally. Thus sometimes people speak against those who are put over them in this world's matters, as the king. They say, what is the king to me? He never did me any good. Now I answer, whether he did or not is nothing to the purpose. We are bound for Christ's sake to honour him because he is king, though he lives far from us. And this all well-disposed, right-minded people do. And so, in just the same way, though for much higher reasons, we must honour the bishop because he is the bishop, for his office's sake, because he is Christ's minister, stands in the place of the apostles, is the shepherd of our souls on earth, while Christ is away. This is faith, to look at things not as seen, but as unseen, to be assured that the bishop is Christ's appointed representative, as if we actually saw upon his head a cloven tongue like as of fire, as you may read in the second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. But you will say, how do we know this, since we do not see it? I repeat, the bishops are apostles to us, from their witnessing Christ and suffering for him. 1. They witness Christ in their very name, for he is the true bishop of our souls, as St. Peter says, and they are bishops. They witness Christ in their station. There is but one Lord to save us, and there is but one bishop in each place. The meetingers have no head. They are all of them mixed together in a confused way. But we of Christ's holy church have one bishop over us, and our bishop is the bishop of blank. Many of you have seen him lately when he confirmed in our church. That very confirmation is another ordinance in which the bishop witnesses Christ. Our Lord confirms us with the Spirit in all goodness, the bishop is his figure and likeness when he lays his hands on the heads of children. Then Christ comes to them to confirm in them the grace of baptism. Moreover, the bishop rules the whole church here below, as Christ rules it above. And here again the bishop is a figure or witness of Christ. And further, it is the bishop who makes us clergymen God's ministers. He is Christ's instrument, and he visibly chooses those whom Christ chooses invisibly 
to serve in the word and sacraments of the church. And thus it is from the bishop that the news of redemption and the means of grace have come to all men. This again is a witness in Christ. I who speak to you concerning Christ was ordained to do so by the bishop. He speaks in me, as Christ wrought in him, and as God sent Christ. Thus the whole plan of salvation hangs together. Christ the true mediator above, his servant the bishop, his earthly likeness. Mankind the subjects of his teaching, God the author of salvation. 2. But I must now mention the more painful part of the subject, i.e. the sufferings of the bishops, which is the second mark of their being our living apostles. The bishops have undergone this trial in every age. As the first apostles were hated and persecuted, so have they ever been. Time was when they were cruelly slain by fire and sword. That time, though God avert it, may come again. But whether or not Satan is permitted so openly to rage, certainly some kinds of persecution are to be expected in our day. Nay, such have begun. It is not so very long since the great men of the earth told them to prepare for persecution. It is not so very long since the mad people answered the summons and furiously attacked them, and seemed bent on destroying them in all parts of the country. Yes, the day may come, even in this generation, when the representatives of Christ are spoiled of their sacred possessions and degraded from their civil dignities. The day may come when each of us inferior ministers, when I myself, whom you know, may have to give up our churches and be among you, in no better temporal circumstances than yourselves, with no larger dwelling, no finer clothing, no other fear, with nothing different beyond those gifts which I trust we gained when we were made ministers, and those again which have been vouchsafed to us before and after that time for the due fulfilment of our ministry. Then you will look at us, not as gentlemen as now, not as your superiors in worldly station, but still, nay, more strikingly so than now, still as messengers from him who seeth and worketh in secret, and who judgeth not by outward appearance. Then you will honour us with a purer honour than you do now, namely as those who are entrusted with the keys of heaven and hell, as the heralds of mercy, as the denouncers of woe to wicked men, as entrusted with the awful and mysterious gift of making the bread and wine Christ's body and blood, as far greater than the most powerful and the wealthiest of men in our unseen strength and our heavenly riches. This may all come in our day, and I can hardly wish it should not come, painful as is the thought of the great wickedness which those men must show forth who persecute us. Painful as is the thought of the sufferings which that persecution will cause us. And after all, if God's loving kindness spares both us and you the trial, still, it will have been useful to have steadily thought about it beforehand and to have prepared our hearts to meet it. End of Tract 10Tract 11 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. The Visible Church, in Letters to a Friend, by John Henry Newman. Letter 1. My dear Blank, You wish to have my opinion on the doctrine of the Holy Catholic Church as contained in Scripture and taught in the Creed, so I send you the following lines which perhaps may serve, through God's blessing, to assist you in your search after the truth in this matter, even though they do no more. Indeed, no remarks, however just, can be much more than an assistance to you. You must search for yourself, and God must teach you. I think I partly enter into your present perplexity. You argue that true doctrine is the important matter for which we must contend, and a right state of the affections is the test of vital religion in the heart. And you ask, why may not I be satisfied if my creed is correct and my affection spiritual? Have I not in that case enough to evidence a renewed mind and to constitute a basis of union with others like-minded? 
The love of Christ is surely the one and only requisite for Christian communion here, and the joys of heaven hereafter. Again, you say that blank and blank are constant in their prayers for the teaching of the Holy Spirit, so that if it be true that every one who asketh receiveth, surely they must receive and are in a safe state. Believe me, I do not think lightly of these arguments. They are very subtle ones, powerfully influencing the imagination and difficult to answer. Still, I believe them to be mere fallacies. Let me try them in a parallel case. You know the preacher at uh, blank, and have heard of his fragrantly immoral life. Yet it is notorious that he can and does speak in a moving way of the love of Christ, etc. It is very shocking to witness such a case, which, we will hope, is rare, but it has its use. Do you not think him in peril, in spite of his impressive and persuasive language? Why? You will say his life is bad. True. It seems, then, that more is requisite for salvation than an orthodox creed and keen sensibilities, viz. consistent conduct. Very well, then. We have come to an additional test of true faith, obedience to God's word and plainly a scriptural test, according to St. John's canon, He who doeth righteousness is righteous. Do not you see, then, your argument is already proved to be unsound? It seems that true doctrine and warm feelings are not enough. How am I to know what is enough? you ask. I reply, by searching scripture. It was your original fault that, instead of inquiring what God has told you is necessary for being a true Christian, you chose out of your own head to argue on the subject. E.g., I can never believe that to be such and such is not enough for salvation, etc. Now this is worldly wisdom. Let us join issue, then, on this plain ground, whether or not the doctrine of the Church and the duty of obeying it be laid down in Scripture. If so, it is no matter as regards our practice, whether the doctrine is primary or secondary, whether the duty is much or little insisted on. A Christian mind will aim at obeying the whole counsel and will of God. On the other hand, to those who attempted arbitrarily to classify and select their duties, it is written, Whosoever shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. And here first, that you may clearly understand the ground I am taking, pray observe that I am not attempting to controvert any one of those high evangelical points, on which perhaps we do not altogether agree with each other. Perhaps you attribute less efficacy to the sacrament of baptism than I do. Bring out to greater system and prominence the history of an individual's warfare with his spiritual enemies, Fix more precisely and abruptly the date of his actual conversion from darkness to light, and consider that divine grace acts more arbitrarily against the corrupt human will than I think is revealed in Scripture. Still, in spite of this difference of opinion, I see no reason why you should not accept heartily the Scripture doctrine of the Church. And this is the point I wish to press, not asking you to abandon your present opinions, but to add to them a practical belief in a tenet which the creed teaches and scripture has consecrated. And this surely is possible. The excellent Mr. Blank of Blank, who is lately left Blank, was both a Calvinist and a strenuous high churchman. You are in the practice of distinguishing between the visible and invisible church. Of course, I have no wish to maintain that those who shall be saved hereafter are exactly the same company that are under the means of grace here. Still, I must insist on it that Scripture makes the existence of a visible church a condition of the existence of the invisible. I mean, the sacraments are evidently in the hands of the church visible. And these, we know, are generally necessary to salvation, as the Catechism says. Thus it is an undeniable fact, as true as that souls will be saved, that a visible church must exist as a means towards that end. 
The sacraments are in the hands of the clergy. This few will deny, or that their efficacy is not diminished by the personal character of the administrator. What then should be thought of any attempts to weaken or exterminate that community or that ministry which is an appointed condition of the salvation of the elect? But everyone who makes or encourages a schism must weaken it. Thus it is plain, schism must be wrong in itself, even if Scripture did not in express terms forbid it as it does. But further than this, it is plain this visible church is a standing body. Everyone who is baptized is baptized into an existing community. Our service expresses this when it speaks of baptized infants being incorporated into God's holy church. Thus, the visible church is not a voluntary association of the day, but a continuation of one which existed in the age before us, and then again in the age before that, and so back till we come to the age of the apostles. In the same sense in which corporations of the states creating are perpetual, is this which Christ has founded. This is a matter of fact hitherto, and it necessarily will be so always. For is not the notion absurd of an unbaptized person baptizing others? Which is the only way in which the Christian community can have a new beginning. Moreover, Scripture directly insists on the doctrine of the visible church as being of importance. E.g., St. Paul says, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. Thus, as far as the apostles' words go, it is as false and unchristian, I do not mean a degree of guilt, but in its intrinsic sinfulness, to make more bodies than one, as to have many lords, many gods, many creeds. Now, I wish to know, how it is possible for anyone to fall into this sin if dissenters are clear of it? What is the sin if separation from the existing church is not it? I have shown that there is a divinely instituted visible church, and that it has been one and the same by successive incorporation of members from the beginning. Now I observe further that the word church, as used in scripture, ordinarily means this actually existing visible body. The exceptions to this rule, out of about a hundred places in the New Testament where the word occurs, are four passages in the Epistle to the Ephesians, two in the Colossians, and one in the Hebrews. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22, chapter 3 verses 10 and 21, chapter 5 verses 23 through 32, Colossians chapter 1 verses 18 and 24, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 23. And in some of these exceptions, the sense is at most but doubtful. Further, our Saviour uses the word twice, and in both times, of the visible church. They are remarkable passages, and may here be introduced in continuation of my argument. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now I am certain, any unprejudiced mind who knew nothing of controversy, considering the Greek word ecclesia means simply an assembly, would have no doubt at all that it meant in this passage a visible body. What right have we to disturb the plain sense? Why do we impose a meaning arising from some system of our own? And this view is altogether confirmed by the other occasion of our Lord's using it where it can only denote the visible church. Matthew chapter 18, verse 17. If he, thy brother, shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Observe then what we gain by these two passages. The grant of power to the church and the promise of permanence. Now, look at the fact. The body then begun has continued, and has always claimed and exercised the power of a corporation or society. 
consider merely the article and the creed, the Holy Catholic Church, which embodies this notion. Do not scripture and history illustrate each other? I end this first draft of my argument with the text in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, in which St. Paul calls the church the pillar and ground of the truth, which can refer to nothing but a visible body, else martyrs may be invisible, and preachers and teachers in the whole order of the ministry. Uh, my paper is exhausted. If you'll allow me, I will send you soon a second letter. Meanwhile, I sum up what I have been proving from Scripture thus that Almighty God might have left Christianity as a sort of sacred literature, as contained in the Bible, which each person was to take and use by himself, just as we read the works of any human philosopher or historian from which we gain practical instruction, but the knowledge of which does not bind us to be Newtonians or Aristotelians, etc., or to go out of our line of life in consequence of it. This, I say, he might have done. But in matter of fact, he has ordained otherwise. He has actually set up a society which exists even at this day all over the world and which, as a general rule, Christians are bound to join. So that to believe in Christ is not a mere opinion or a secret conviction, but a social or even a political principle, forcing one into what is often stigmatized as party strife and quite inconsistent with the supercilious mood of those professed Christians of the day who stand aloof and designate their indifference as philosophy. Ever yours. Letter 2. My dear blank. I am sometimes struck with the inconsistency of those who do not allow us to express the gratitude due to the Church, while they do not hesitate to declare their obligation to individuals who have benefited them. To avow that they owe their views of religion and their present hopes of salvation to this or that distinguished preacher appears to them as harmless as it may be in itself true and becoming. But if a person ascribes his faith and knowledge to the church, he is thought to forget his peculiar and unspeakable debt to that saviour who died for him. Surely, if our Lord makes man his instrument of good to man, and if it is possible to be grateful to man without forgetting the source of all grace and power, there is nothing wonderful in his having appointed a company of men as the especial medium of his instruction and spiritual gifts, and in consequence of his having laid upon us the duty of gratitude to it. Now this is all I wish to maintain. What is most clearly, as I think, revealed in Scripture, that the blessings of redemption come to us through the visible church, so that, as we betake ourselves to a dispensary for medicine, without attributing praise or intrinsic worth to the building or the immediate managers of its stores, in something of a like manner, we are come to that one society to which Christ has entrusted the office of stewardship in the distribution of gifts which he alone is the author and real dispenser. In the letter I sent you the other day, I made some general remarks on this doctrine. Now, let me continue the subject. First, the sacraments, which are the ordinary means of grace, are clearly in possession of the Church. Baptism is an incorporation into a body and invests with spiritual blessings because it is the introduction into a body so invested. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we are taught first the Spirit's indwelling in the visible Church or body. I do not say in every member of it, but generally in it. Next, we are told that the Spirit baptizes individuals into that body. Again, the Lord's Supper carries evidence of its social nature, even in its name. It is not a solitary individual act. It is a joint communion. Surely nothing is more alien to Christianity than the spirit of independence. The peculiar Christian blessing, i.e. the presence of Christ, is upon two or three gathered together, not on mere individuals. But this is not all. The sacraments are committed, not into the hands of the church visible assembled together, though even this would be no unimportant doctrine practically, but into certain definite persons who are selected from their brethren for that trust. I will not here determine who these are in each successive age, 
but only point out how far this principle itself will carry us. The doctrine is implied in the original institution of the Lord's Supper, where Christ says to his apostles, Do this. Further, take that remarkable passage in Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 to 51, or Luke chapter 12, verses 42 to 46. Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing, etc. Now I do not inquire who, in every age, are the stewards spoken of. Though in my own mind I cannot doubt the line of bishops is that ministry, and consider the concluding verses fearfully prophetic of the papal misuse of the gift. And by the by, at least it shows this, that bad men may nevertheless be the channels of grace to God's household. I do not ask who are the stewards, but surely the words, when he cometh, imply that they are to continue till the end of the world. This reference is abundantly confirmed by our Lord's parting words to the eleven, in which, after giving them the baptismal commission, he adds, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. If then he was with the apostles in a way in which he was not present with teachers who were strangers to their fellowship, Acts chapter 2 verse 42, which all will admit, so in like manner it cannot be a matter of indifference in any age what teachers and fellowship a Christian selects. There must be those with whom Christ is present, who are his stewards, and whom it is our duty to obey. As I have mentioned the question of faithfulness and unfaithfulness in ministers, I may refer to the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, where St. Paul, after speaking of himself and others as stewards of the mysteries of God, and noticing that it is required of stewards that a man be found faithful, adds, With me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Therefore, judge nothing before the time. To proceed, consider the following passage. Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17. Again, I do not ask who these are, but whether this is not a duty, however it is to be fulfilled, which multitudes in no sense fulfil. Consider the number of people, professing and doubtless in a manner already actuated by Christian principle, who yet wander about from church to church, or from church to meeting, as sheep without a shepherd, or who choose a preacher merely because he pleases their taste, and whose first movement towards any clergyman they meet is to examine and criticise his doctrine. What conceivable meaning do they put upon these words of the Apostle? Does anyone rule over them? Do they in any way submit themselves? Can these persons excuse their conduct, except on the deplorably profane plea, which yet I believe is in their hearts at the bottom of their disobedience, that it matters little to keep Christ's least commandments, so that we embrace the peculiar doctrines of his gospel? Some time ago, I drew up a sketch of the scripture proof of the doctrine of the visible church, which, with your leave, I will here transcribe. You will observe, I am not arguing for this or that form of polity, or for the apostolical succession, but simply the duties of order, union, and ecclesiastical obedience. I limit myself to these points, as being persuaded that, when they are granted, the others will eventually follow. First, that there was a visible church in the Apostles' day. 1. General texts. Matthew chapter 16 verse 18, chapter 18 verse 17, 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15, Acts, Passim, etc. 2. Organization of the church. 1. Diversity of ranks. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4 verses 4 to 12, Romans chapter 12 verses 4 to 8, 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 10 and 11. 2. Governors. Matthew, chapter 28, verse 19, Mark, chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, John, chapter 20, verses 22 and 23, 
Luke chapter 22, verses 19 and 20, Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, etc. 3. Gifts. Luke chapter 12, verses 42-43, John chapter 20, verses 22 and 23, Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. 4. Order. Acts chapter 8, verses 5, 6, 12, 14, 15 and 17, chapter 11, verses 22 and 23, chapter 11, verses 2 and 4, chapter 9, verse 27, chapter 15, verses 2, 4, 6 and 25, Chapter 16, verse 4, chapter 18, verse 22, chapter 21, verses 17 to 19. Uh, compare Galatians, chapter 1, verses 1 and 12, 1 Corinthians, chapter 14, verse 40, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 14. 5. Ordination. Acts, chapter 6, verse 6, 1 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 14, chapter 5, verse 22. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 6, Titus, chapter 1, verse 5, Acts, chapter 13, verse 3, compare Galatians, chapter 1, verses 1 and 12. 6. Ecclesiastical obedience. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 17, Timothy, chapter 5, verse 17. 7. Rules and discipline. Matthew chapter 28 verse 19, Matthew chapter 18 verse 17, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 4 to 7, Galatians chapter 5 verse 12, etc. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 1 and 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 2 and 16, etc. 8. Unity. Romans chapter 16 verse 17, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10, chapter 3 verse 3, Chapter 14, verse 26. Colossians, chapter 2, verse 5. First Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 14. Second Thessalonians, chapter 3, verse 6. Second, that the visible church, thus instituted by the apostles, was intended to continue. One, why should it not? The onus probandi lies with those who deny this position. If the doctrines and precepts already cited are obsolete at this day, why should not the following texts, e.g., 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, or, e.g., Matthew chapter 7, verse 14, John chapter 3, verse 3? 3. 2. Is it likely so elaborate a system should be framed, yet with no purpose of its continuing? 3. The objects to be obtained by it are as necessary now as then. First, preservation of the faith. Second, purity of doctrine. Third, edification of Christians. Fourth, unity of operation. Videlicet in the epistles to Timothy and Titus, Passim. Four, if system were necessary in a time of miracles, much more is it now. Five, second Timothy, chapter two, verse two. Matthew, chapter 28, verse 20, etc. Take these remarks as they are meant, as mere suggestions for your private consideration, and believe me, etc., etc. End of Tract 11《Bishops, Priests, and Deacons》by Thomas Keeble It is evident unto all men, diligently reading the Holy Scripture and ancient authors, that from the Apostles' time there have been these orders of ministers in Christ's Church, bishops, priests, and deacons. Preface to the Ordination Service In the course of this last summer of 1833, I had the pleasure of a visit from an old and valued friend, one of the most respectable merchants in the city of Bristol. And this, in my opinion, is no small praise. We were discussing one day the subject of national schools, their merits and demerits. He was pleading strenuously for them, and to confirm his arguments, I will mention, said he, a circumstance which happened to me when I was in this part of the world about eleven or twelve years ago. I was travelling on a coach somewhere between Sheffield and Leeds, when we took up a lad of fourteen or fifteen years of age. 
a rough, country-looking boy, but well-mannered and of an intelligent countenance. I found upon conversation with him that he belonged to a national school in the neighbourhood, which, he said, he was on the point of leaving. This gave me occasion to ask him various questions, which he answered with so much readiness and vivacity, yet without any self-conceit in his manner, that when the coach stopped, I think it was at Barnsley, for a short time I took him with me into a bookseller's shop, and desired him to select some book which I might give him as a testimony of my approbation. After looking at a few which the bookseller recommended, he fixed on a selection from Bishop Wilson's works, whose name, he said, he had often heard. He begged me to write his name in it, which I did, and we parted with mutual expressions of goodwill, and I will be bold to prophesy that that boy, more young man as he must now be, if he is still alive, by giving his conduct strong a testimony in favour of the national school system that a thousand of your speculating philosophers can bring against it. Well, said I, you are apt to be sanguine in your views, but as I must confess they are very often right, so I will hope you may not have been deceived in this instance. It so happened that two or three days after this conversation we were taking a walk together and discussing various topics such as the present state of things might well suggest, when we met a young man, a neighbour of mine, a mason, who detained us two or three minutes while he asked my directions about some work he was doing for me. After he was out of hearing, that, said I, is one of the most respectable young men I know. Soon after I came here, more than four years ago, he married a young woman of a disposition similar to his own, and they live in that cottage that you see there, to the right of that row of beeches. I see it, I believe, said he, hardly looking the way I pointed, and not altogether seeming pleased at having our conversation thus interrupted. He has two or three little children, and I believe sometimes it goes hard with them, as in the winter work is short hereabouts. He does not like beating about far from home. I sometimes tell him he ought to look farther, but he is so fond of his home, his wife and children, that I verily think he would rather live on potatoes seven days in the week with them than have meat and beer by himself. And besides, I know he does not relish the companions he must work with at the town. However, on the whole, they do tolerably well, as they have a garden of fair size, and he never spends an unnecessary penny. I'm glad to hear it, said he. But we were talking about the value of an apostolical succession in the ministry, were we not? and of the great ignorance and neglect now prevailing on the subject. We were, said I. But to tell you the truth, though I have bestowed considerable attention on the subject, and examined the various opinions which have been put forth on it, yet I have scarcely learnt so much hereon from the works of learned theologians as I have from repeated conversations with that very young man we just now met. You surprise me, said he. You may be surprised, but it is, however, true. And if you have no objection, I will tell you how it was. By all means, he answered. When first I came to the parish, I looked about for some person to take charge of the Sunday school, as the master was old and so deaf as to be unequal to the work. I was recommended to apply to Richard Nelson. That is the man's name. Here my friend interrupted me, saying, Richard Nelson? Why? Now I remember that was the very name of the boy I travelled with. Indeed, said I. Then doubtless it is the same person, for his age will agree with your account very well. And I know he was bred at blank national school. Well, said he, I am quite delighted to find myself a true prophet in this instance. Perhaps, said I, you will be more pleased when you have heard all that I have to tell you you will find that your little present was by no means thrown away. Go on, said he. I am all attention. I was telling you, I believe, that I requested Nelson to become master of the Sunday school. After some little hesitation, he declined my offer, under the plea that he could not give constant and regular attendance, though he was willing to attend occasionally and render what assistance he could. So it was arranged that the old master should still remain and I afterwards discovered that an unwillingness to deprive him of the little emolument was Nelson's real reason for declining my offer. As the Sunday school is nearly three quarters of a mile from my house in a direction beyond Nelson's, along the beach walk, as we call it, 
It frequently happened that we joined in companies we went to and fro. We generally talked over such subjects as had reference to the school or to the state of religion in general, and amongst other topics, that on which you and I are conversing. The authority of Christian ministers. I remember it was on the following occasion that the subject was started between us. I thought that I had observed one Sunday that he was making the boys of his class, our school professors to be on the bell system, that he was, I say, making his boys read the 19th and some other of the 39 articles relating to the ministerial office, and that afterwards he was explaining and illustrating them after his usual manner by referring them to suitable parts of scripture. On our walk homewards, I inquired if I was right in my conjecture. He said yes, and that in the present state of things he could not help thinking it quite a duty to direct the minds of young persons to such subjects and on this and many subsequent occasions he set forth his opinions on the matter, which I will state to you, as far as I can remember, in his own words. My good mother, he said, not long before her death, which happened about half a year before I came to live here, said to me very earnestly one day, as I was sitting by her bedside, My dear Richard, observe my words, never dare to trifle with God Almighty. By this I understood her to mean that in all religious actions we ought to be very awful and to seek nothing but what is right and true. And I knew that she had always disapproved of people saying, as they commonly do, that it little matters what a man's religion is if he is but sincere, and that one opinion or one place of worship is as good as another. To say or think or act so, she used to call trifling with God's truth. And do you not think, sir, addressing himself to me, that she was right? Indeed I do, said I. And, he said, I was much confirmed in these opinions by constantly reading a very wise, and I may say to you, precious book, which a gentleman gave me some years ago, whom I met by chance when I was going to see my father in the infirmary. It is called a selection from Bishop Wilson's works, and there are many places in it which show that what his opinions were on this subject. And I suppose, sir, there can be no doubt that Bishop Milson was a man of extraordinary judgment and piety. He has ever been considered so, I answered. I could not think much of anyone's judgment or piety either who should say otherwise, he replied. And what Bishop Wilson says is this, or to this effect, that to reject the government of bishops is to reject an ordinance of God. That our salvation depends under God upon the ministry of those whom Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost have appointed to reconcile men to God. That the personal failings of ministers do not make void their commission. That if the unity of the church is once made a light matter, and he who is the centre of unity and in Christ's stead shall come to be despised and his authority set at naught, then will error and infidelity get ground. Jesus Christ and his gospel will be despised, and the kingdom of Satan set up again here as well as in other nations, with many other expressions like these. And yet, sir, he continued, the gentleman who lives over there, pointing to a great house in sight four or five miles off down the valley, who is said to be a person of much learning and who does a great deal of good, he does not take the matter in the same light, for he told a man of blank whom I was working with that if a person preached what was right and good that was the best sign of his being ordained a minister without the ceremony of laying on of a bishop's hands upon his head and the man that told me very much admired the opinion in regard he said of it being so very liberal or some such word though I confess I could not exactly see what there was so much to admire because if the opinion were true it was good, and if it were false, it was bad. Equally as much to my thinking, whether it were called liberal or bigoted. Doubtless you were right, said I. And, he proceeded, it seemed to me, and I told the man so, like going round and round in a wheel to say, if he is God's minister, he preaches what is good, and if he preaches what is good, he is God's minister. For still the question will be, What is right and good? 
And some would say one thing and some another. And some would say there is nothing right nor good at all in itself, but only as seems most expedient to every person for the time being. So for my own satisfaction, and hoping for God's blessing in my endeavour, I resolved to search the matter out for myself as well as I could. My plan was this. First, to see what was said on the subject in the church prayer book, and then to compare this with the scriptures. And if, after all, I could not satisfy myself, I should have taken the liberty of consulting you, sir, if I had been here, or Mr. Blank, who was the minister at Blank, where I came from. Yours was a good plan, I said. But I suppose you had forgotten that the chief part of the church services which relate to these subjects is not contained in the prayer books which we commonly use. I was aware of that, he answered, but my wife's father had been clerk of Blank Parish, and it so happened that the church warden had given him a large prayer book in which all the ordination services were quite perfect, though the book was ancient and in some parts very ragged. This book my wife brought with her when we came here, and indeed she values it very highly on account of her poor father having used it for so many years. Thus you see, sir, with the Bible and prayer book, and, as I hoped, God's blessings on my labours, I was not, as you may say, unfurnished for the work. Indeed, Richard, you were not, I replied. Well then, he proceeded, I first observed that the church is very particular in not allowing any administration of the sacraments or any public service of Almighty God to take place, except when there is one of her ministers to guide and take the lead in the solemnity. Thus, not only in the administration of baptism and of the Lord's Supper, but in the daily morning and evening prayers, in the public catechizing of children, in the solemnization of marriage, in the visitation of the sick, and in the burial of the dead. In all these cases, the Christian congregation is never supposed complete, nor the service perfect, unless there is also present a minister authorised to lead the devotions of the people. And yet I also observed that neither minister nor people, nor even with the leave of the bishop himself, had power or authority given them to alter or vary from the rules set down in the prayer book. And often have I thought, how well it would be if ministers, and people too, would be more careful to keep to the rules. Yes, said I, it is too true. We are all to blame. But, he proceeded, taking a small prayer book out of his pocket, the question I had next to ask was, who are meant by these ministers so often referred to in the church service? To this question, I found a general answer on the 23rd, 26th and 36th articles, where the judgment of the church is thus plainly given. First, that it is not lawful for any man to take upon him the office of public preaching or ministering the sacraments in the congregation before he be lawfully called and sent to execute the same. Secondly, that those are lawfully called and sent who are chosen and called to the work by men who have public authority given them in the congregation to call and send ministers into the Lord's vineyard. Thirdly, that though sometimes evil men may have chief authority in the ministration of the word and sacraments, yet forasmuch as they do not the same in their own name, but in Christ's, and do minister by his commission and authority, we may use their ministry with full hope of God's blessing. Fourthly, that whosoever are consecrated and ordained according to the rites there prescribed are rightly, orderly, and lawfully consecrated and ordained. But here, sir, I will take occasion to ask you whether it would not have been better, instead of calling the second order of ministers priests, to have used the word which is frequently found in the New Testament applied to them, elders or presbyters. Why, I said, I have no doubt the wise and good men who framed the prayer book had a good reason for retaining the title of priests. But in truth, it is one of the very words you mentioned, only somewhat shortened by our forefathers in their pronunciation of it. Presbyter was made presta, and that by degrees became pressed or priest. That, said he, is very remarkable, and proves that we ought to inquire before we find fault. But to go on with what I was saying, I next proceeded to read over 
and I assure you, sir, I did it with great care, the three services in our great prayer book, namely for consecration of bishops, ordaining of priests, and making of deacons. And I must confess to you that I could not but greatly admire them, and at the same time feel much astonishment at two considerations which they brought to my mind. What were they, Richard? I inquired. The one was, he said, to think that after such a solemn dedication to the ministry, there should be such a thing as a careless or a wicked clergyman. And yet, sir, is it not also astonishing that after such a solemn dedication of ourselves as we make to God in baptism, there should be such a thing as a careless or a wicked Christian? So it is, I said. When we judge others, we condemn ourselves. But what was the other ground of your surprise? Why, it was this, that there should be any doubt what the opinion of the church is respecting the Christian ministry. Comparing the ordination service with the liturgy and articles, it seems to me quite clear that in the judgment of the church, none can show themselves duly authorised ministers of Christ who do not belong to one or other of the three orders, of bishops, priests or deacons. But, said I to myself, other churches have erred. Why may not this, then, be the misfortune of the Church of England also? And this very opinion may be one of her errors. You see, then, sir, the next thing I had to do was to consult the scriptures on the subject, and, if it be not too bold in such a one as I to say so, to try the prayer book by the Bible. Your method was the best possible, I said. But if you please... Do not use the expression the Church of England, but the Church in England. Why, indeed, sir, said he. In the present state of things, perhaps it would be more proper. But to proceed with my inquiry, I first observed that in the history of the Jews, as contained in the Old Testament, as well as in that of Christians in the New, the Almighty seems almost or quite always to have communicated his will to mankind through some chosen minister, someone, whether it were angel or man, who could give suitable evidence of the authority by which he spoke or acted. But there seemed to me to be this great difference between Jews and Christians, in this, as in other cases, that in the Jews' religion, all the rules and regulations were set down so plainly and distinctly that no one could mistake their meaning. For instance, in the Levitical laws concerning the priesthood, of what family and tribe the priests and high priests should be, what their respective duties, and what their dress, etc. Whereas in the Christian religion, the rules and regulations, however important and even necessary, are yet not so exactly set down. And I remember hearing a very good and wise clergyman say in a sermon at Blank Church that this is probably what St. James means when he calls the gospel a law of liberty. Namely, that its rules and directions are not so plainly set down on purpose that Christians might have freer space. I remember that was his expression. And opportunity to exercise their faith and love for their Redeemer. And I've sometimes thought myself that what St. Paul says about the difference between walking by faith and by sight seems to suit the different cases of Jews and Christians. They walked by sight, we must walk by faith. And faith in this world, we are told, can see but as through a glass darkly. It seems so, I said. He proceeded. With this view, I went on to examine the New Testament, expecting to find there in some general instruction respecting the institution and authority of ministers in the Christian church, but I did not expect that these rules should be as particular and distinct as those on the same subject in the Old Testament, any more than I should expect to find a command to Christians to observe the Lord's Day set down as distinctly as the command to observe the Sabbath was set down for the Jews. And yet, sir, I suppose all will agree that no one who willfully neglects the Lord's Day can be a true Christian. There are strange opinions now afloat, said I, and if many despise the Lord's ministers, it is no wonder if many also despise the Lord's Day. Indeed, sir, said he, it is not to be wondered at, but to go on with my statement. 
on carefully perusing the New Testament history, I remarked that our Lord did not grant ministerial authority to his disciples in general, but first to twelve and then to seventy, that of those twelve, one was among the wickedest of mankind, and that our Lord knew his character when he appointed him. St. John, chapter 6, verse 64, chapter 13, verse 18. That possibly some of those seventy also might be unworthy persons. That our Lord, just before his departure, gave what may be called a fresh commission to his apostles, which they should act upon after his ascension. That after that event, the twelve apostles were the leading persons in the Christian church, having under them two orders or degrees, viz. bishops, sometimes called elders, and deacons. That this threefold division of the ministers in the church lasted as far as the New Testament history reaches, the apostles having set men over different churches with apostolical authority to preside during their absence and to succeed them after their decease. This sufficiently appears from places in St. Paul's epistles to Timothy and Titus. Do you remember any of the passages, I asked him. I cannot, he said, call to mind chapter and verse, but I have with me a little paper of memorandums which I use at the school, and which, if it be not too much trouble, I will thank you to look at. The paper was as follows, for I thought it well to copy what he had written into my pocket memorandum book. It appears that Timothy had authority at Ephesus to check false or unedifying teachers, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, to select persons proper to be ordained bishops, chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, and also deacons, chapter 3, verses 8 to 13, that he should have particular regard to the elders who rule well, chapter 5, verse 17, that he should be cautious of receiving accusations against elders, chapter 5, verse 19, that if any elders were convicted, it was his duty to reprimand them publicly. Chapter 5, verse 20. That in his decisions he should be strictly impartial. Chapter 5, verse 21. That he should be very cautious on whom he laid his hands. Chapter 5, verse 22. That Timothy was in a station which even the rich and great might respect. Chapter 6, verse 17. That Timothy had been ordained by St. Paul himself once, if not twice, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 6 That at his ordination or consecration there was something remarkable in the sermon 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 14 chapter 1 verse 18 that he was to commit what he had heard from St Paul to faithful men who should be able to pass it on to others 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 2 that Titus had authority to set in order what was wanting in the Cretan church Titus chapter 1 verse 5 and to ordain bishops in every city, chapter 1, verse 5 and 7, that he was to be cautious whom he selected for this office, chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, that he should rebuke false teachers sharply, chapter 1, verse 13, that if Titus himself was a pattern of good works and a teacher of truth, the whole church would gain credit, chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, that he should rebuke with all authority, chapter 2, verse 15, that he should suffer no man to despise him, chapter 2, verse 15, that after one or two admonitions he should reject heretical persons, chapter 3, verse 10. Now, sir, it seems to me evident from these and other similar passages that there were certainly in the church, as far as the Testament history reaches, three different ranks or orders of ministers, one above the other. It is plainly so, I said. But, said he, there was one point which rather perplexed me, and I was some time before I could make out an explanation of it as was satisfactory to myself. What was that? I asked. Why, he said he, it was this. I considered that any person to whom the apostles granted apostolical authority, Timothy, for instance, was from that time higher than a presbyter or bishop, and yet could not properly be called an apostle. What then could he be called? I at last remembered a place in Bishop Wilson's little book, which led me to reflect that as surely as there were angels, whether it might mean guardians or heavenly messengers or missionary bishops, as we might say, of the seven churches in Asia, so Timothy might have been called the angel of the Ephesian church and Titus of the church of Crete, and the same in other cases. And it came into my thoughts 
that perhaps after St. John's decease, whether out of humility, or because the church is being settled, the ministers need no longer be missionaries, the title of apostles or angels was laid aside, and that of bishops limited to the highest of the three orders. Thus I seem to myself everywhere to have traced the threefold order, down from the beginning of the gospel, the authority and distinction peculiar to each being preserved, a difference in name only taking place. At first they were apostles, elders, deacons. After the decease of some of the apostles, or at least while St. John was yet living, angels, bishops, deacons. At some period, after St. John's decease, bishops, priests, deacons. I do not see how what you have said can be contradicted, I replied. But, he proceeded, there is one thing I must, sir, confess to you, and it is this, that I have often said to myself what a comfort it would be if it had pleased God to preserve to us some few writings of the good men who lived close after the apostles, so that we might have known their opinion on matters of this kind, and we might have known too by what names they distinguished the different orders of ministers one from another. For surely what they would think most proper in such cases must be safest of all rules for us to follow, unless, which is a thing not to be supposed, their rules should be contrary to those of the apostles, as set down as scripture. So, sir, I have often thought, if any such writings could be found, what a precious treasure they would be. What? said I. Richard, did you never hear of those who are called the Apostolic Fathers? Clement, Polycarp, Ignatius? I believe I have heard of them, he answered, but I observe that you, sir, and other clergymen scarcely ever notice them in your sermons, and the man I mentioned just now told me that Mr. Cartwright, who is the minister of the independent chapel at the town, and who is reckoned to be a very learned man and an admired preacher, that he should say in a sermon that the works of the fathers were very imperfect, and their opinion not much to be trusted to. But, said I, Richard, if a person whose word you could take were to show you an old book written by persons who had seen our Saviour, who had heard St. John and St. Paul preach, and had been well acquainted with them, should you not value such a book, and wish to know whether there was anything in it, which could throw light on the history of those early times of the Church, and especially with reference to the subjects you and I have been now conversing on? Indeed, sir, I should, he said. But if what Mr. Cartwright said is true, it is too much to expect that any such treasure should be found by us. No, Richard, I said, it is not too much. The kind providence of God has permitted some of the writings of those good men to be preserved to this day, and there is no more doubt that they are their genuine writings than that Bishop Ken wrote the evening hymn, or Bishop Wilson, that little book you like so much. If this is indeed as you say, he replied, we have great reason to be thankful for such a proof of God's care for his church. But I beg you, sir, to tell me whether there is anything in these writings you speak of which confirms what I have been venturing to state to you as my opinion gathered from Scripture concerning the threefold distinction of Christian ministers. Next Sunday, said I, you shall see and judge for yourself. As we came home from church in the afternoon of the following Sunday, he reminded me of my promise, and I gave him a written paper containing a few extracts which I had translated from the works of the Apostolical Fathers, telling him that I might possibly have made a mistake here and there in the rendering, that he might depend on such being the general force and meaning of the passages. The extracts I gave him were the following. Clement, with my other fellow labourers, Philippians chapter 4, verse 3. Ignatius and the Holy Polycarp, the Bishop of the Smyrnaeans, had formerly been disciples of the Holy Apostle John. Martyrdom of St. Ignatius. The apostles, preaching throughout countries and cities, used to appoint their first fruits, after they had proved them by the Spirit, to be bishops and deacons of those who should hereafter believe. St. Clement to the Corinthians. The apostles knew that there will be dispute about the name of bishopric or episcopacy, wherefore they appointed the aforementioned and gave them authority beforehand, in order that if themselves should fall asleep, other approved men might succeed to their ministerial office. The same. 
All of you followed the bishop as Jesus Christ followed the Father, and the presbytery as the apostles, and reverenced the deacons as God's ordinance. Let no man do any of those things which pertain to the church without the bishop. He that honoureth the bishop is honoured of God. He that doeth anything without the privity of the bishop doeth service to the devil. St. Ignatius to the Smyrnaeans. Have regard to the bishop, that God also may regard you. My soul for theirs who are subject to the bishops, elders, and deacons, and may it be my lot to have a portion with them in God. St. Ignatius to Polycarp. The bishops who were appointed in the farthest regions are according to the will of Jesus Christ. Whence it becometh you to go along with the will of the bishop. St. Ignatius to the Ephesians. That ye may obey the bishop and the presbytery, having your mind without distraction, breaking one bread, the same. Some indeed talk with the bishop, yet do everything without him. But such persons do not appear to me conscientious, on account of their congregations not being assembled strictly according to the commandment. St. Ignatius to the Magnesians. I exhort you to be zealous to do all things in divine concord, the bishop presiding in the place of God, and the presbyters in the place of the council of apostles, and the deacons, in whom I most delight, entrusted with the service of Jesus Christ. The same. For as many as are gods and Jesus Christ's, these are with the bishop, St. Ignatius to the Philadelphians. Be ye earnest to keep one Eucharist, for the flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ is one, and there is one cup in the unity of his blood, one altar, as one bishop, together with the presbytery and deacons, my fellow servants. The same. Hold to the bishop and to the presbytery and deacons. Without the bishop, do nothing. The same. When you are subject to the bishop as to Jesus Christ, ye appear to me as living not according to man's rule, but according to Jesus Christ. St. Ignatius to the Tralians. He that without the bishop and presbytery and deacon doeth aught, that person is not pure in his conscience. The same. Polycarp and the presbyters, who were with him, to the church of God, sojourning at Philippi. St. Polycarp to the Philippians. Being subject to the presbyters, deacons as to God and Christ. The same. Two or three weeks afterwards, as we were walking homewards after evening service, he gave me back the paper, with expressions of great satisfaction and thankfulness, and added that he blessed God for having led him to make the inquiry, and that he was sure if many religiously disposed persons who now think little of such matters would turn their minds to them without partiality, they would fear to separate from a church like ours, which, whatever may be its imperfections, is substantially pure in its doctrine and in the apostolical succession of its ministry. Sir, said he, I am a poor hard-working man, as you know, but the interests of my soul and of those dear to me are of as great importance in the sight of Almighty God, and ought to be to me also, as if my lot had been cast in a higher station. It is to me, therefore, no matter of indifference, as many have told me it should be, what is the truth on these great subjects. But I am more and more sure that it is a Christian duty first to inquire into them, and when we have found the truth, to act up to it, humbly but resolutely. The times are bad, I confess, but yet, young though I am, I do not expect, as the world now goes, to see them much better. What our Lord said about iniquity abounding and love growing cold seems to be but too suitable to our present state. I've often thought it, and have said, though I've seldom met with anyone who would agree with me in the opinion, the Church of England, I can plainly see, more plainly perhaps than a person in a higher station, is in a manner gone. The Church in England, God be thanked, however reflected, remains, and ever will, I trust, whether the world smiles or frowns upon her. I've therefore determined, sir, by God's grace, to look to myself, my wife and children, and not to trust the world to do us any good, either in time or in eternity. And if by following the truth now, we shall all be together, hereafter in the society of prophets, apostles, saints and martyrs, you know then, sir, we shall have nothing more to wish for, nothing more to fear, 
Every doubt will be satisfied, every difficulty removed. And I assure you, sir, it is the very comfort of my life to spend a portion of every Sunday in looking forward to that happy time. God bless you, Richard, said I as we parted at his garden gate. And when I came home, I could not but fall on my knees and thank God for having given me such a parishioner. End of Tract 12 Track 13 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Sunday Lessons, The Principle of Selection, by John Keeble. Among projected alterations in the liturgy, not the least popular seems to be a very considerable change in the selection of the Sunday Lessons. People do not see, first of all, why such and such chapters are chosen out of the Old Testament in preference to others, which they think more edifying. Secondly, they see no reason why the Church should not assign proper lessons to every Sunday from the New Testament, as well as from the Old. One who hopes that he should not be found froward, were a change to be made by competent spiritual authority, begs leave, nevertheless, to submit to all considerate lovers of the prayer book the following remarks on the two points specified above. 1. Before people find fault with the selection of particular chapters, they ought to be tolerably certain that they understand the principle on which the lessons in general were selected. It is to be regretted that we have remaining little, if any, historical evidence touching the views of the compilers of the liturgy in that portion of their task. What we do know amounts to this. In King Edward's prayer books, no distinction was made as to appointing lessons between Sundays and other days of the week. The chapter of the Old Testament set down for the day of the month was read in course for the Sunday lesson, as is the case still in regard of the New Testament. With a view to this, probably, the well-known notice was prepared which now stands prefixed to the second book of homilies, but in Stripe's opinion belongs rather to the first book. Where, i.e. whereas, it may so chance some one or other chapter of the Old Testament to fall in order to be read upon the Sundays or holidays, which were better to be changed with some other of the New Testament for more edification, it should be well done to spend your time to consider well of such chapters beforehand. This came out first, as it seems, in 1560, and about the same time the commission was given to Archbishop Parker, Bishop Grindle, and others, to peruse the order of the lessons throughout the whole year, and to cause new calendars to be printed, in pursuance of which the present table of Sunday lessons was prepared, and came out the same year. We may then consider it as Archbishop Parker's, and surely not one among the reformers might be more thoroughly depended on for a sound practical view of things. Farther than this, we have no direct information. We must be guided, therefore, entirely by the internal evidence of the lessons themselves. The series begins from Septuagesima Sunday, because it was the custom of the early church to read the book of Genesis in Lent. Let us examine them in their order ending with the sixth Sunday after Epiphany in the following year. We shall find, if I mistake not, that the selection may be accounted for on this supposition, viz., that the arrangers desired to exhibit God's former dealings with his chosen people collectively, and the return made by them to God in such manner as might best illustrate his dealings with each individual, chosen now to be in his church, and the snares and temptations most apt to beset us as Christians. Certainly, there does exist a very wonderful analogy between these two cases, that of the Jewish nation delineated in the Bible, and that of a baptized Christian, as known by daily experience. An analogy most striking in itself, most clearly pointed out more than once in the New Testament, and very serviceable, if rightly understood, in many great points of faith and practice. This analogy arises out of the fact that Christians severally are what the Jews collectively were 
partakers of an especial covenant. It is to be supposed that the great enemy has his peculiar way of dealing with souls placed in such a relation, as with parents, children, subjects, and others, according to their several relations. To exhibit such his purpose and proceedings, and to exemplify also the counteracting methods of providence, seems to be one especial purpose of the historical portions of the Old Testament, in which the prophetical are here included. To give an instance of what is here meant, one of the most prevailing temptations to unbelief and careless practice is the daily experience we have of Christians behaving so very differently from what one should expect, a priori, in God's elect. It does not seem as if, left to ourselves, we should have any adequate view of the kind of hypocrisy described by Bishop Butler in his sermon on self-deceit and elsewhere. I mean, the temper which leads men to act towards God Almighty, whom in theory and understanding they own, as if it were in their power to deceive him. To explain this for the benefit of those most in danger seems one great purpose of the Old Testament. To explain it, I say, for the benefit of unworthy Christians who may discern themselves by anticipation in the faithless demeanour of the Jews. It is conceivable that such a series of extracts might be made to illustrate this matter more particularly, i.e., on a principle of admonition. Would not such a series coincide very nearly with the Sunday lessons? Thus, the first and second chapters of Genesis represent man as at first placed in covenant with his maker. The third, sixth, and ninth represent his fall, and the wonderful mixture of judgment and mercy which prepared him for the recovery, which God had in store for him, by virtue of a new covenant. Then, Genesis chapter 12, follows the first definite step towards the establishment of that new covenant, the call of Abraham to be the select pattern and spiritual progenitor of all who shall ever be saved by it. And here again, judgment is shown mingled with mercy, and thorough probation accompanying both, by the two selected chapters of Abraham's history, the fall of Sodom and the sacrifice of Isaac. Then begins the account of Jacob and his family, the other great section of the patriarchal history displaying on the one hand the great danger of taking liberties with moral duty, under the notion of being favourites with God, for the subsequent misfortunes of Jacob's family are clearly traceable to that first want of faith. On the other hand, the mysterious waves of providence, turning those misfortunes and errors into means for the great purpose of preparing a covenanted nation to take the place of the covenanted family. With Exodus begins the history of that nation, which may perhaps not improperly be styled the appropriate type of each backsliding Christian, as Abraham we know was the type of the faithful. The chapters selected show, first, God preparing the way for their election, then their reluctant acceptance of the favour, next, the actual process of their deliverance, the whole being so arranged this latter shall correspond with the season of Easter, which is indeed, so to speak, the point of sight of the whole Christian calendar, as the Passover is of the Jewish. But to proceed, the lessons from Easter to Whitsunday, taking into account the great days of Easter week and Ascension, are so many specimens of the transgressions of the elect people, and of the methods taken to chastise or reclaim them. The case of Balaam most evidently needs not to be accepted from this account, for never was there a clearer analogy between him and the Jewish people, they murmuring and rebelling with the Shechaniah before their eyes, he coveting the reward of iniquity, perhaps plotting seduction in his heart, while he heard the words of God and saw the vision of the Almighty. No analogy can be more exact except that it be between the same miserable man and a Christian baptised, sinning against faith and knowledge. The lessons for Trinity Sunday, as was natural, interrupt for one week the progress of the history, for the purpose of reviewing the whole course. The mind is carried back first to God's original intent in creating man after his own image, 
next to the appointed condition or mean by which that image is to be regained, viz. the imitation of Abraham's faith. In effect, they rehearse to us both covenants, that of paradise and that of the gospel. Resuming our view of the covenanted people, we contemplate them first victorious, peaceful and comparatively innocent, renewing their engagements with their maker in the days of Joshua, in the days of the judges, backsliding and factious, but not yet deliberately unbelieving. Next, trained by Eli's sons to irreverence for holy things, and so not ill-prepared to apostatize by choosing a king on principles of accommodation and worldly policy. The gradual degeneracy and downfall of that unhappy king the emblem of the Jews of his time, as Balaam had been of a former generation. And the substitution of one of better mind, a continued through a chain of lessons, to the excision, long after his death, of almost all that remained of his family. But in the meantime, a new source of sin and misery had arisen in the family of David himself. His personal sins indeed were fast followed by sincere repentance, and therefore obtained speedy pardon. But because they were the sins of one with whom a peculiar covenant had been made, they drew down the severest temporal judgments. The sword never departed from his house, and by the dissensions which arose in his time, a way was prepared for the schism and twofold apostasy, first heretical and afterwards infidel, of the greater part of the chosen people. These, with God's endeavours to reclaim them by the warnings of Elijah and Elisha, and by the sword of Jehu, are traced in the chapters taken from the books of kings, from the first curse on Jeroboam's schismatical altar, to the final reprobation and captivity of the ten tribes. In the course of which history, a special emphasis is laid, first on the misfortunes incurred by the nameless prophet from Judah, by King Jehoshaphat and others, for their licentious communication with the heretical and idolatrous tribes. Secondly, on the extension of God's favour to the Gentiles, in two instances forever memorable, which extension, we may believe, was virtually a signal warning to his then elect people. At length we arrive at the last sad scene of the history, the downfall of the Church of Judah also. We behold a temporary amendment in the days of Hezekiah, occasioned by the combination of miraculous mercy to herself with judgment on Samaria in her sight. But we presently read of her thorough relapse, of her resistance to the example and efforts of good Josiah, of her sensuality and oppression, her neglect and contempt of warnings, all accompanied with high pretenses to civilization and a certain kind of orthodoxy. All these, her dealings with God, are delineated at large by Jeremiah. In the lessons from Ezekiel, we are revealed more of God's dealings with her. He peremptorily orders his message to be delivered, whether men will hear or whether they will forbear. He denounces the false prophets, preaching peace where there was no peace, and discovers their secret and vulgar artifices. He answers pretenses from feigned conformity, from reliance on the remnants of good in the land, and again from an affected perplexity at the supposed inequality of his proceedings. He recapitulates, by special message, all their past conduct as his chosen people, a summary answering with marvellous exactness to the sad experience of the Christian world. When all these had failed, he utters in two fearful parables a final sentence of direct reprobation. All this we have set before us from Ezekiel. The lessons from Daniel serve to show that the chosen people were not yet abandoned. They keep hope alive and exemplify faith, triumphing in the worst of times, which is also the drift of the prophecy selected from Joel. Then Micah is introduced, like Samuel and Ezekiel, recapitulating the whole course of the probation of the elect. And Habakkuk, extending the judgment to their oppressors and reasserting the condition required on their part to make their election not a curse, but a blessing. The just by his faith shall live. Finally, the readings from the Proverbs of Solomon bring the warning home, so to speak, to every man's own door. 
taken in connection with all that had gone before, they turn God's miraculous proceedings with the Jews into an available sanction of righteousness for the meanest man's use on the slightest occasion. And now the year drawing to a close and the mysterious time of Christmas approaching, our mother, with true parental anxiety, takes up, as it were, the thread of her instructions anew at that point of the fortunes of Israel, to which the circumstances of civilised and Christian Europe, especially those of our own country, during the comparatively few years which have passed since the arrangement of the prayer book, may reasonably be thought to correspond most nearly. The church reverts to the time of Hezekiah, and selects the prophecy of Isaiah as the fittest to prepare the mind for Christ's two advents. By the confession of some, who are most apt to find fault, her selection here has been most appropriate. Witness the sins reproved in the Jews, their formality, pride, oppression, drunkenness, presumption, sophistical self-deceit, their impatience of primitive truth and reliance upon mere worldly expedience. Witness again the wonderful mixture of triumph and desolation, judgments and mercies foretold, such as might seem impossible to be accomplished together at one and the same time, among one and the same people. Yet we seem to behold both accomplished, the one in the tendencies of the gospel, and what it performs for the faithful privately, the other in man's ordinary way of receiving it, and what may be called its public failure. The very denunciations against idolatry, by some perhaps accounted an outward sin, how well do they apply to the various apostasies which men contrive for themselves now, and say to one after another, Deliver me, for thou art my God. The summaries of past national mercies, how truly do they represent what is now done for each redeemed and sanctified soul. And as to the anticipation of mercies and judgment to come, they do not only correspond to the revelations of the New Testament, but we have the express authority of our Lord and St. Paul for believing that, of both, language was purposely used. And the purpose, I mean, of the Holy Spirit, which literally refers to the life and death everlasting, the sanctions of God's covenant with every Christian singly. This hasty and brief sketch may serve to point out the thread of warning, which, it is conceived, runs through the Sunday lessons, and renders it very improper to deal with them as if they had been taken at random, or might fitly be changed at will for others supposed in themselves more edifying. Whether Archbishop Parker and his coadjutors had this connection in view, as it is not, perhaps, possible to ascertain, so neither is it very material. But that they must have had some special rule of selection in their minds is plain, and the fact mentioned above, that they had just before authorised the clergy, provisionally, to read what each thought, prima facie, most edifying. The idea, therefore, according to which it is now wished to new model the lessons, had occurred to them, and the result shows that they did not think it, on the whole, the most instructive way. Perhaps the fact of its spontaneous evolution, if such an expression may be allowed, would make it appear so much the more delicate, and tampering with it so much the more perilous. For on that supposition, it must be more than humanly interwoven with the very staple of the scripture history. But, supposing it designed, it may have been suggested by the tenor of the Invitatory Psalm, commonly called Venite Exultamus, which psalm has been used daily in the church quite down from primitive times. Many persons probably have asked themselves why that psalm in particular should be preferred above the many of the same general tenor for unremitting use in the church daily. The answer, probably, may be found in the grave miniatory warnings at the end, which, by the case of the Jews in the wilderness, describe so forcibly the position and peculiar danger of a chosen people. That one psalm may, on reflection, give the key to the arrangement of the lessons, allowing, of course, for the interruptions sometimes caused by the special matter of some great Christian festival. In general, however, the course of the lessons will be found adapting itself with exquisite felicity to the course of the festivals also. Occasionally, the Archbishop's choice may have been influenced, 
in subordination, however, to the great principle, by the connection of the portion of history with some offence which required a warning. But, from the weakness of human nature, was very likely to pass unnoticed. The 34th of Genesis and the 5th of Jeremiah are instances. When men shrink from reading those chapters, they bear witness instinctively to the wisdom and kindness of the Church in ordering them to be read. Whatever may be one's private opinion, it is not necessary here to maintain that the general principle suggested above was the very best on which selection might proceed, or that the very aptest chapters of all have been selected in each instance. But clearly, if such a principle be at all recognised, it ought to be most carefully kept in view, whatever insertions or omissions are proposed. Many persons seem to think questions of this sort are settled. If on merely comparing the present lesson with the proposed substitute, it appears that the one, taken singly, is more edifying than the other. But this will not hold, if it be a mistake altogether to take any one singly and apart. The quantity of edification may be greater, on the whole, by completing the proposed narrative or argument, though on this or that particular day the impression made may be less. To neglect this consideration partakes of the same error, as if one should reckon all preaching nugatory, which did not expressly place the highest matters of faith in the most affecting point of view. If Christianity be a great system, such a test of preaching must be incorrect, and if the Sunday lessons be a series, it will never do to censure any one chapter as unedifying except you can produce one more edifying, which will come in equally well at the same point of the series. I will take the example which appears to myself the most doubt in the whole calendar. At first sight, almost anyone would say that Second Samuel chapter 21 might with great advantage be changed for First Kings chapter 3 or chapter 8, the dream of Solomon or the dedication of the temple. Not so, perhaps, when we come to recollect that the melancholy tale of the ruin of Saul's family is completed in the first mentioned chapter, and with it the denunciation of such perverse conduct as drew down the curse upon him. The other chapters, however instructive in themselves, can hardly with so much propriety be said to make part of the system of warning. And surely those who, in whole or in part, are for disturbing that system should look to it that they be well provided with somewhat, on the whole, more edifying in its room. Else they may go far towards depriving the church of a great help to practical knowledge and to the true use of the Old Testament. Inadequate views of that portion of God's word have ever been found fruitful in heresy, filling men's hearts with perplexity and irreverence. Can it be denied that our own times show fearful symptoms in that quarter? There is room for not a little anxiety, surely, lest a clue to many scripture difficulties, so necessary to the people's welfare, and, may we not say, so providentially put into the pastor's hands, should be let drop, because some of us do not always clearly see which way it is leading them. It may be said the alterations proposed would not amount to a disturbance of the general system, this the writer begs leave to doubt, since it is conceived a very moderate alteration, which shall include all the following particulars. Some, at least three, I suppose, of the proper lessons for the Sundays in Lent, five chapters in Deuteronomy, two in Jeremiah, four in Ezekiel, and the principles on which these are made specimens of omitenda would as well justify the omission of at least twenty more. Either, therefore, the rule of selection adopted by Archbishop Parker must be renounced, or other chapters must be found, completing his idea as accurately as these do, which latter, it is imagined, would prove a difficult task. 2. The other matter proposed for inquiry is less important, and may be dismissed in a few words. Why, it is asked, should there not be lessons from the New Testament proper for every Sunday in the year, as well as for a few great days? An answer to which it may be observed, first, that there are generally two such lessons, always one, 
read in the communion service. Only that which is called the second lesson varies with the day of the month. Of the reasons which, in point of fact, led to the continuance of this latter arrangement, I am not aware that any record remains, but appears to be accompanied with two incidental advantages, which some may think considerable enough to render alteration unadvisable, without very clear proof of greater benefit likely to arise from it. One of these advantages is the standing memorial thus afforded to the people, that there once was such a thing as a daily service, that such is the system and wish of our church, and the theory on which the prayer book is constructed. It is an intelligible hint that a churchman's devotion was not meant to be all narrowed into the Sunday. The services of that holy day were but to be a continuance and an expansion of those due on the other days, not a totally distinct thing. This we are weakly reminded of by the very place in the calendar where we must look for the second Sunday lesson. The value of the hint, people of course will estimate more or less highly, according to their sense of the importance of a daily service, and of the responsibility which churchmen have incurred by letting it drop so very quietly in almost every parish of the kingdom. The other advantage of these varying second lessons, and it will be found in practice a very considerable one, is this, that it presents the old and new scriptures in an endless variety of mutual combinations, the more striking because they are unforeseen, and in a certain sense casual. The thought is happily expressed by Herbert, thus addressing Holy Scripture. Oh, that I knew how all thy lights combine, and the configurations of their glory, seeing not how each verse doth shine, but all the constellations of the story. Very much help both for pastors and people, both for giving and receiving instruction may be gathered, if the writer deceive himself not concerning the results of his own experience, by attending to this hint yearly, as the varying psalms and second lessons come successively into conjunction with the unvarying first lessons, epistles and gospels. To note and collect the scattered lights will be found in itself a most engaging and interesting task and it will serve in no slight degree to impress considerate minds from time to time more deeply with the fullness, the harmony, the condescension of the word of life. These reasons are respectfully addressed to those who, in their anxiety for immediate visible edification, appear somehow to overlook the fact that the church lessons are a series, arranged according to certain general principles. Scruples and feelings of different kinds occurring to this or that person as to the use of particular passages, must be met, of course, on their own grounds, except so far as they ought to be silenced by the overpowering advantage, which may appear to arise by adhering to the general principle of selection. At any rate, it is much to be wished that very free-taking and very cheap publishing, in behalf of such changes, were carefully avoided. Is there not something even cruel, in raising scruples and niceties and unpleasant associations of various kinds, among those who, as yet happily, have never dreamt of criticising the Bible? If change is wanted, let proper reasons be quietly submitted to competent authorities. But let us not appeal lightly and at random to the sense of an irreverent, presumptuous age on one of the most sacred of all subjects. End of Tract 13《Tract 14 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. The Ember Days by Alfred Menzies. In reading the Epistles of St. Paul, we cannot but observe how earnestly he presses upon those to whom he was writing the duty of praying for a blessing on himself and on his ministry. We not only find his request contained in general terms, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 25, Brethren, pray for us. But when he feels he stands in need of any particular support, he mentions it as an especial subject of prayer for the churches. For instance, in writing to the Romans, at a time when he was looking forward to trouble from Jewish unbelievers, he says to them, chapter 15, verse 30, Strive together with me in your prayers to God for me 
that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. And in Philippians chapter 1 verse 19, he expresses a confidence that the very opposition he was meeting with would, through the intercession of the saints, be turned into a good to himself. I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. It is the same when he has any object at heart which he desires to see accomplished. He longs much for the spread of the gospel, and therefore, in Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of God may have free course and be glorified. And feeling his own weakness to discharge the sacred trust committed to him, he asks the Ephesians, in chapter 6, verses 15 and 19, to make supplication in his behalf that utterance might be given unto him, that he might open his mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. I shall mention but one passage more, that in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. For here, not only the duty of praying for their apostle is pressed upon the people, but they are bidden to do so for the express purpose that they might also join in expressing thanks that their prayer had been graciously heard. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed on us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. Compare Colossians chapter 2 verse 4, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 19, Philemon verse 22. These texts show clearly that it is the Christian's duty to pray at all times for the ministers of the gospel. There are other texts which teach that supplication ought particularly to be made for them at the time of their ordination. We find that, when our Lord was about to send forth his twelve apostles to preach his kingdom, he went out into a mountain to pray, and continued all night in prayer to God. Luke chapter 6 verse 12. And when one of those apostles had by transgression fallen from his ministry, the whole church united in supplication to God, that he would show whom he had chosen to succeed him. Acts chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. The same is observable in the ordination of the first deacons, where it is said, Acts chapter 6, verse 6, the multitude set them before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Again, when Paul and Barnabas are sent forth on their special mission, the church fasted and prayed for them. Acts chapter 13, verse 3. And St. Paul, in turn, observed the same practice when he ordained elders in the churches where he had preached. They prayed with fasting and commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Acts chapter 14, verse 23. In conformity to this apostolical custom, the Church of England views with peculiar solemnity the times at which her ministers are ordained and invites all her members to join at these sacred seasons in prayer and fasting in their behalf. It is the object of these pages to bring this subject especially before the reader's notice. For the observance of this ordinance of the church has fallen so generally into disuse that few comparatively feel the value of it, and some perhaps are not even aware of its existence. To those who may be in this case, I would say briefly that the ordination Sundays occur four times a year, and that the days of fasting, or ember days as they are called, are in the week immediately before those respective Sundays. These days are as follows, the Wednesday, Friday and Saturday before the first Sunday in Lent, after the Feast of Pentecost, after September the 14th, after December the 13th, as may be seen by referring to the prayer book. And particular prayers are ordered during the whole of the weeks in which these days occur, that the bishops may make a wise and faithful choice and that those who are to be called to the ministry may especially be blessed with God's grace and heavenly benediction. That such a practice is good and right in itself, and could not fail to produce a huge benefit, cannot be doubted by those who believe that prayer is the appointed channel whereby God is pleased to send mercies on mankind. He that feels the truth of ask and it shall be given you cannot deny that he is losing a great privilege whenever he neglects this duty. And if there is any order of men who more especially need the help of other supplications, it is that of those who are called to the high office of ministering the word of life to their fellow creatures, and of being labourers together with their divine master in bringing men to salvation. I would go further than this, and say 
that if there is any time when the ministers of the gospel more particularly call for the prayers of the church, it is at these seasons of ordination. Whether we consider the solemn office which the bishops are performing, or the solemn vows which the priests and deacons are taking on themselves, we must allow that it is an occasion of the greatest importance. Here are a number of men going forth for the great work of winning back to Christ souls which have gone astray from the right path, and of fighting in the first ranks against the world, the flesh, and the devil, and in most cases going forth young and inexperienced in their work, not knowing, for who can know until he has tried, the dangers and difficulties which beset them? Surely it is the duty of every Christian to give them what help he can, and send them forth strengthened for the labours of their journey. I doubt not that there are many in this kingdom who are in the habit of making supplication to God for their ministers, many who join heartily in the several prayers of the church services where mention is made of them, as well as remember them in their private devotions. And some of these may ask, of what advantage is it to appoint particular days for such intercession? They may say, we pray daily for the clergy, and not unfrequently for those who are just entering their ministerial life. Why should one day be fixed upon as better than another for this purpose? Let each do as he finds opportunity. I would answer first, that if it was the custom of the apostles to set apart the times of ordination for a special prayer, as well as the regulation of our own church, it is no longer a matter of indifference to us whether we adopt this method or not. The example of the one and the injunction of the other mark plainly for us what we ought to do. But secondly, there will be advantages to ourselves in taking the course so recommended. I would mention one or two which appear to be of importance. One, when men have been at all careless and indifferent about any duty, and how few are there who can say that they have not been careless in this matter, it is very useful to have some settled way for beginning it aright. What has long been put off from time to time is seldom properly attended to, if we leave the performance of it to any chance opportunity that may be offered. The convenient season will seldom come, or at least will not come to us in so profitable a way. For setting apart a particular occasion for solemn prayer brings with it more seriousness and attention, and makes us think far more of the value of the blessing for which we ask. 2. And secondly, I would remind all those who value the promises of the Bible that there is an especial blessing promised to united prayer. Our Lord says, Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. And when a good is sought for all, all ought to be seeking for it, and striving together that it may be obtained. Now this could not be done, except days were appointed, which all may know of as a standing ordinance, and to be able to join together in spirit however far apart they are in body. We might thus, not only in all parts of this kingdom, but in distant lands, wherever our brethren are residing, unite in sending up supplications which our common father would not fail to hear and answer abundantly. And when engaged in prayer, we should have the great comfort and support of knowing that we are not single, but that others are perhaps mentioning what we are leaving out, and that others have more earnestness and devotion than we feel in ourselves. Should this paper fall into the hands of any who have never before heard or thought seriously of this institution, it may be useful to offer a few hints for its better observance. Let each consecrate the days as much as possible to prayer and holy meditation, adding to them religious fasting, if health permit. The true end of fasting is beautifully expressed in the collect for the first Sunday in Lent. Using such abstinence, that our flesh being subdued to the Spirit, we may ever obey our Lord's godly motions in righteousness and true holiness. It is to give the mind liberty and ability to consider and reflect while it is actually engaged in divine service, or preparing for some solemn part of it, to humble ourselves before God under a sense of our sins and the misery to which they expose us, to deprecate his anger and to supplicate his mercy and favour. 
we must use it in the same spirit in which Daniel did, when he set himself to pray for pardon for his own and his brethren's sins, and sought the Lord God with prayer and supplication and fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Daniel chapter 9 verse 3. The subjects for prayer on the ember days will be the Church of God of which we are members, especially those who are called to bear office in the same, and of these more particularly those who are either ordaining or being ordained. But our petitions need not stop with these. These are seasons in which every minister should be remembered before the throne of grace, in which every bishop, priest and deacon claim the prayers of the people. We may ask for them that their doctrine may be sound and pure, and may come to the hearts of their hearers, that they may diligently labour in their several spheres of action for the glory of God and the good of mankind, above all that they may themselves lead holy lives, such as are consistent with their high profession. And because we are so much more earnest in prayer when we are asking for particular things, and those which we feel to need ourselves, we may make a special mention of our own clergyman and our own bishop, praying that the light which shines on them may be reflected on our own neighbourhood. For the same reason, if we happen to know of any trouble or trial to which the sacred ministry near us is exposed, we may mention this also. Additional subjects of meditation will arise according to the particular ember days which we are celebrating. In those in Lent, we shall have more particularly before us our Lord's example of prayer and fasting, and ask for his ministers that they may be like him in retiring from the world and overcoming worldly snares and temptations. In those in Whitson week, we shall remember our Saviour's words, that his disciples would fast when he was taken from them, think much of the Holy Spirit which is vouchsafed to them to supply his absence, and implore God that on us in our day this precious blessing may be given abundantly. And again, in those in Advent, we shall reflect on the near approach of the anniversary of our Lord's birth, reflect on his forerunner, the self-denying Baptist, who was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb, and pray that the ministers and stewards of his mysteries may, like him, prepare the way for Christ's second coming. The times in which we live will furnish additional ground for supplication. We cannot but see that there is a great struggle going on between good and evil, and that, while we trust true religion is increasing, it cannot be denied that infidelity and opposition to lawful authority, whether of God or man, is increasing likewise. And especially as regards our own church, we cannot shut our eyes to the fact that she has many and powerful enemies, both visible and invisible and that wicked spirits and wicked men are seeking to undermine and overthrow her. The thought of these evils on all sides will naturally lead us to him, who alone can protect us from them. These remarks are written in the hope that those who read them will ask themselves honestly whether they have not been guilty of neglecting the proper observance of the ember days, and whether the revival of the primitive custom of keeping them might not be attended with a great national blessing whether it might not be a means under God of averting the dangers which surround us. Many are now lamenting that we have in some respects lost sight of that godly discipline which the Church orders for the good of her members. But ought we not to seek a restoration of what is lost as well as lament for it, and seriously set ourselves to the most effectual way of gaining what we need? And again, many are crying out against the faults of the Church, but have any a right to do so till they themselves have tried every means in their power of amending what they feel to be an evil? And can we say that we have tried every means, as long as an institution like that of which I have been speaking, so edifying and so likely to gain a blessing, is so generally neglected? End of Tract 14《ทรัพย์15》《ทรัพย์ for the Times》Volume 1 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle On the Apostolical Succession in the English Church by William Palmer When churchmen in England maintain the apostolical commission of their ministers, they are sometimes met with the objection that they cannot prove it without tracing their orders back to the Church of Rome, a position indeed which in a certain sense is true. 
and hence it is argued that they are reduced to the dilemma either of acknowledging they had no right to separate from the Pope, or on the other hand of giving up the ministerial succession altogether and resting the claims of their pastors on some other ground. In other words, they are inconsistent in reprobating popery while they draw a line between their ministers and those of the dissenting communions. It is intended, in the pages that follow, to reply to the supposed difficulty. But first, a few words should be said, by way of preface, on the doctrine itself which we churchmen advocate. The Christian church is a body consisting of clergy and laity. This is generally agreed upon, and may here be assumed. Now, what we say is that these two classes are distinguished from each other and united to each other by the commandment of God himself, that the clergy have a commission from God Almighty through regular succession from the apostles to preach the gospel, administer the sacraments, and guide the church. And again, that in consequence, the people are bound to hear them with attention, receive the sacraments from their hands, and pay them all dutiful obedience. I shall not prove this at length, for it has been done by others. And indeed, the common sense and understanding of men, if left to themselves, will be quite sufficient in this case. I do but lay before the reader the following considerations. 1. We hold with the Church in all ages that when our Lord, after his resurrection, breathed on the apostles and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, as my Father hath sent me, so I send you. He gave them the power of sending others with a divine commission, who in like manner should have the power of sending others, and so on, even unto the end. And that our Lord promised his continual assistance to these successors of the apostles in this and all other respects, when he said, Lo, I am with you, that is, with you and those who shall represent and succeed you, always, even unto the end of the world. And if it is plain that the apostles left successors after them, it is equally plain that the bishops are these successors. For it is only the bishops who have ever been called by the title of successors. And there has actually been a perpetual succession of these bishops in the church, who alone were always esteemed to have the power of sending other ministers to preach and administer the sacraments. So that the proof of the doctrine seems to lie in a very small space. 2. But perhaps it may be as well to look at it in another point of view. I suppose no man of common sense thinks himself entitled to set about teaching religion, administering baptism and the Lord's Supper, and taking care of the souls of other people, unless he has, in some way, been called to undertake the office. Now, as religion is a business between every man's own conscience and God Almighty, no one can have any right to interfere in the religious concerns of another with the authority of a teacher, unless he is able to show that God has in some way called and sent him to do so. It is true that men may as friends encourage and instruct each other with consent of both parties, but this is something very different from the office of a minister of religion, who is entitled and called to exhort, rebuke and rule with all authority, as well as love and humility. You may observe that our Lord himself did not teach the gospel without proving most plainly that his Father had sent him. He and his apostles proved their divine commission by miracles. As miracles, however, have long ago come to an end, there must be some other way for a man to prove his right to be a minister of religion. And what other way can there possibly be except a regular call and ordination by those who have succeeded to the apostles. 3. Further, you will observe that all sects think it necessary that their ministers should be ordained by other ministers. Now, if this be the case, then the validity of ordination even with them rests on a succession. And is it not plain that they ought to trace that succession to the apostles? Else, why are they ordained at all? And anyhow, if their ministers have a commission who derive it from private men, much more do the ministers of our church who actually do derive it from the apostles. Surely those who dissent from the church have invented an ordinance, 
as they themselves must allow, whereas churchmen, whether rightly or wrongly, still maintained their succession not to be an invention but to be God's ordinance. If dissenters say that order requires that there should be some such succession, this is true indeed, but still it is only a testimony to the mercy of Christ in having, as churchmen maintained, given us such a succession. And this is all it shows. It does nothing for them, for their succession, not professing to come from God, has no power to restrain any fanatic from setting up to preach of his own will, and a people with itching ears choosing for themselves a teacher. It does but witness to a need, without supplying it. 4. I have now given some slight suggestions by way of evidence for the doctrine of the apostolical succession from Scripture, the nature of the case, and the conduct of dissenters. Let me add a word on the usage of the primitive church. We know that the succession of bishops and ordination from them was the invariable doctrine and rule of the early Christians. Is it not utterly inconceivable that this rule should have prevailed from the first age, everywhere and without exception, had it not been given them by the apostles? But here we are met by the objection on which I propose to make a few remarks, that, though it is true there was a continual succession of pastors and teachers in the early church who had a divine commission, yet that no Protestants can have it, that we gave it up when our communion ceased with Rome, in which church it still remains, or at least that no Protestant can plead it without condemning the Reformation itself, for that our own predecessors then revolted and separated from those spiritual pastors, who, according to our principles, then had the commission of Jesus Christ. Our reply to this is a flat denial of the alleged facts on which it rests. The English church did not revolt from those who in that day had authority by succession from the apostles. On the contrary, it is certain that the bishops and clergy in England and Ireland remained the same as before the separation, and that it was these, with the aid of the civil power, who delivered the church of those kingdoms from the yoke of papal tyranny and usurpation, while at the same time they gradually removed from the minds of the people various superstitious opinions and practices which had grown up during the Middle Ages, and which, though never formally received by the judgment of the whole church, were yet very prevalent. I do not say the case might never arise, when it became the duty of private individuals to take upon themselves the office of protesting against and abjuring the heresies of a corrupt church. But such an extreme case it is unpleasant and unhealthy to contemplate. All I say here is that it was not the state of things at the time of the Reformation. The church then, by its proper rulers and officers, reformed itself. There was no new church founded among us, but the rights and the true doctrines of the ancient existing church were asserted and established. In proof of this, we need only look to the history of the times. In the year 1534, the bishops and clergy of England assembled in their respective convocations of Canterbury and York, and signed a declaration that the Pope or Bishop of Rome had no more jurisdiction in this country by the word of God than any other foreign bishop. They also agreed to those acts of the civil government which put an end to it among us. The people of England then, in casting off the Pope, but obeyed and concurred in the acts of their own spiritual superiors, and committed no schism. Queen Mary, it is true, drove out after many years the Orthodox bishops, and reduced our church again under the Bishop of Rome. But this submission was only exacted by force, and in itself null and void. And moreover, in matter of fact, it lasted but a little while, for on the succession of Queen Elizabeth, the true successors of the apostles in the English church were reinstated in their ancient rites. So I repeat, there was no revolt in any part of these transactions against those who had a commission from God, for it was the bishops and clergy themselves who maintained the just rights of their church. But it seems, the Pope has ever said, that our bishops were bound by the laws of God and the Church to obey him, that they were subject to him, and that they had no right to separate from him and were guilty in doing so, and that accordingly they have involved the people of England in their guilt, 
and at all events, that they cannot complain of their flock disobeying deserting them when they have revolted from the Pope. Let us consider this point. Now that there is not a word in Scripture about our duty to obey the Pope is quite clear. The Papists, indeed, say that he is the successor of St. Peter, and that therefore he is head of all bishops, because St. Peter bore rule over the other apostles. But though the Bishop of Rome was often called the successor of St. Peter in the early church, yet every other bishop had the same title. And although it be true that St. Peter was the foremost of the apostles, that does not prove he had any dominion over them. The eldest brother in the family has certain privileges and a precedence, but he has no power over the younger branches of it. And so Rome has ever had what it called the primacy of the Christian churches. But it has not, therefore, any right to interfere in their internal administration. Not more of a right than an elder brother has to meddle with his younger brother's household. And this is plainly the state of matters between us and Rome, and the judgment of the ancient church also, to which the papists are fond of appealing, and by which we are quite ready to stand or fall. In early times, as is well known, all Christians thought substantially alike, and formed one great body all over the world, called the Church Catholic, or Universal. This great body, consisting of a vast number of separate churches, with each of them its own bishop at its head, was divided into a number of portions called patriarchates, and these again into others called provinces, and these were made up of the separate dioceses or bishoprics. We have among ourselves an instance of this last division of the provinces of Canterbury and York, which constitute the English church, each of them consisting of a number of distinct bishoprics or churches. The head of a province was called archbishop, as in the case of Canterbury and York. The bishops of these two sees being, we know, not only bishops with dioceses of their own, but having, over and above this, the place of precedence among the bishops in the same province. In like manner, the bishop at the head of a patriarchate was called the patriarch, and had the place of honour and certain privileges over all other bishops within his own patriarchate. Now, in the early Christian church, there were four or five patriarchates, e.g. one in the east, the head of which was the bishop of Antioch, one in Egypt, the head of which was the bishop of Alexandria, and again one in the west, the head of which was the bishop of Rome. These patriarchs, I say, were the primates, or head bishops of their respective patriarchates, and they had an order of precedence among themselves, Rome being the first of them all. Thus the bishop of Rome, being the first of the patriarchs in dignity, might be called the honorary primate of all Christendom. However, as time went on, the bishop of Rome, not satisfied with the honours which were readily conceded to him, attempted to gain power over the whole church. He seems to have been allowed the privilege of arbitrating in cases of appeal from other patriarchates. If, e.g. Alexandria and Antioch had a dispute, he was a proper referee. Or if the bishops of those churches were at any time unjustly deprived of their sees, he was a fit person to interfere and defend them. But, I say, he became ambitious and attempted to lord it over God's heritage. He interfered in the internal management of other patriarchates. He appointed bishops to sees and clergy to parishes which were contained within them, and imposed on them various religious and ecclesiastical usages illegally. And doing so, surely he became a remarkable contrast to the holy apostle, who, though inspired, and an universal bishop, yet suffered not himself to control the proceedings even of the churches he founded. Saying to the Corinthians, Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 24 This impressive declaration, which seems to be intended almost as a prophetic warning against the times of which we speak, was neglected by the Pope, who among other tyrannical proceedings, took upon him the control of the churches in Britain, and forbade us to reform our doctrine and usages, which he had no right at all to do. He had no right to do so, because we were altogether independent of him. 
the English and Irish churches, though in the West, being exterior to his patriarchate. Here again, however, some explanation is necessary. You must know, then, that from the first there were portions of the Christian world which were not included in any patriarchate, but were governed by themselves. Such were the churches of Cyprus, and such were the British churches. This need not here be proved. It is confessed by papists themselves. Now it so happened, in the beginning of the 5th century, the Patriarch of Antioch, who was in the neighbourhood of Cyprus, attempted against the Cyprian churches what the Pope has since attempted against us, viz. took measures to reduce them under his dominion. And, as a sign of his authority over them, he claimed to consecrate their bishops. Upon which the great council of the whole Christian world assembled at Ephesus, AD 431, made the following decree which you will find is a defence of England and Ireland against the papacy, as well as of Cyprus against Antioch. An innovation upon the rule of the Church and the canons of the Holy Fathers, such as to affect the general liberties of Christendom, has been reported to us by our venerable brother Reginus, and his fellow bishops of Cyprus, Zeno and Evagrius. Wherefore, since public disorders call for extraordinary remedies, as being more perilous, and whereas it is against ancient usage that the Bishop of Antioch should ordain in Cyprus, as has been proved to us in this council both in words and writing by most orthodox men, we therefore decree that the prelates of the Cyprian churches shall be suffered without let or hindrance to consecrate bishops by themselves. And moreover, that same rule shall be observed also in other dioceses and provinces everywhere, so that no bishop shall interfere in another province which has not from the very first been under himself and his predecessors. And further, that if any one has so encroached and tyrannised, he must relinquish his claim, that the canons of the fathers be not infringed, nor the priesthood be made an occasion and pretense for the pride of worldly power, nor the least portion of that freedom unawares be lost to us, which our Lord Jesus Christ, who bought the world's freedom, vouchsafed to us when he shed his own blood. Wherefore, it has seemed good to this holy ecumenical council that the rights of every province should be preserved pure and inviolate, which have always belonged to it, according to the usage which has ever obtained, each metropolitan having full liberty to take a copy of the acts for his own security. And should any rule be adduced repugnant to this decree, it is hereby repealed. Here we have a remarkable parallel to the dispute between Rome and us, and we see what was the decision of the general church upon it. It will be observed the decree is passed for all provinces in all future times, as well as for the immediate exigency. Now this is a plain refutation of the Romanists on their own principles. They profess to hold the canons of the primitive church, the very line they take is to declare the church to be one and the same in all ages. Here, then, they witness against themselves. The Pope has encroached on the rights of other churches and violated the canon above cited. Herein is the difference between his relation to us and that of any civil ruler whose power was in its origin illegally acquired. Doubtless we are bound to obey the monarch under whom we are born, even though his ancestor were an usurper. Time legitimizes a conquest. But this is not the case in spiritual matters. The Church goes by fixed laws, and this usurpation has all along been counter to one of her acknowledged standing ordinances, founded on reasons of universal application. After the canon above cited, it is almost superfluous to refer to the celebrated rule of the First Nicene Council, AD 325, which, in defending the rights of the patriarchates, expresses the same principle in all its simple force and majesty. Let the ancient usages prevail, which are received in Egypt, Libya, and Pentapolis, relative to the authority of the Bishop of Alexandria, as they are observed in the case of the Bishop of Rome, and so in Antioch too, and other provinces. Let the prerogatives of the churches be preserved." On this head of the subject, I will but notice that as the Council of Ephesus controlled the ambition of Antioch, so in like manner did St. Austin rebuke Rome itself for an encroachment of another kind of the liberties of the African Church. 
Bingham says, When Pope Zosimus and Celestine took upon them to receive appellants from the African churches and absolve those whom they had condemned, St. Austin and all the African churches sharply remonstrated against this as an irregular practice, violating the laws of unity and the settled rules of ecclesiastical commerce, which required that no delinquent excommunicated in one church should be absolved in another, without giving satisfaction to his own church that censured him. And therefore, to put a stop to this practice, and check the exorbitant power which Roman bishops assumed to themselves, they first made a law in the Council of Milevis, that no African clerk should appeal to any church beyond sea, under pain of being excluded from communion in all the African churches. And then afterwards, meeting in a general synod, they dispatched letters to the Bishop of Rome to remind him how contrary this practice was to the canons of Nice, which ordered that all controversy should be ended in the places where they arose, before a council and the metropolitan. Thus I have shown that our bishops, at the time of the Reformation, did but vindicate their ancient rights, were but loyal, grateful, and therefore jealous champions of the honour of the old fathers and the sanctity of their institutions, were but acting in the magnanimous spirit of that apostle who bade us stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. For true magnanimity consists in neither encroaching nor submitting to encroachment, in taking our rights as we find them and using them, or rather in regarding them altogether as trusts, the responsibility of which we cannot avoid. As the same apostle says, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he is called. And if England and Ireland had a right to assert their freedom under any circumstances, much more so in the corruptions imposed on them by Rome even made it a duty to do so. I shall answer briefly one or two objections, and so bring these remarks to an end. First, it may be said that Rome has withdrawn our orders and excommunicated us. Therefore, we cannot plead any longer our apostolical descent. Now, I will not altogether deny that a ministerial body may become so plainly apostate as to lose its privilege of ordination. But however this may be, it is a little too hard to assume, as such an objection does, the very point in dispute. When we are proved to be heretical in doctrine, then will be the time to begin to consider whether our heresy is of so grievous a character as to invalidate our orders. But till then, we may fairly and fearlessly maintain that our bishops are still invested with the power of ordination. 2. But it may be said, on the other hand, that if we do not admit ourselves to be heretic, we necessarily must accuse the Romanists of being such, and that therefore, on our own ground, we have really no valid orders, as having received them from an heretical church. True, Rome is heretical now, but she was not an heretical church in the primitive ages. She has apostatized, but it was at the time of the Council of Trent. Then it was that the whole Roman communion bound itself by a perpetual bond and covenant to the cause of Antichrist. But before that time, grievous as were the corruptions in the church, no individual bishop, priest, or deacon was bound by oath to the maintenance of them. Extensively as they were spread, no clergyman was shackled with obligations which prevented his resisting them. He could but suffer persecution for doing so. He did not commit himself in one breath to two vows, to serve faithfully in the ministry, and yet to receive all the superstitions and impieties which human perverseness had introduced into the most gracious and holy list of God's gifts. On the contrary, we may say with the learned Dr. Field that none of those points of false doctrine and error which Romanists now maintain and we condemn were the doctrines of the Church before the Reformation constantly delivered or generally received by all them that were of it, but doubtfully broached and devised without all certain resolution, or factiously defended by some certain only, who, as a dangerous faction, adulterated the sincerity of Christian verity and brought the church into miserable bondage. Accordingly, acknowledging and deploring all the errors of the Dark Ages, yet we need not fear to maintain that, after all, there were but the errors of individuals, though of large numbers of Christians, 
and we may safely maintain that they no more interfere with the validity of the ordination received by our bishops from those who lived before the Reformation than errors of faith in conduct and a priest interfere with the grace of the sacraments received at his hands. 3. It may be said that we throw blame on Luther and some of the foreign reformers who did act without the authority of their bishops. But we reply that it has always been agreeable to the principles of the church that, if a bishop taught and upheld what was contrary to the orthodox faith, the clergy and people were not bound to submit, but were obliged to maintain the true religion. And if excommunicated by such bishops, they were never accounted to be cut off from the church. Luther and his associates upheld the true doctrine of the church. And though it is not necessary to defend every act of fallible men like them, yet we are fully justified in maintaining that their conduct generally in defending the truth against the Romish party, even in opposition to their spiritual rulers, was worthy of great praise. At the same time, it is impossible not to lament that they did not take the first opportunity to place themselves under orthodox bishops of the apostolical succession. Nothing, as far as we can judge, was more likely to have preserved them from that great decline of religion which has taken place on the continent. End of Tract 15 Tract 16 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle Advent by Benjamin Harrison The name Advent, which means coming, is given to the four Sundays immediately before Christmas Day the feast which celebrates our Lord's coming in the flesh to suffer for us. The season, then, is set apart by the Church, in accordance with ancient and venerable usage, in the first place to prepare the minds of her children, by holy meditation, for welcoming with more devout and heartfelt joy that great day, the day of Christ's Nativity. But her services at this solemn time are also directed to another object, very closely connected with the former, viz., to lead our thoughts onward to that second coming of our Lord and Master, in his glorious majesty to judge the quick and the dead, which the Church is still expecting and anxiously looking for. These two subjects are very closely blended in the services of the season, as indeed there is much naturally to unite them in our thoughts and feelings. For the promise of Christ's second coming is to us what the hope of his first coming was to the Jews, and therefore, while we go back in our thoughts to the time when Christ appeared in the flesh, and to the state of the Jewish church at that time, we must apply all to the searching out of our own spirits, whether we are like holy Simeon and Anna, and the faithful few who waited for redemption in Jerusalem, or rather like the great mass of the people, who thought only of worldly and temporal things, and so rejected their king when he appeared among them. Let us here examine what help the Church will give us in comparing our own privileges and condition with those of God's ancient people. The collects for the Sundays in Advent, those at least for the first three Sundays, are very much formed upon the language of the Epistles, with more or less reference to the Gospels. It will be right then to look first at the Epistles, and from then try to learn how, as members of the Christian Church, we are to prepare for the second awful coming of our Lord and Master. 1. We are awakened then in the services of the first Sunday by the warning voice of an apostle that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, that the night is far spent, the day is at hand, that we must therefore, without delay, cast off the works of darkness and put on the armour of light. Just so the Jewish church was awakened by the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. The message of John the Baptist was the same as the apostles to us. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was to turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. He was to be the Elias, who was to restore all things. And accordingly the prophecy in which his mission was foretold, after vehement rebukes and warnings to the Jewish people, concluded with a solemn exhortation to them to remember the law of God's servant Moses, which he commanded in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and the judgments. Malachi chapter 4 
In like manner, St. Paul urges upon us the solemn law which is given to the Christian Church, the new commandment, by which we shall all be tried, when the messenger of the covenant comes again to his temple. The apostle has been giving many precepts of Christian practice, chapters 12 and 13, but it seems as if he heard his master's voice, Behold, I come quickly. And so the more anxiously sounded in our ear the simple commandment which he left us, to love one another. He that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time, the day is at hand. Let us therefore walk honestly as in the day, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, having seen and felt what Christ will seek for when he comes into his temple, we may profit duly by the awful lesson which we learn in the gospel. The Jews had long been looking impatiently for the promised deliverer. Malachi chapter 2 verse 17, chapter 3 verse 1. And when they saw him riding into Jerusalem as the prophet had foretold, they cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Meanwhile, what were the thoughts of the meek and lowly king? His forerunner had been despised. The law of Moses had not been remembered. The hearts of the fathers were not turned to the children, nor the hearts of the children to the fathers. And he was now coming to smite with a curse. Malachi chapter 4 verse 6. And when he came near, he beheld the city and wept over it. He went into the temple and cast out the buyers and the sellers and the money changers as a type and signal of that still more fearful clearing of his temple when he laid Jerusalem even with the ground and her children within her and gave the privileges of his chosen to the Gentile world. Such fearful vengeance was taken of those who refused him that spake on earth. How then shall we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? We who have received the kingdom which cannot be moved, who are come not to Horeb, but unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Surely it becomes us to listen to the affectionate warnings of the church as she awakens us from our slumber and recounts our high duties and our inestimable privileges. 2. In the services of the second Sunday, we have the first great privilege of the church brought before us, viz. that in the church we have preserved to us those holy scriptures in which is set before us the blessed hope of everlasting life. The promises made to the fathers have now been fulfilled, and as they, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, had hope of Christ's first coming, and through him of life and immortality, so we, having the same sure word of prophecy, may look onward to the day of the church's final redemption, and anticipating that coming of Christ's kingdom for which we daily pray, and that life everlasting in which we daily profess our belief, may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Meanwhile, the influence which Holy Scripture is intended to have upon the Christian church is strikingly put before us in the context of the epistle. St. Paul has been enforcing the duty of mutual forbearance by the argument of Christ's example. For even Christ pleased not himself. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one towards another, according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us, to the glory of God. The faith of the Holy Catholic Church, grounded upon God's holy word, is the bond of unity, a link which so binds together the congregation of the faithful everywhere, that there is but one body and one spirit. And in that Christian temple, the worshippers, so speak, as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. The holy, holy, holy Lord God of Sabaoth, that the house is filled with a cloud, the special presence of the great author of peace and lover of concord, 
the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our only Saviour, the Prince of Peace. And when we recollect the deep and earnest tones of Christ's last solemn prayer before he suffered, that the Church might be one in itself, and in him through the faith which he had given it, and when again we remember that the sentence of his judgment seat, when he shall come the second time in his glory, will be grounded on the relation between himself as head of the Church and his brethren as its members, a relation so close that what has been done unto them he considers as done unto him, and what has been denied to them as denied to him. St. Matthew chapter 25 We shall surely return with a feeling of deeper humiliation to the Church's Advent prayer, that we may have grace to cast off the works of darkness and to put on the armour of light, that so, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge the quick and the dead, those holy scriptures which were given to his church for our learning may not rise up in judgment against us for our neglect of that new and great commandment, the observance of which was to be the distinctive characteristic of his disciples. 3. But fresh privileges and responsibilities are brought before us in the services of the third Sunday in Advent. For we have in the Church not merely holy scriptures written for our learning, but ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God, sent to prepare and make ready the way for his second coming, that we may then be found an acceptable people in his sight. We might have been left to derive from Scripture by our own unaided efforts its rich and glorious contents for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and righteousness. But our merciful Father has dealt otherwise with his Church under each dispensation. For the Baptist, who heralded Christ at his coming, though more than a prophet, was but the successor of a goodly company, whom God had raised up from time to time to vindicate the law and to foreshow the gospel. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. The prophet of the ancient church had for his main office to enforce the law, to show God's people their transgression and their sin. If he spoke of the gospel, it was in prospect only, and seen afar off. The messages sent to us are a ministry of reconciliation, ministers and stewards of the mysteries of redemption, with power and commandment as ambassadors of Christ, to declare and pronounce to God's people, being penitent, the blessed tidings of forgiveness, and in the preaching of his word and the distribution of his sacraments, to convey and apply its benefits to each individual member of Christ's body. And does not this great blessing entail upon us a heavy responsibility? Let us learn from the Church how such a gift should be received. She instructs us in the words of St. Paul's admonition to the proud and schismatical Church of Corinth. The Apostle bids them look upon himself and his fellow labourers as ministers of Christ, responsible to their own Master, and to be judged by him alone as men who thought it a very small thing that even their own consciences acquitted them, or that in man's judgment they were preferred and made the head of a party, who were stewards, and therefore required to be faithful to him who gave them their commission, and who sought to have praise, not of man, but of God, in that solemn day of his appearing, when he should bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and make manifest the counsels of the heart. And if we had imbibed more deeply St. Paul's spirit, we should less resemble then, it is to be feared, we sometimes do, the contentious Corinthians, or the multitudes who flock to the wilderness to the Baptist's preaching, as if it had been some spectacle for idle curiosity. Matthew chapter 11. Wisdom will be justified of all her children, even in our judgment. We should see them all to be ministers and ambassadors of God and our commendations and censures would be turned into prayers on their behalf, such as the Church has taught us, that like the Baptist, they may likewise so prepare and make ready the way of Christ, by turning the hearts of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, that at his second coming to judge the world, we may be found an acceptable people in his sight. And in this way too, as well as in the faith and the inspired word, we should promote the fulfilment of Christ's commandment of love. 
For it was for this purpose that he has commissioned the ministers and stewards of his word and sacraments. St. Paul tells us, He gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God into a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, but, speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. 4. And now, having reviewed the privileges with which we are favoured in Christ's holy church until his coming again, we are solemnly warned in the epistle of the fourth Sunday, as before in that of the first, of his near approach. The Lord is at hand. And if indeed we lived answerably to our privileges as members of Christ's church and household, we should be able to await the fulfilment of the promise in the spirit of calm, confidence and joy, which St. Paul describes in the verses that follow. The peace of God which passeth all understanding, keeping our hearts and minds by Christ Jesus. The passage which is chosen for the Gospel places us at the point of time when Christ was on the eve of appearing as the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He had been baptised, and was now returning from the wilderness. For it was the next day, we read, that the Baptist pointed him out to the notice of his disciples. He was already standing among them, though they knew him not, ready to baptise them with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And so now, in these latter days, the heralds of Christ's second coming are warning the people that he is at hand, and like the Baptist, referring to the scripture for a proof that they are duly commissioned to prepare his way before him. Like him, they tell the church of a salvation ready to be revealed, of times of refreshing to come from the presence of the Lord, of times of the restitution of all things, and of the more glorious establishment of Christ's kingdom, and in earnest, looking for the promise, they offer up the prayer of the church that God would be pleased to raise up his power and come among us and with great might succour us. But while we hope for the promise, we must not forget the threatening. The Baptist spoke of Christ's coming with his fan in his hand and of the separation which he would make between the chaff and the wheat. Compare Malachi chapter 4. But what were the days of vengeance upon the Jewish church compared with those which we must expect? And the time is at length come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and the heavenly reaper thrusts in his sharp sickle and reaps the earth. The Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? We find that when Jesus was coming nigh to Jerusalem on the day of his triumphant entry, because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear, he added and spake a parable. It was the parable of the talents, Luke chapter 19. And so, when we are disposed to indulge in bright anticipations of coming glory to the church, let us rather turn our thoughts inward to our own individual privileges and individual responsibility remembering that the kingdom of God is within us, and that to whomsoever much is given of him will be much required. And especially, let us remember that among the gifts given to us, for which we must give account, are the new commandment of love, the inspired word of God, written for our learning and his duly appointed ministers, sent before him to prepare us for his coming. End of Tract 16 Tract 17 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. The Ministerial Commission, 
A Trust from Christ for the Benefit of His People by Benjamin Harrison It will be acknowledged by all who have followed the Jewish Church through her days of suffering and who have learned the deep feeling of our own impressive litany that the main strength of the Church of God in her times of trial and danger is in the lowliness of her humiliation before her heavenly guardian for her many imperfections and sins. But there is another element of her strength, which, it is to be feared, is sometimes forgotten, though not less essential to her character. I mean her firm and unshaken reliance upon the promises of God made to her. Thus, in Daniel's prayer, there are the most heartbroken confessions of sin in the name of his church and people. But, at the same time, there is throughout a steadfast hope of God's mercy as pledged to his holy city and temple. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of face, as at this day, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. It can scarcely be necessary to remind the members of our own church how beautifully the close of her litany breathes the spirit of Daniel's prayer. How, in the midst of reiterated supplications for God's forgiveness and mercy, now addressed more especially to the Son, now to the Father, now to every person of the blessed and holy Trinity, now in the prevailing words which Christ himself taught us, supplications so deeply expressive of the sighing of a contrite heart, the desire of such as be sorrowful. There still break in a gleam of faith and hope in the memory of the noble works which we have heard with our ears, and our fathers have declared unto us, a strong yet humble confidence, that God will yet again arise and help us, and deliver us for his name's sake, and for his honour. Now, this is a point which it is of great importance to have strongly impressed upon our minds, because it is to be feared that there are many of our brethren in the present day who allow the thoughts of present and past transgressions, of our own sins, and those of our fathers, to banish entirely the remembrance of the glorious promises and privileges which belong to us. They see so much neglected, and so much to be done, that they think it would become us each to work in lonely humiliation, in fear and in much trembling, instead of endeavouring to magnify our office and cheer one another with the songs of Zion. Now I would ask, if this notion exists in any of our brethren, whether under the semblance of good, it does not argue something of mistaken feeling, and that in more than one essential point. First, does not this opinion seem to imply the supposition that the dignity conferred on the ministerial office is something given for the exaltation of the clergy, and not for the benefit of the people? As if there were a different interest in the two orders, and in maintaining their divine appointment, the clergy would make themselves lords over God's heritage? I do not now enter upon the point that to magnify the office is not necessary to exalt the individual who bears it. Nay, that the thought which will most deeply humble the individual, most oppress him with the overwhelming sense of his insufficiency, is the consciousness into how high a dignity and to how weighty an office and charge he has been called. An office of such excellency and of so great difficulty. I would now rather ask, for whose benefit this high and sacred office has been instituted? For the clergy or for the people? The apostle will decide this point. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4. 
All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And this, it should be well observed, the Apostle says on purpose to put an end to that exaltation of individuals which the Church of Corinth had fallen into from forgetting that their pastors and teachers were all ministers of Christ. Ministers by whom they believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. And so again to the same church, and in reference to the same subject, St. Paul says, All things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 Scripture then is expressed upon this point, that whatever power and grace Christ has given to his ministers, he has given them for the good of his people and the glory of his heavenly Father. And do not our own understandings and consciences bear witness to the same truth? For what is our commission? Is it not a ministry of reconciliation? To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, and hath committed to us the proclamation of the pardon? Let us put the case on which the Apostle's language is founded. The case, I mean, of people in rebellion against their sovereign, visited with the news that their king is willing, nay, even anxiously desirous to give them forgiveness and favour. In such a case, would not the first question be, what authority does this report go upon? Who are the persons who bring it? Is it merely a matter of their individual belief, or are they duly authorised and commissioned from the court? Are they come as volunteers, or have they been sent by their master? Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are sent to bring good tidings and to publish peace to preach deliverance to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And if we allow our commission to be questioned, nay, if we do not most unequivocally and prominently assert it, whom are we robbing? Not ourselves of honour, but the people to whom we are sent, of the blessedness and joy of knowing that God desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he should turn from his wickedness and live. And that, in token of his desire, he hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce it to the people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. We are sent to preach good tidings unto the meek, to bind up the broken-hearted, to comfort all that mourn. And it is the meek and the broken-hearted and the mourners which will feel the loss if our blessed office be set at naught or disregarded. Let us well consider this point. There is a humble and fearful member of Christ's flock who desires to strengthen and refresh his soul by the body and blood of Christ, but he cannot quit his own conscience. He requires farther comfort and counsel. Surely it is to his comfort that there is a duly commissioned minister of God's word at hand, to whom he may come and open his grief and receive the benefit of the sentence of God's pardon, and so prepare himself to approach the holy table with a full trust in God's mercy and with a quiet conscience. And so draw near with faith and take that holy sacrament to his comfort. And then again, when he lieth sick upon his bed, does not his Saviour make all his bed and his sickness when he sends his minister to him to receive the confession of his sins and to relieve his conscience of the weighty things which press it down? And then, if he humbly and heartily desire it, by virtue of the power which he has left to his church, assures him of the pardon of his sins, that so, as his sufferings abound, his consolation also may abound through Christ. And as his outward man perisheth, the inward man may be renewed day by day. How then ought we to look upon the power which has been given us by Christ, but as a sacred treasure, of which we are ministers and stewards, which it is our duty to guard for the sake of his little ones, for whose edification, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 10, the Lord himself has left the powers with his church. 
And if we suffer it to be lost to the Christian church, how shall we answer it? Not merely to those who might now rejoice in its holy comfort, but to those also that are to come after us. For the promises unto you and to your children, and unto all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Second, but if we are thus bound by our duty to the Christian flock, are we not also still more solemnly bound by our obligation to its chief shepherd and bishop? For we are ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God, and in stewards it is required that a man be found faithful. It becomes us, therefore, well to consider and ask, what is the full amount of the riches which have been committed to our care? What is the height and depth of the mysteries which have been entrusted to our keeping? For we serve a master who will strictly require at our hands every talent which he has left with us, and rigorously examine whether we have been afraid and hid it in a napkin, or have diligently put it out to usury and turned it to full account. Let us turn our thoughts again to the representation which St. Paul gives us of our character and calling. We are ambassadors for Christ. Now what should we think of the ambassador of an earthly king, who, when he came among the people to whom he was sent, should seem to regard it as a matter of slight importance, whether he were indeed commissioned or not, or seem willing to conceal the full powers with which he was vested, and speak only as an individual? Would this be to be faithful to him that appointed him? Would his master own him as a good and faithful servant? And if we are ambassadors for Christ, his deputies for the reducing of man to the obedience of God, we must follow the example which our master has set us. And as he was, so must we be in this world. For he has himself declared to us, As my father has sent me, even so send I you. How then did Christ fulfil the office which the Father had committed to him? Let us look to his discourses as recorded in St. John's Gospel, and to the solemn prayer with which he concluded his earthly ministry. We there find him again and again proclaiming that he had been sent from the Father. It was with this in view he prayed so earnestly for the unity and holiness of his church, that the world might believe that the Father had sent him. It was because his chosen disciples had believed that the Father had sent him that he poured forth such fervent thanksgivings on their behalf. I am not come of myself, but he sent me. I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. They have known that all things are of thee. They have known that I came out from thee. They have believed that thou didst send me. Thus did Christ stand in the midst of his generation as an apostle, as one sent from God. And so must his deputies likewise stand among their brethren, as men sent to a rebellious house, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear speaking with authority, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled unto God. And if we are asked by what authority we speak, and who gave us this authority, we have our credentials at hand. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He that heareth you, heareth me, and he that despiseth you, despiseth me, and he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. Fidelicit, St. Matthew chapter 18, St. Luke chapter 10, St. John chapter 20. If ever, then, we are tempted to be ashamed of Christ and of his words, or to allow his high and heavenly mission to be thought lightly of in the person of his deputies and ministers, let us remember that it is no matter of personal consideration that two sacred interests are involved, the glory of God 
and the edifying of his people. Let us remember that, as Christ received of the Father a commandment, so we too have received a commandment from him, the commandment as well as the power to declare to his people the message of forgiveness. But Christ has commanded us to teach all nations to observe whatsoever he has commanded us, and then he will be with us always, even to the end of the world. And above all, let us not be silenced by the sense of past unworthiness and neglect, whether in ourselves individually or in the church at large. This would be but to add sin to sin. Rather, seeing we have this ministry, this glorious ministration of righteousness, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, compare chapter 3, let us not faint, but strive how we may show ourselves dutiful and thankful to that Lord who hath placed us in so high a dignity. The world would fain silence our glorying, and would have Christ rebuke his disciples. But let us not be ashamed of the good confession, for with such powers and graces given to us by Christ himself, as ambassadors for him, and workers together with God, if we should hold our peace, the very stones would immediately cry out. End of Tract 17Tract 18 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Thoughts on the Benefits of the System of Fasting, Enjoined by Our Church, by Edward Bouvery Pusey. To a person but little accustomed to observe any stated fasts, the directions given by our Church on this subject will probably occasion two very opposite feelings. On the one hand, he would be struck by the practical character and the thoughtfulness evinced by some of the regulations. On the other, he would probably feel repelled by the number of days and the variety of occasions which the church has appointed so to be hallowed. Most Christians who really loved their saviour, unless prevented by the habits of early education, would probably see something appropriate and affectionate in the selection of the Friday, for a weekly commemoration of their Saviour's sufferings, and of humiliation for their own sins which caused them. Or at all events, they would feel that there was some thoughtfulness in the direction annexed, that this weekly fast should not interfere with the Christian joyousness brought back by the festival of their Lord's Nativity, when these should, in the cycle of years, coincide. Again, if they should fail to appreciate the wisdom of appointing certain days to be kept sacred in memory of the holy men who left all to follow Christ, and consequently should be rather deterred than attracted by observing that many of these days were ushered in by a preceding fast, still they would hardly fail to be struck by the provision that this previous fast should not interfere with the Christian weekly festival of his Lord's resurrection, but that, if any of these feast days should fall upon a Monday, then the fast day should be kept on the Saturday, not upon the Sunday next before it. Again, he must observe that during certain periods of the church's year, which were supposed to be times of especial joy to the Christian, those namely following the Nativity and the Resurrection, these preparatory fasts are altogether omitted. Some or other of these regulations probably strike most thoughtful minds as instances of consideration and reflection in those who formed them. The clergy, more especially, would appreciate, abstractedly at least, the imitation of the apostolic practice of fasting, when any are to be ordained to any holy function in the church. And some probably will feel mournfully that if the church were now more uniformly to observe those acts of fasting and prayer, which were thought needful, before even Paul and Barnabas were separated for God's work, we should have more reasonable grounds to hope that many of our clergy would be filled with the spirit of Barnabas and Paul. On the other hand, it is naturally to be expected that one not accustomed to any outward restraint in this matter would feel indisposed to ordinances so detailed. That, although he could reconcile himself to one or the other of these observances, which most recommended themselves to his Christian feelings, he would think the whole a burthensome and minute ceremonial, 
perhaps unbefitting a spiritual worship and interfering with the liberty wherewith Christ has made him free. This is very natural, for we are by nature averse to restraint, and the abuse of some maxims of Protestantism, such as the right of private judgment, has made us yet more so. We are reluctant to yield to an unreasoning authority and to submit our wills when our reason has not first been convinced, and the prevailing maxims of the day have strengthened this reluctance. We have been accustomed to do, every one that which was right in his own eyes, and are jealous of any authority except that of the direct injunctions of the Bible. We have, I fear also, so untruly spiritualized our religion that we have almost lost sight of that part of it which is adapted to us as being yet in the flesh, in our zeal for the blessed truths of the cross of Christ, and of our sanctification by the Holy Spirit, we have begun insensibly to disparage other truths, which bring us less immediately into intercourse with God, to neglect the means and ordinances which touch not upon the very centre of our faith. The practical system of the Church is altogether at variance with that which even pious Christians in these days have permitted themselves to adopt. Much which she has recommended or enjoined would now be looked upon as formalism or outward service. In our just fear of a lifeless formalism, we have forgotten that every Christian feeling must have its appropriate vehicle of expression. That the most exalted acts of Christian devotion, that our closest union with our Saviour, is dependent upon certain forms, that the existence of forms does not constitute formalism, that where the Spirit of Christ is, there the existence of forms serves only to give regularity to the expression, to chasten what there might yet remain of too individual feeling, to consolidate the yet divided members in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Yet, as in every case which the current of prevailing opinions, either in faith or practice, has for some time set in one direction, there have not been wanting indications that Christians have felt their system incomplete, that there was something in the tranquil piety of former days which they would gladly incorporate into the zealous excitement of the present, that although religion is in one sense strictly individual, yet in the means by which it is kept alive, it is essentially expansive and social, that the only error here to be avoided is a reliance upon forms, that the forms themselves, as soon as they are employed to realize things eternal and to cherish their communion with their Saviour, become again spiritual and edifying. It is accordingly remarkable in the present day to observe in how many cases individuals have been led back by their own Christian experience to observances, in some respect similar to those which the Church had before suggested and provided for them. In the more advanced period of their Christian course, or amid the respite from the unceasing circle of active duty which God has granted them through an interval of sickness, they have seen the value of those rites, the scrupulous adherence to which they once regarded as signs of lifelessness. In either case, they would willingly own that the union provided by the Church is not only more ordered and less liable to exception than one which individuals could frame, but also that as being more comprehensive, it would more effectively realise their objects. It is granted, then, that the proportion of the fast days enjoined by the Church will, to persons unaccustomed to observe them, appear over-large, and the variety of the occasions for which they are adapted over-minute and arbitrary. The question, however, occurs whether we ought to be influenced by such considerations to reject the entire system, or whether we ought not rather to be moved by the indications of a practical character evinced in some regulations, to make the trial of those whose benefit we do not at present discern. Now it would seem plain that, in a practical matter, he who from the traces of wisdom or thoughtfulness in one regulation should infer the probable wisdom and reasonableness of others emanating from the same source, would act more wisely than one who, on account of the apparent unreasonableness and superfluity of some provisions, should proceed to condemn the whole. For in practical matters, 
the great test of the expediency of any habit for which we have not direct divine authority is experience. They only who have tried a line of conduct, or narrowly watched its effects on others, can speak with certainty as to its result. Of all the lesser courses of action which tend so powerfully to form our moral habits, it would be impossible, probably, for one who had not tried their effect to predict certainly what that effect would be. Or if we could guess the nature of the effect, certainly we should not be able to foresee its degree and amount. With the exception of gross and flagrant sins, whose character and wages we know from authority, there is probably no one line of action with regard to which we might not beforehand prove very plausibly to ourselves that it would not have the effects to which it is in fact tending, and which we afterwards perceive to have been its natural results. Yet such abstract reasonings about the possibilities or tendencies of things would not be listened to in any other case. When sick, men eagerly listen to the means, however improbable, by which any disease resembling their own was removed. Be it a poison, which they are bidden to take, yet if it be proved satisfactory that in cases like their own, that poison has been the messenger of health, they would not hesitate. They would listen to no abstract reasonings, that it was improbable that what had been an instrument of death could be their life. They would look to those whom it had restored to health, and would do the like. The sight of one person, undeniably raised from death to life, would affect men more than any a priori demonstration that the medicine was pernicious or deadly. Much more, then, since this medicine has been recommended to us by the great physician of our souls, since it has been beneficial, wherever it has not been substituted for all other means of restoring and maintaining our spiritual health. The only question is, not whether fasting be in itself beneficial, but whether certain regulations concerning it tend to promote or to diminish its efficacy. And in this case, the testimony of those who have proved their value is manifestly of primary importance. The preconceived opinions of such as has not tried them are but mere presumptions. If then either in the regulations or the histories of those holy men, through whom these recommendations have become part of the system of our church, we find indications that they themselves knew from experience the value of what they recommended, we have evidence of the value of their advice, which we may not, without peril of injury to our souls, neglect. It was, in part, by some such process as the preceding, that the writer of these pages was led to consider what one may be allowed to term the less solemn fasts of the Church, those which Christians now ordinarily pay less regard to. For the first day of Lent and the annual commemoration of our Saviour's sufferings are, I suppose, still very commonly observed. As the history of every mind is, under some modifications, the mirror of many others, it may to some be useful to see by what course of reflection or experience an individual was brought to feel the value of the regulations of the Church in this respect. It will perhaps to some seem strange to find placed among the foremost of these advantages the protection thereby afforded. Protection against oneself. Protection against the habits and customs of the world, which sorely let and hinder one in systematically pursuing what one imagines might be beneficial. I speak not, of course, of any known duty. In that case, the opinion or practice or invitations of the world were nothing. But with regard to those indefinite duties or disciplines, which one thinks may be performed as well at one period as at another, and which on that very account are frequently not performed at all, or at best occasionally only and superficially. No thoughtful Christian will doubt the propriety and duty of fasting, whatever he may understand by the term. The bridegroom is taken away from us, and so we must fast in these days. Our blessed Saviour has given us instructions how we ought to fast, and therefore implied that his disciples would fast. The disciples were in fastings often, in fastings as well as in sufferings for the gospel, or by pureness, by knowledge, by all the graces which the Holy Ghost imparted, they approved themselves the ministers of God. Our Lord and Saviour, says Hooker, 
would not teach the manner of doing, much less propose a reward for doing that which were not both holy and acceptable in God's sight. And yet, after all the allowances which can be made for that fasting, which is known to our Father only who seeth in secret, one cannot conceal from oneself that this duty is in these days very inadequately practised. It is, in fact, a truth almost proverbial that a duty which may be performed at any time is in great risk of being neglected at all times. The only Christians felt this, and appointed the days of our blessed Saviour's betrayal and crucifixion, the Wednesday and Friday of each week, to be days of fasting and especial humiliation. Those days in which especially the bridegroom was taken away, the days namely in which he was crucified and lay in the grave, were besides early consecrated as fasts by the widowed church. Nor was it because they were in perils which we are spared, because they were in deaths oft that they practised or needed this discipline. Quite the reverse. Their whole life was a fast, a death to this world, a realising of things invisible. It was when dangers began to mitigate, when Christianity became, as far as the world was concerned, an easy profession. It was then that the peril increased, lest their first simplicity should be corrupted, their first love grow cold then those who had spiritual authority in the church increased the stated fasts in order to recall that holy earnestness of life which the recentness of their redemption and the constant sense of their Saviour's presence had before inspired. Fasts were not merely the voluntary discipline of men whose conversation was in heaven. They were adopted and enlarged in periods of ease, of temptation, of luxury, of self-satisfaction, of growing corruption. To urge that fasts were abused by the later Romish church is but to assert that they are a means of grace committed to men. That they would subsequently be unduly neglected was but to be expected by anyone who knows the violent vacillations of human impetuosity. It was then, among the instances of calm judgment in our reformers, that cutting off the abuses which before prevailed, the vain distinctions of meats, the lucrative dispensations, and above all, the subtle poison of the intrinsic acceptableness of fasting, and, which was closely allied to it, the monstrous doctrine of human merit, they still prescribed fasting to discipline the flesh, to free the spirit, and render it more earnest and fervent to prayer, and as a testimony and witness with us before God of our humble submission to his high majesty, when we confess our sins unto him, and are inwardly touched with sorrowfulness of heart, bewailing the same in the affliction of our bodies. They omitted that which might be a snare to men's consciences. They left it to every man's Christian prudence and experience how he would fast. But they prescribed the days upon which he should fast, both in order to obtain a unity of feeling and devotion in the members of Christ's body, and to preclude the temptation to the neglect of the duty altogether. Nor is the interference in this matter anything insulated in our system, or one which good men would object to, had not our unhappy neglect of it now made it seem strange and foreign to our habits. In some things we are accustomed to perform a duty, which is such independently of the authority of the Church, in the way in which the Church is prescribed, and because she has so appointed. We assemble ourselves together on the Lord's Day because God has directed us by his Apostle not to forsake such assemblies. But we assemble ourselves twice upon that day rather than once, not upon any reason of the abstract fitness of doing so, but because the Church has prescribed it. And probably at an earlier period of our lives, perhaps even later, when indisposition or indolence or any prevailing temptation has beset us, there are few amongst us who have not owed their regular perseverance in public worship to this ordinance of the Church. There is no one, assuredly, who, having broken this ordinance, has afterwards, by God's mercy, been brought back to join more uniformly in the public worship of his God and Saviour, who has not been thankful for this restriction. This, then, is protection. The like has undoubtedly taken place even in the celebration of the Supper of our Lord. Individuals have been induced to join, 
that beneficially to themselves in the communion even of their Saviour's body and blood, just so often in the year as their church is prescribed to them. This is not so unusual a case as it might seem. One cannot doubt that in many cases, where the Holy Communion is celebrated but three times in the year, this is so done, because such is the smallest number of which the church admits, and the minister supposes that his flock would not join with him more frequently. Had the church made no such regulation, many probably, who now partake three times a year, might not have joined even thus often. Yet would it not be true to say that such persons in all cases partook without real devotion, or any love to their saviour? Again, where there are opportunities of a monthly communion, there may be some who would not have desired the privilege unless the provision had been made for them, and they had been invited by the church so to do. Yet would it not of necessity follow that they partake coldly or unacceptably? A warmer love would indeed lead the one to a more frequent, the other to a more glad communion, nor have such persons well understood the principles of their church. Still, God forbid that we shall judge that they had not partaken worthily and devotionally. Here again, then, is protection. In either case, we have a command of God, obeyed in such wise as is prescribed by the ministers, whom he has made the stewards of his word and sacraments. And since we in these cases admit their regulation, why should we think it strange or incongruous that they have given us their godly admonitions in another ordinance of God. Nor is it to the undecided, or the timid, or the hesitating, or the novice only, that this protection is beneficial. Although no reflecting Christian would speak lightly of the value of any mean, which tends to strengthen the broken reed or to kindle anew the smouldering flax, the comparison of our own times with those of the reformers were proof enough of the benefit of authoritative interposition in these matters. Is human nature changed? Or have we discovered some more royal road by which to arrive at the subjugation of the body, the spiritualizing of the affections? Or have we, even from, without fewer temptations to luxury and self-indulgence? Or will not even the more pious and decided Christians among us confess upon reflection, that they had probably been now more advanced, had they in this point adhered to the ancient discipline of our church? Our reformers kept and enjoined 108 days in each year, either entirely or in part, to be in this matter sanctified. Two-sevenths of each year they wished to be in some way separated by acts of self-denial and humiliation. Let any one consider what proportion of each year he has himself so consecrated, and whether, had he followed the ordinances of the church, his spirit would not probably have been more chastened and lowly, more single in following even what he deems his duty, whether self would not have been more restrained, whether he would not have walked more humbly with his God. Yet authority is a valuable support against the world, even to minds who yet are not inclined to compromise with the world unlawfully. There are many situations in life in which it were almost impossible to continue without observation a system of habitual and regular fasting, certainly not one attended with those accompaniments which the fathers of our church thought it desirable to unite with it. It is true that every fast may be made a feast, and every feast a fast. That as far as self-denial is concerned, if there be a steadfast purpose, the objects may perhaps be better accomplished in the midst of plenty and luxury than by the purposed spareness of a private board. It is possible also that the acts might be in some measure concealed. Still, there are very many minds, and those such as one would be the most anxious to protect, to whom the very suspicion that they might be observed would be matter of pain and a species of profanation they would shrink from anything which might be construed into pharisaic abstinence, or which would seem to pretend to more than ordinary measures of Christian prudence. To such mild and unobtrusive spirits, the recommendation or direction of the church is an invaluable support. They may now adopt the line of conduct which they love, unimpeded by any scruple, lest their good should be evil spoken of, they are acting under authority. 
They pretend to nothing more than the founders of their church have deemed expedient for everyone. Their conduct involves no lofty pretensions. They follow in simplicity and faithfulness an old and trodden track, which has been marked out for them as plain and safe. The first advantage, then, which may result from the authoritative interposition of the church in regulating this duty is the securing of greater regularity and more uniform perseverance in its performance. Not undoubtedly is in itself an end, but as leading to great and important ends. For as those pious men who laid so much stress thereon themselves say, when it respecteth the good end, it is a good work. For with the end being evil, the work is also evil. Fasting is not to be commended as a duty, but as an instrument, and in that sense no man can reprove it or undervalue it, but he that knows neither spiritual acts nor spiritual necessities. But further, it is not even true that all the purposes of fasting can be attained by mere self-denial in the midst of luxury. For the acquisition of the habit of self-denial, although an important object, is by no means the sole end of fasting. The great purpose, in connection with which it is chiefly mentioned in Holy Scripture, is prayer. The influences of society, rightly chosen, may dispose the mind to more fervent, possibly only more excited, prayer. It is solitude generally, or communion with a single friend, which brings us to a humble, contrite, lowly intercourse with our God. In the present day, the first paramount evil which destroys its tens of thousands is probably self-indulgence. The second, which hinders thousands in their progress heavenwards, is the being busy and careful about many things, whether temporal or spiritual. We have kept the vineyards of our mother's children, but our own vineyards have we not kept. The tendency of the age is to activity, and we have caught its spirit. If we be but active about our master's calling, we deem ourselves secure. We think not, till we are precluded from active exertion, how much activity belongs to some, ages and some natures, and that this nature is often mistaken for grace. Meanwhile, an activity which leads us not inwards has taken place of that tranquil, retiring meditation on the things of the unseen world which formed the deep, absorbing, contemplative piety of our forefathers. Even the conception of the joys of heaven, which very many of us form, is but a glorified transcript of our life here. We look, when through God's mercy in Christ we shall be delivered from the burthen of the flesh, to be like the ministers of his who do his pleasure. But we look not, comparatively at least, to that which our fathers longed for, to be with Christ, and to see him as he is. Our age is in general too busy, too active for deep and continued self-observation, or for thoughtful communion with our God. It would not be too broad or invidious a statement to say that for real insight into the recesses of our nature, or for deep aspirations after God, we must for the most part turn to holy men of other days, our own furnish us chiefly with that which they have mainly cherished, a general abhorrence of sin. They guide us not to trace it out in the lurking corners of our own hearts. They teach us to acknowledge generally the corruption of our nature, the necessity of a Redeemer, and the love we should feel towards him. But they lead us not to that individual and detailed knowledge of our own personal sinfulness, whence the real love of our Redeemer can alone flow. A religious repose and a thoughtful contemplation would be a second advantage of complying in this respect with the instructions of our church. Braced and strung by retirement into ourselves and tranquil meditation upon God, we should return to our active duties with so much more efficiency as we ourselves had become holier, humbler, calmer, more abstracted from ourselves, more habituated to refer all things to God. Were human activity alone engaged on both sides, then might we the rather justify the prevailing notions of the day, that energy is to be met by counter-energy alone. But now, since we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, it especially behoves us to look wherein our great strength lies, 
and to take heed that the weapons of our warfare be not carnal. It is tempting to adopt into the service of God the weapons or the mode of warfare, which, in the hands of his enemies, we see to be efficacious. But the faithful soldier of Christ must not go forth with weapons which he has not proved. The Christian's armory, as the Apostle continues to describe it, is mainly defensive. And when he has urged his brethren to assume it, he exhorts them to add that whereby alone it becomes effectual, a duty in which again we appear to ourselves to be inactive. Praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Fasting, retirement, and prayer, as they severally and unitedly tend to wean us from ourselves and cast us upon God, will tend to promote singleness of purpose, to refine our busy and overheated restlessness into a calm and subdued confidence in Him, in whose strength we go forth. Nor shall we, until the day of judgment, know how much of the victory was granted to those who in man's sight took no share in the conflict, how far the unseen strength of fasting, humiliation, prayer, put forth by those of whom the world took no account, was allowed by God to prevail. The world saw only that the apostle whom they had imprisoned escaped their power. They knew not that the prayer of the church had baffled their design. In the present conflict throughout the world, in which the pride of human and satanic strength seems to put forth to the utmost, humility and a chastened dependent spirit would seem to have any special efficacy. On these, as the graces most opposed to the world's main sin, we might look the more cheerfully for God's blessing. Thus shall we at least be saved from augmenting the evil we would oppose. Fasting directly advances towards chastity, and by consequence and indirect powers to patience, humility, and indifference. But then, it is not the fast of a day that can do this. It is not an act, but a state of fasting that operates to mortification. A third benefit, which might be hoped to result from the more assiduous practice of this duty, would be a more self-denying extense of charity. Fasting without mercy is but an image of famine, Fasting without works of piety is only an occasion of covetousness. And an apostolic father gives us this excellent instruction. A true fast is not merely to keep under the body, but to give to the widow or the poor the amount of that which thou wouldst have expended upon thyself, so that he who receives it may pray to God for thee. It may perhaps seem strange to some that the present age should be thought wanting as self-denying charity, and yet, let men but consider with themselves not what they give only, but what they retain. Let them inquire a little further. Not only what wants are relieved, but what remediable misery remains unabated. Or let them but observe generally the glaring contrasts of extremist luxury and softness, and pinching want and penury. Between their own sealed houses and the houses of God, which lie waste. Or let them only trace out one single item in the mass of human wretchedness, disease, insanity, religious ignorance, and picture to themselves what a Christian people might do, what the primitive Christians would have done to relieve it, and then turn to what is done, to what themselves do, and say whether means to promote self-denying charity can well be spared. A further important object of the stated and frequent recurrence of the prescribed fasts of our Church is the public recognition of the reality of things spiritual. Here also, very many have felt, and it is a feeling whose strength is daily increasing, that some public protest is needed against the modes of acting. Tolerated, would one must not say, reigning, in our nominally Christian land. That the Church, or the body of believers, ought to have some recognised mode of distinguishing themselves from those who manifest by their deeds that although amongst us they are not of us, and who, on the principles of our church, would have gone out or been removed from us. It has been with a right view of what the ideal of the Christian church should be, its holiness and its purity, 
although not, I must think, with a just conception of the nature of the Church, that men, jealous for the honour of their God and their Redeemer, have in some measure formed churches within the Church. The plan has, I think, been defective, sacred and praiseworthy as was the object contemplated. It is true that the mere union and the celebration of the weekly festival of our Lord's resurrection does not, as things now are, furnish a sufficient condemnation of the maxims and offences of the world. That the church and the world are too much amalgamated. That while the light of the church has in part penetrated the gross darkness of the world, there is yet danger, lest that light itself should be obscured. Yet the remedy for this, under God's blessing, is not to be sought in rescuing or concentrating some scattered rays of that church, while the church itself is abandoned to the world. The ordinances of the church itself afford the means of its own restoration, not to speak of those ulterior and fearful powers committed to it, and which other communions exercise, of ejecting from its bosom the wicked person. The observance of its own other institutions would virtually eject them. Not indeed at once, as indeed God himself has thought fit to allow even his own blessed spirit but gradually to leaven our corrupted mass. Not at once, for at present long continuance in opposed habits would prevent many from receiving the ordinances of the church. But yet, one should trust, steadily and increasingly. The mists which now encircle the church would disperse, and its glorious elevation on Zion's hill would more effectually be seen. Those whom the easy service of the Lord's day repels not, who would fain serve God on the seventh day, and mammon on the remaining six, would be brought to some test of what spirit they were. And if the church, like him who is its head, and because joined to that head, becomes a stone of stumbling, if some shall more openly fall back into perdition, still it will have performed its office. Many, one may be sure, for our assurance rests on God's word, would also be awakened from their lethargy of death. And if it be to some a savour of death, it will, by God's mercy, be to many more a savour of life unto life. Yet the result of any system built upon God's word belongs not to us. Were the consequences of more apostolic practice a great apparent defection and desolation, we dare not hesitate. It must be made manifest that they are not all of us. Meanwhile, a beacon will be held out to those who would wish to see their path. The plea that every show of religion which the world tolerates not is the mere excess and badge of a party could no longer be held. Those who shrink from what might seem a voluntary or ostentatious forwardness would no longer be deterred from uniting in observances, which, if authorised, they would love. And there might again be no separation but between those who serve God and those who serve him not. The world has seen that its own principles are leading to its own destruction. It acknowledges that its increased laxity has fearfully increased its corruption. Offences, which even it abhors, are multiplied. Vices, which disturb even its peace, stalk more openly. Yet, while it reaps the bitter fruits of its own ways, it dares not strike the root. The fasts, appointed by our church, appear eminently calculated, not in truth as a panacea of all evil, but as one decided protest against the corruption which is in the world by lust, as a testimony to the conviction of men of the reality of things eternal. Men may fast for strife and despite with the fist of wickedness, as they may also, for pretense, make long prayers. Yet will not men, in general, submit to inconvenience and privation, except for a real and substantial object? The world has easier paths for its followers. He who suffers hardship for an unseen reward at least gives evidence to the world of the sincerity and rootedness of his own conviction. He attests that he is a pilgrim, journeying to a better country, and however men may for a while neglect his testimony, it cannot be silenced. Such are some of the advantages which a recurrence to the system of our church in respect of fasting might, 
in dependence upon God's blessing, tend to realise. A more uniform, namely, and regular observance of an injunction of our blessed Saviour, a deeper humiliation and a more chastened spirit in carrying on his will, a more thorough insight into ourselves and a closer communion with our God, a more resolute and consistent practice of self-denying charity, a more lively realising of things spiritual, a warning to the world of God's truth and its own peril. I have spoken with reference to prevailing habits and general character only, partly because they are these habits which the regulations of a church must mainly contemplate, in part also because, in whatever degree, they will probably form a portion of their own. The evil or defective character of any period is not formed by, nor will it exist in, those only who are evil. It encompasses us, is within us. We also contribute in our degree to foster and promote it. Nay, it is from us probably that it receives its main countenance and support. Our own standard is insensibly lowered by the evil with which we are environed. A self-indulgent age is not a favourable atmosphere for the growth of self-denial, nor an age of busy and self-dependent activity for that of a calm and abiding practical recognition that everything is in God's hands, nor a period absorbed in the things of sense for thoughtful meditation on things eternal. The predominant evils will indeed appear in the Christian in a subdued form. Yet whether the temptation to be an unconscious compliance with them, or unwittingly to oppose evil with evil, the danger lies nearer here than in any other part of duty. And if the salt in any wise lose its savour, wherewith shall the self-corrupting world be preserved? Wherewith the salt itself be salted? The benefits above named are such as depend on the increased degree of fasting, exercised in compliance with the directions of the Church, independently of the consideration of the days or seasons selected for that purpose. The results to be anticipated from a more general adherence to these rules appear, however, to be heightened by that selection. The general objects of the Church were, first, to impress upon the mind and life the memory of her Saviour's sufferings, second, to prepare the mind for different solemn occasions which recur in her yearly service. The first, or the Friday fast, as above stated, was universally adopted in the early Church, and in all probability was coeval with the Apostles. It was continued uninterruptedly, alike in the Eastern and the Western Church, and preserved in our own, through the respect which she bore to primitive antiquity and the experience of the Elder Church. It was perhaps at the first adopted as the natural expression of sorrow for the loss of their Lord and for his bitter sufferings. With this would soon connect itself, almost to the exclusion of the former, sorrow for the sins which caused those sufferings. We do not fast, says Chrysostom, for the passion of the cross, but for our sins. The passion is not the occasion of fasting or mourning, but of joy and exultation. We mourn not for that, God forbid, but for our sins, and therefore we fast. As then the Lord's Day was the weekly festival of their Saviour's resurrection, a weekly memorial of our rising again, in him and through him, to a new and real life. So was the Friday's fast a weekly memorial of the death to sin, which all Christians had in their Saviour died, and which, if they would live with him, they must continually die. Thus each revolving week was a sort of representation of that great week, in which man's redemption was completed. The Church never lost sight of her Saviour's sufferings. Each week was hallowed by a return of the Good Friday. One need scarcely insist upon the tendency of such a system deeply to impress on men's hearts the doctrine of the atonement, by thus incorporating it into their ordinary lives, and making them, by their actions, confess this truth. In the early church, its efficacy was probably increased by the accession of the fast of the Wednesday, or fourth day of the week, so that no portion of the week was without some memorial of the Saviour of the church. There is, however, another object, which, although not originally contemplated, was in fact attained by this institution, 
the holier celebration, namely of our most solemn day, that of our Saviour's death. Most Christians, probably, who have endeavoured to realise to themselves the events of that day, have been painfully disappointed in so doing. Instead of touching the heart with softer power for comfort than an angel's mirth, it has been to them an oppressive day, its tremendous truths overwhelmed rather than consoled. It was so unlike all other days that the mind was confounded by its very greatness, it seemed unnatural to do anything which one would do even on any other holy day, and the heart was equally unsatisfied with what it did or did not do. Something of this kind has taken place in very many minds, and the reason probably was that the solemnity of that day was too insulated, that, if one may use the expression, it was out of keeping with the religious habits of the rest of the year. This, then, the weekly fast and solemn recollection recommended by the Church are calculated to remedy. As indeed, had they been observed, these feelings would never have found place. In whatever degree its advice is adhered to, Good Friday becomes a day of more chastened, and yet probably of intenser feeling. It is connected with a train of the like emotions, affections and resolves, insulated no longer, but the holiest only among the holy. Neither in moral or religious, more than in physical and civil matters, says a very acute observer of human nature, do people willingly do anything suddenly or upon the instant. They need a succession of the like actions, whereby a habit may be formed. The things which they are to love or to perform, they cannot conceive as insulated and detached. Whatever we are to repeat with satisfaction, must not have become foreign to us. The principle is of important application in the whole range of our duties, nor could it become too often repeated in warning that what is not practised frequently can never be performed with delight. We are sensible of the value of habits in moral action, and are not surprised that one, who makes only desultory efforts, should never succeed in acquiring any habit, we feel it in some degree in our public worship of God, and think it natural that one who does not diligently avail himself of all his opportunities of attending it should join in it but coldly and lifelessly. It is strange to him, and therefore at best a stiff and austere service. And yet in other matters we act in defiance of this maxim. We have allowed our fasts to become rare, and therefore it has come to pass that so many never fast at all. Our holy days have passed for the most part into neglect, and therefore the few that remain excite but little comparative feeling. Our daily service is well nigh disused, and therefore our weekly is so much neglected. We have diminished the frequency of our communions, and therefore so many are strangers to the Lord's table, so many formal partakers. Not so the apostles, nor the primitive church, nor our own in its principles, or in its most apostolic days. They knew human nature better. Or rather, acting from their own experience and self-knowledge, they ordained what was healthful for men of like nature with themselves. What was a duty at any period of the year must needs be performed throughout. Each portion had its festivals and its fasts, and the varying circle formed one harmonious whole of Christian humiliation and Christian joy. The church was in those days consistent. Its ministers derived their commission, not of man, but of God, who called them inwardly by his spirit, and outwardly through those to whom, through his apostles, he had delegated this high office. The admission to holy orders was no mere outward consecration or ceremony, but an imparting of God's spirit to those who were separated to this work through the prayers of the congregation, and the delegated authority of the bishop. Christian edification was not left to each man's private judgment, but each was taught by those who had authority and experience what was good and expedient for his soul's health. We also have been in these days becoming consistent. If we fast, we fast for ourselves. If we keep a holy day, or select a portion of the weekly service, it is because we of our own minds deem it convenient. We have become in all things the judges of the church, 
instead of reverently obeying what has been recommended to us. We judge beforehand what will be useful to us, instead of ascertaining by experience whether that recommended by elder Christians be not so. Yet I would fain hope that there will not long be this variance between our principles and our practice, but that, instead of examining what is the present practice of any portion of our church and inquiring how this may be amended, men would first investigate, in the canons and the rubrics, what the real mind of the church is, and see whether adherence to these would not remove the regretted defect. One only objection can, I think, be raised by any earnest-minded Christian to this weekly fast, namely that the means employed, mere self-denial and so slight a matter as one's food, is so petty and trifling a thing that it were degrading the doctrine of the cross to make such an observance in any way bear upon it. One respects the feelings of such a person and his love for the cross, but the objection probably proceeds from inexperience in the habit of fasting. For let any one consider from his childhood upwards by what the greater part of his habits have been formed, and by what they are continued. Not by any great acts or great sacrifices, as far as anything might be relatively great, but by a succession of petty actions, whose effects he could not at the time foresee, or thought too minute to leave any trace behind them, and which have, in fact, whether for good or for evil, made him what he is. Practice will universally show that the motive ennobles the action, not that the action dishonours the motive. True it is, says Bishop Taylor, that religion snatches even at little things, and as it teaches us to observe all the great commandments and significations of duty, so it is not willing to preterm it anything, which, although by its greatness it cannot itself be considerable, yet by its smallness it may become a testimony of the greatness of the affection, which would not omit the least minutes of love and duty. He who pronounced a blessing upon the gift of a cup of cold water to a disciple in his name will also bless any act of sincere self-denial practised in memory of him. Only let us not mock God. Let us deny ourselves in something which is to us really self-denial. Let us, in whatever degree we may be able to bear it without diminishing our own usefulness, put ourselves to some inconvenience and sorrow and shame for those sins. The lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, which made our Saviour a man of sorrows, and exposed him to shame. And we shall not afterwards think the practice degrading to him, or without meaning. The fast of the early Christians during Lent was an entire abstinence until evening, on the Friday, until three o'clock. Unused as we, for the most part, are to any such discipline, many of us would at the first not be well able to endure it. At all events, its introduction had best be gradual. The Church has left the mode of observing her fasts free to the conscience of each. Only let them consist in real self-denial, and be accompanied by charity and prayer. The early Church acted, as it supposed, upon our blessed Saviour's own authority, in connecting these acts of bodily abstinence with the memory of his death. The bridegroom was taken away. Yet, if any one should find in himself any abiding repugnance to associate matters necessarily humiliating with the doctrine of the cross, let him not endeavour to force his feelings. The church wished to lay no yoke upon her members. Let him perform the acts in mere compliance with the advice of the church and the experience of elder Christians. When he shall have attained the habit of self-denial and self-humiliation, the doctrine of the cross will, without effort, connect itself with each such performance. The other fasts of the church require the less to be dwelt upon, either because, as in Lent, her authority is yet in some degree recognised, although it be very imperfectly and capriciously obeyed, or, as in the case of the Ember Weeks, the practice is direct scriptural authority or in that of the other festivals, because when we shall again value the privilege of having the blessed examples of martyrs and saints set before us to remind us how our darksome clay may keep the ethereal warmth our new creator brought, we shall feel also the advantage of ushering in each such day by actions which may remind us how they entered into their glory by taking up their Saviour's cross and following him. Only with regard to the ember weeks, it may be permitted to observe, 
how this institution yet more fully embraces the objects which some good men are endeavouring, by voluntary association, to attain. For the solemn period of the four ember weeks is obviously calculated for prayer, not for those only who are to be ordained to any holy function, but for all who shall have been so called, that God would so replenish them with the truth of this doctrine, and endue them with the innocency of life, that they may faithfully serve him. And thus, not only some few individuals, more nearly known to each other, but all the ministers and all the people of Christ, should, with one mind and one mouth, implore a blessing upon the ministry which he has appointed. And this also is an especial privilege of the whole public fasting of our Church, beyond the voluntary discipline adopted by individuals, that it presents the whole Church unitedly before God, humbling themselves for their past sins, and imploring Him not to give His heritage to reproach. The value of this united humiliation and prayer God only knoweth. Yet, since He hath promised to be present when two or three are gathered together in His name, how much more when His Church shall again unite before Him in weeping, fasting, and praying? How much more shall He spare though we deserve punishment, and in his wrath think upon mercy? He who spared the Ninevites, how much more may we trust that he will spare us, for whom he has given his well-beloved Son? Let us therefore, dearly beloved, seeing there are many more causes of fasting and mourning in these our days, that have been of many years heretofore in any one age, endeavour ourselves, both inwardly in our hearts, and also outwardly with our bodies, diligently to exercise this godly exercise of fasting, in such sort and manner as the holy prophets, the apostles, and diverse other devout persons for their time used the same. God is now the same God as he was then, God that loveth righteousness and that hateth iniquity, God which willeth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he turn from his wickedness and live. God that hath promised to turn to us, if we refuse not to turn to him. Yea, if we turn our evil works from before his eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek to do right, relieve the oppressed, be a right judge to the fatherless, defend the widow, break our bread to the hungry, bring the poor that wander into our house, clothe the naked, and despise not our brother which is our own flesh. Then shall thou call, said the prophet, and the Lord shall answer, Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here am I. Yea, God which heard Ahab and the Ninevites, and spared them, will also hear our prayers, and spare us, so that we, after their example, will unfeignedly turn unto him. Yea, he will bless us with his heavenly benedictions, the time that we have to tarry in this world, and after the race of this mortal life, he will bring us to his heavenly kingdom, where we shall reign in everlasting blessedness with our Saviour Christ, to whom with the Father and the Holy Ghost be all honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. Homily on Fasting, Part 2 Lord, have mercy upon us and give us grace, that while we live in this miserable world, we may, through thy help, bring forth this and other such fruits of the Spirit, commended and commanded in thy holy word, to the glory of thy name, and to our comforts, that after the race of this wretched life, we may live everlastingly with thee in thy heavenly kingdom, not for the merits and worthiness of our works, but for thy mercy's sake, and the merits of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, to whom with thee in the Holy Ghost be your Lord, honour, and glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Homily on Fasting, Part 1 Postscript in the preceding remarks, the observance of the fasts enjoined by the Church has been recommended on the ground of the practical wisdom and spiritual experience of the holy men, by whose advice they were adopted, rather than that of the direct authority of the Church. And this has been done not because the writer doubted the validity of that authority in this instance, but because it involved a question, which would to many appear distant and abstract, whether, namely, the Church's laws on this subject were by long disuse virtually abrogated. For I am persuaded that many excellent men would shrink from contravening a distinct command of their Church, do in fact neglect these, 
from some notion that the church herself has tacitly abandoned them. This notion does indeed appear to me to rest on a wrong supposition. For first, since the church has not annexed any censures to the neglect of this ordinance, which may correspond to the penal provisions of a civil law, the mere silence of the church, or of her spiritual authorities, is no proof of her acquiescence in the breach of its directions. Two, it would be admitted in any other case that the mere multitude of those who broke any law did not alone abrogate that law, that the intrinsic sanctity of the law cannot depend upon the obedience which men may yield to it, that the laxity or remissness of men at one period cannot annihilate the authority by which that remissness was to be controlled. The disobedience of others, be they many or few, nay, though they should be, even be the majority, can have no force in absolving us from the law by which we are in common bound. It is true that observances, which the Church has at one time on her own authority ordained, she may at another abrogate. Yet, until she do this, it is to be presumed that she wishes them to be retained in force. Now it has already happened that ordinances have for a time fallen into disuse, which yet were never intended to be abrogated, and which afterwards have been very beneficially revived. It is within the memory of man that the yearly commemoration of our blessed Saviour's death was in country congregations very generally omitted. This is now, I trust, almost universally observed. Nor is there any apparent reason why this other ordinance of the Church, whereby we humble ourselves for the sins which caused that death, should not, if men once came seriously to consider it, be promptly, and with very wholesome results, restored. I doubt not that if the question were formally proposed to the spiritual authorities of our church, whether they would think it advisable that our stated feast should be abolished, they would earnestly deprecate it. Their silence, therefore, on this subject is rather to be ascribed to the supposed hopelessness of attempting to bind our modern manners to ancient discipline than to any disparagement of the institutions themselves. Our institutions in many cases sleep, but are not dead. Nay, one has reason to hope that although the many neglect them, a faithful few have ever been found who have experienced and could testify the value of those which the world seems most entirely to neglect. Yet, although these grounds of church authority appear to myself perfectly valid, and I doubt not that many others will feel their weight as soon as they shall reflect upon them, the other argument, drawn from the practical wisdom and experience of the enactors of these regulations, seem to lie nearer to men's consciences. The argument lies in a narrow compass. Regular and stated fasts formed a part of the discipline by which all Christians of old, if health permitted, subdued the flesh to the spirit, and brought both body and mind into a willing obedience to the law of God. They thought this discipline necessary as an expression and instrument of repentance, as a memorial of their Saviour, to refrain their souls and keep them low, to teach them to trust in the Lord and seek communion with him. The value of this remedy for sin has come to us attested by the experience and sealed by the blood of martyrs, who having learnt thus to endure hardships like good soldiers of Christ, at last resisted to the blood, striving against sin. Shall we, untried, pronounce that to be needless for ourselves, which the goodly company of the prophets, the noble army of martyrs, the holy church throughout all the world, found needful? I can hardly anticipate other than one answer. Only let not any one be deterred by the irksomeness, or perplexities, or harassing doubts, which every one must find in resuming a neglected portion of duty. It was scarcely a discipline, if its practice brought with it an immediate reward, and we besides have to pay the penalty for our sloth and diseased habits. Patiently to lack what flesh and blood doth desire, and by virtue to forbear what by nature we covet, this no man attaineth unto, but with labour and long practice. And if it be that blessed instrument of holiness, which they who have tried it assure us, it will not be without some struggle with our spiritual enemy, that we shall recover the ground which we have lost. Only let us persevere, 
not elated with the first petty victories over ourselves, which may be perhaps conceded to us, in order to produce overconfidence and carelessness, nor dejected by the obstacles which a luxurious and scoffing age may oppose, nor by the yet greater difficulties from within in acquiring any uniform or consistent habit. Men, aided by God, have done the like, and for us also his grace will be sufficient. End of Tract 18Tract 19 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. On Arguing Concerning the Apostolical Succession by John Henry Newman. Men are sometimes disappointed with the proofs offered in behalf of some important doctrines of our religion, such especially as the necessity of episcopal ordination in order to constitute a minister of Christ. They consider these proofs to be not so strong as they expected, or as they think desirable. Now such persons should be asked whether these arguments they speak of are in their estimation weak as a guide to their own practice, or weak in controversy with hard-headed and subtle disputants. Surely, as Bishop Butler has convincingly shown, the faintest probabilities are strong enough to determine our conduct in a matter of duty. If there be but a reasonable likelihood of our pleasing Christ more by keeping than by not keeping to the fellowship of the apostolic ministry, this, of course, ought to be enough to lead those who think themselves moved to undertake the sacred office to seek for a license to do so from it. It is necessary to keep this truth distinctly in view because of the great temptation that exists among us to put it out of sight. I do not mean the temptation which results from pride, hardness of heart, a profane disregard of the details and lesser commandments of the divine law, and other such like bad principles of our nature, which are in the way of our honestly confessing it. Besides these, there is a still more subtle temptation to slight it, which will bear insisting on here, arising from an over-desire to convince others, or in other words, a desire to out-argue others, a fear of seeming inconclusive and confused in our own notions and arguments. Nothing, certainly, is more natural when we hold a truth strongly than to wish to persuade others to embrace it also. Nay, without reference to persuasion, nothing is more natural than to be dissatisfied in all cases with our own convictions of a principle or opinion, nay, suspicious of it, till we are able to set it down clearly in words. We know that, in all matters of thought, to write down our meaning is one important means of clearing our minds. Till we do so, we often do not know what we really hold and what we do not hold. And a cautious and accurate reasoner, when he has succeeded in bringing the truth of any subject home to his mind, next begins to look round about the view he has adopted, to consider what others will say to it, and to try to make it unexceptionable. At least we are led thus to fortify our opinion when it is actually attacked. And if we find we cannot recommend it to the judgment of the assailant, at any rate we endeavour to make him feel that it is to be respected. It is painful to be thought a weak reasoner, even though we are sure in our minds that we are not such. Now, observe how these feelings will affect us as regards such arguments as were alluded to above, viz., such as are open to exception, though they are sufficiently strong to determine our conduct. A friend who differs from us asks our reasons for our own view. We state them, and he sifts them. He observes that our conclusions do not necessarily follow from our premises, e.g., to make the argument for the apostolical succession derived from the ordination of St. Paul and St. Barnabas, Acts chapter 13, verses 2 and 3, he will argue that their ordination might have been an accidental rite, intended merely to commission them for their missionary journey which followed it in Asia Minor. Again, that St. Paul's direction to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22, to lay hands suddenly on no man, may refer to confirmation, not ordination. We should reply, and most reasonably too, that 
Considering the undeniable fact that ordination has ever been thought necessary in the Church for the Ministerial Commission, our interpretation is the most probable one, and therefore the safest to act upon. On which our friend will think a while, then shake his head, and say that, at all events, this is an unsatisfactory mode of reasoning, that it does not convince him, that he is desirous of clearer light, etc. Now what is the consequence of such a discussion as this on ourselves? Not to make us give up the doctrine, but to make us afraid of urging it. We grow lukewarm about it, and with an appearance of judgment and caution, as the world will call it, and confess that to rest the claims of our clergy on an apostolical descent is an unsafe and inexpedient line of argument, that it will not convince men, the evidence not being sufficient, that it is not a practical way of acting to insist upon it, etc. Whereas the utmost that need be admitted is that it is out of place to make it the subject of a speculative dispute, and to argue about it on that abstract logical platform which virtually excludes a reference to conduct and duty. And indeed, it would be no unwise caution to bear about us, wherever we go, that our first business, as Christians, is to address men as responsible servants of Christ, not as antagonists, and that it is but a secondary duty, though a duty, to refute the gainsayers. And as on the one hand it continually happens that those who are most skilled in debate are deficient in sound practical piety, so on the other it may be profitable to us to reflect that doctrines, which we believe to be most true, and which are received as such by the most profound and enlarged intellects, and which rest upon the most irrefragible proofs, yet may be above our disputative powers and can be treated by us only with reference to our conduct. And in this way, as in others, is fulfilled the saying of the Apostle, that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved it is the power of God. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. On reluctance to confess the apostolical succession. If a clergyman is quite convinced that the apostolical succession is lost, then of course he is at liberty to turn his mind from the subject. But if he is not quite sure of this, it surely is his duty seriously to examine the question, and to make up his mind carefully and deliberately. For if there be a chance of it being preserved to us, there is a chance of his having had a momentous talent committed to him, which he is burying in the earth. It cannot be supposed that any serious man would treat the subject scoffingly. If anyone is tempted to do so, let him remember the fearful words of the apostle. Esau, a profane person, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. If any are afraid that to insist on their commission will bring upon them ridicule and diminish their usefulness, let them ask themselves whether it be not cowardice to refuse to leave the event to God. It was the reproach of the men of Ephraim that, though they were harnessed and carried bows, they turned themselves back in the day of battle. And if any there be who take upon them to contrast one doctrine of the gospel with another, and preach those only which they consider the more essential, let them consider our Saviour's words. These things ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. End of Tract 19。Tract 20 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle the Visible Church. Letters to a Friend, Number 3, by John Henry Newman. My dear Blank, you have some misgivings, it seems, lest the doctrine I have been advocating should lead to popery. I will not, by way of answer, say that the question is not whether it will lead to popery, but whether it is in the Bible, 
because it would bring the Bible and Popery into one sentence, and seem to imply the possibility of a communion between light and darkness. No, it is the very enmity I feel against the papistical corruptions of the blessed gospel which leads me to press upon you a doctrine of Scripture, which we are sinfully surrendering, and the Church of Rome has faithfully retained. How comes it that a system so unscriptural as the popish makes converts? Because it has in it an element of truth and comfort amid its falsehoods. And the true way of opposing it is not to give up to them that element, which God's providence has preserved to us also, thus basely surrendering the inheritance of our fathers, but to claim it as our own, and to make use of it for the purposes for which God has given it to us. I will explain what I mean. Before Christ came, divine truth was, as it were, a pilgrim in the world. The Jews accepted, men who had portions of the Spirit of God knew not their privilege. The whole force and current of the external world was against them, acting powerfully on their imagination and tempting them to set sight against faith, to trust the many witnesses who prophesied falsehood, as if in the name of the Lord, rather than the still small voice which spoke within them. Who can undervalue the power of this fascination, who has had experience of the world ever so little? Who can go at this day into mixed society, who can engage in politics or other active business, but finds himself gradually drifting off from the true rock on which his faith is built, till he begins to despair to fancy, that solitude is the only safe place for the Christian, or, with a baser judgment, that strict obedience will not be required at the last day of those who have been engaged in active life. If such is now the power of the world's enchantments, surely much greater was it before our Saviour came. And what did he do for us in order to meet this evil? His merciful providence chose means which might act as a counter-influence on the imagination. The visible power of the world enthralled men to a lie. He set up a visible church to witness the other way, to witness for him, to be a matter of fact as undeniable as the shining of the sun, that there was such a principle as conscience in the world, as faith, as fear of God, that there were men who considered themselves bound to live as his servants. The common answer which we hear made every day to persons who engage in any novel undertaking is, You will get no one to join you. Nothing can come of it. You are singular in your opinion. You do not take practical views, but are spit with a fancy, with a dream of former times, etc. How cheering is it to a person so circumstanced to be able to point to others elsewhere who actually hold the same opinions as himself? and exert themselves for the same objects. Why? Because it is an appeal to a fact which no one can deny. It is an evidence that the view which influences him is something external to his own mind, and not a dream. What two persons see cannot be an ideal apparition. Men are governed by such facts, much more than by argumentative proof. These act upon the imagination. Let a person be told ten times over that an opinion is true. The fact of it being said becomes an argument for the truth of it. I.e., it is so with most men. We see from time to time the operation of this principle of our nature in political matters. Our American colonies revolt. France feels the sympathy of the event and is revolutionized. Again, in the same colonies, the Episcopal Church flourishes. We churchmen at home hail it as an omen of the church's permanence among ourselves. On the other hand, what can be more dispiriting to find a cause which we advocate sinking in some other country or neighbourhood, though there be no reason for concluding that, because it has fallen elsewhere, therefore it will among ourselves. In order then to supply this need of our minds, to satisfy the imagination, and so to help our faith, for this, among other reasons, Christ set up a visible society, his church, to be as a light upon a hill to all the ends of the earth, while time endures. It is a witness to the unseen world, a pledge of it, and a prefiguration of what hereafter will take place. It prefigures the ultimate separation of good and bad, 
holds up the great laws of God's moral governance and preaches the blessed truths of the gospel. It pledges to us the promises of the next world, for it is something, so to say, in hand. Christ has done one work as the earnest of another, and it witnesses the truth to the whole world, awing sinners, while it inspirits the fainting believer. And in all these ways it helps forward the world to come. And further, as the keeper of the sacraments, it is an essential means of realising it at present in our fallen race. Nor is it much to the purpose as regards our duty towards it, what are the feelings and spiritual state of the individuals who are its officers. True it is, were the church to teach heretical doctrine, it might become incumbent on us, a miserable obligation, to separate from it. But while it teaches substantially the truth, we ought to look upon it as one whole, one ordinance of God, not as composed of individuals, but as a house of God's building, as an instrument in his hand, to be used in reverence for the sake of its maker. Now the papists have retained it, and so they have the advantage of possessing an instrument which is, in the first place, suited to the needs of human nature, and next is a special gift of Christ, and so has a blessing with it. Accordingly, we see that in its measure, success follows their zealous use of it. They act with great force upon the imaginations of men. The vaunted antiquity, the universality, the unanimity of their church puts them above the varying fashions of the world and the religious novelties of the day. And truly, when one surveys the grandeur of their proceedings, a sigh arises in the thoughtful mind to think that we should be separate from them. Cum talis esses, untenam nostra esses. But alas, an union is impossible. Their communion is infected with heresy. We are bound to flee it as a pestilence. They have established a lie in the place of God's truth, and by their claim of immutability in doctrine cannot undo the sin they have committed. They cannot repent. Popery must be destroyed. It cannot be reformed. Now then, what is the Christian to do? Is he forced back upon that cheerless atheism, for so it practically must be considered, which prevailed in the world before Christ's coming, poorly alleviated as it was by the received polytheisms of the heathen? Can we conceive a greater calamity to have occurred at the time of our Reformation, one which the enemy of man would have been more set on effecting than to have entangled the whole of the Church Catholic in the guilt of heresy, and so have forced every one who worshipped in spirit and in truth to flee out of doors into the bleak world in order to save his soul? Do not think that Satan could have desired any event more eagerly than such an alternative, viz. to have forced Christians either to remain in communion with heresy or to join themselves in some such spontaneous union among themselves as is dissolved as easily as it is formed. Blessed be God! His malice has been thwarted. Do believe it to be one most conspicuous mark of God's adorable providence over us, as great as if we saw a miracle, that Christians in England escaped in that evil day from either extreme, neither corrupted doctrinally nor secularized ecclesiastically. Thus, in every quarter of the world, from North America to New South Wales, a Zohar has been provided for those who would fain escape Sodom, yet dread to be without shelter. I hail it as an omen amid our present perils that our church will not be destroyed. He has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He has wonderfully preserved our church as a true branch of the church universal, yet withal preserved it free from heresy. It is Catholic and apostolic, yet not papistical. With this reflection before us, does it not seem the most utter ingratitude to an astonishing providence of God's mercy to be neglectful, as many churchmen now are, of the gift? to attempt unions with those who have separated from the church, to break down the partition walls, and to argue as if religion were altogether and only a matter of each man's private concern, and that the state and nation were not bound to prefer the apostolical church to all self-originated forms of Christianity? But this is a point beside my purpose. Take the matter merely in the light of human expedience. 
Shall we be so far less wise in our generation than the children of this world, so as to relinquish the support which the truth receives from the influence of a visible church upon the imagination, from the energy of operation which a well-disciplined body ensures? Shall we not foil the papists, not with their own weapons, but with weapons which are ours as well as theirs? Or, on the other hand, shall we with a melancholy infatuation give up to them? Depend upon it. To insist on the doctrine of the visible church is not to favour the papists, it is to do them the most serious injury. It is to deprive them of their only strength. But if we neglect to do so, what will be the consequence? Break down the divine authority of our apostolical church and you are plainly preparing the way for popery in our land. Human nature cannot remain without visible guides. It chooses them for itself if it is not provided for them. If the aristocracy and the church fall, popery steps in. Political events are beyond our power, and perhaps out of our sphere, but ecclesiastical matters are in the hands of all churchmen. But my letter has run to an unusual length. Excuse it, and believe, etc. End of Tract 20 Tract 21 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Mortification of the Flesh, a Scripture Duty, by John Henry Newman. If we take the example of the holy men of Scripture as our guide, certainly body privation and chastisement are a very essential duty of all who wish to serve God and prepare themselves for his presence. First we have the example of Moses. His recorded fasts were miraculous. Still, they were fasts, and the ordinance was recommended to the notice of all believers afterwards by the honour put upon it. I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. Again, I fell down before the Lord, as at the first, forty days and forty nights. I did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 9 and 18. Fasting is in the former instance subservient to divine contemplation, in the latter to humiliation and intercession for sinners. Elijah. He said unto him, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they answered him, He was an hairy man, and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. Second Kings chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. It is indeed needless to show the ascetic character of him, who was in fact the chief and type of those who wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, in deserts and in mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth. He too fasted by the power of God for forty days and nights. He arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. 1 Kings, chapter 19, verse 8. Daniel. I set my face unto the Lord God, to seek by prayer and supplication, through fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God, and made my confession. Daniel, chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. It must be observed that Daniel was not bound by any vow, as Samson and Samuel. Moreover, it would appear the gift of prophecy was given him in reward for his self-chastisements, as the following passage shows. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Daniel chapter 10, verses 2, 3, 11, and 12. Vide also Luke chapter 2, verse 37, Acts chapter 10, verse 30. Now here it will be objected, perhaps, that these instances are taken from the Old Testament and belong to the law of Moses, which is not binding on Christians. I answer, first, that in the above passages, 
Fasting is connected with moral acts, humiliation, prayer, meditation, which are equally binding on us as on the Jews. Man is now what he was then, and if affliction of the flesh was good then, it is now. Second, in matter of fact, private fasting, such as instanced in the passages above quoted, was no special duty of the Mosaic law. Public fasting, indeed, was on one occasion enjoined by Moses himself, and on others by subsequent rulers. But this was in part a ceremonial act, not a moral discipline, and was doubtless abolished with the other rites of the law. Of fasts, says Lewis, there was no more than one appointed by the law of Moses, called the fast of expiation. The great day of expiation was a most severe fast, kept every year upon the tenth day of the month Titsri, which answers to our September. This solemnity was observed with fasting and abstinence, not only from all meat and drink, but from all other pleasure whatsoever, insomuch that they did not wash their faces, much less anoint their heads, nor wear their shoes, nor, if their doctors say true, read any portion of the law which would give them delight. They refrained likewise, not only from pleasure, but from labour, nothing being to be done upon this day, but confessing sins and repentance. Nay, it may rather be said that the Jewish law, as such, was rather opposed than otherwise to austerities. The Nazarites and Rechabites, being exceptions to the rule, are evidence to it. Vide, on the other hand, Deuteronomy chapter 12, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 18. Such then, being the character of the law in its formal letter, it tells just the contrary way to that which superficial reasoners might expect. For it is most remarkable, first, that the greatest prophets under it, such as Elijah and Daniel, were without express command, singularly austere and self-afflicting men, in the midst of a people, who from the first went lusting after the fish which they eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? Next, there is something of a very startling and admonitory nature in the miraculous fasts of Moses and Elijah, under the same imperfect dispensation. The miracle evidently was for some purpose, yet it did not sanction in any direct way any injunction of the law. Was it not an admonition to the Israelites that there was a more excellent way of obedience than that which your mighty God as yet thought fit to promulgate by solemn enactment? Is it not an intimation serviceable for Christian practice, as much as Moses' announcement of the destined prophet like unto him is intended for the comfort of Christian faith. Surely the duty of bodily discipline might be rested on the answer to this plain question. Why did Daniel use austerities not enjoined by the law? Now turn to the New Testament, and observe what clear light is therein thrown upon the duty already recommended to us by the Old Testament saints. First, there is the instance of St. John the Baptist. John came neither eating nor drinking, Matthew chapter 11 verse 28, and his disciples fasted, Matthew chapter 9 verse 14. Our Saviour did not statedly fast, but here also the exception proves the rule. He who did not fast was the only one born of woman who was untainted by sinful flesh, which seems to imply that all who are natural descendants of guilty Adam ought to fast. He bade his disciples to fast, Consider his implied precept, which is an express command to those who obey the law of liberty. When thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast. Matthew chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. Consider, moreover, the general austere character of Christian obedience as enjoined by our Lord. A circumstance much to be insisted on in an age like this, when what is really self-indulgence is thought to be a mere moderate and innocent use of this world's goods. I will but refer to a few out of many texts, which I am persuaded are now forgotten by numbers of educated and amiable men, who are fond of extolling what they call the mild, tolerant, enlightened spirit of the gospel. Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 and 30, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, chapter 10, verses 37 through 39, Mark chapter 9, verses 43 to 50, chapter 10, verse 25, Luke chapter 14, verses 12, 26 through 33. 
and reflect too whether the spirit of texts such as the following will not move every true member of the church militant. The ark and the Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. Second Samuel chapter 11 verse 11. Now take the example of the apostles. St. Peter was fasting when he had the vision which sent him to Cornelius. Acts chapter 10 verse 10. The prophets and teachers at Antioch were fasting when the Holy Ghost revealed to them his purpose about Saul and Barnabas. Acts chapter 3 verses 2 and 3. Vide also, Acts chapter 14 verse 23, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 5, and chapter 11 verse 27. Weigh well the following text, which I am persuaded many men would deny to be Sir Paul's writing, had not a gracious providence preserved to us the epistle containing it. I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. Lastly, consider the practice of the primitive Christians. The following account of the early Christian fasts is from Bingham, Antiquities, <coughs> Book 21. The Quadragesimal or Lent Fast The Quadragesimal Fast before Easter, says Sozomen, some observe six weeks as the Illyrian and Western churches, and all Libya, Egypt, and Palestine. Others make it seven weeks, as the Constantinopolitans and neighbouring nations, as far as Phoenicia. Others fast three only of those six or seven weeks by intervals. Others the three weeks next immediately before Easter. The manner of observing Lent amongst those that were piously disposed to observe it was to abstain from all food until evening, for anciently a change of diet was not reckoned a fast, but it consisted in perfect abstinence from all sustenance for the whole day till evening. The Fasts of the Four Seasons The next anniversary fasting days were those which were called Jejunia Quatuor Tempororum, the fasts of the four seasons of the year. These were at first designed to beg a blessing of God upon the several seasons of the year, or to return thanks for the benefits received in each of them, or to exercise and purify both body and soul in a more particular manner, at the return of these certain terms of stricter discipline and more extraordinary devotion. These afterwards became the ember fasts. Monthly fasts. In some places they also had monthly fasts throughout the year, except in the two months of July and August, because of the sickness of the season. Weekly fasts. Besides these, they had their weekly fasts on Wednesday and Friday, called the stationary days, and half fasts, or fasts of the fourth and sixth days of the week. These fasts being of continual use every week throughout the year, except in the fifty days between Easter and Pentecost, were not kept with that rigour and strictness which was observed in the time of Lent, but ordinarily held no longer than nine o'clock, i.e. three in the afternoon. End of Tract 21track 22 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Richard Nelson II, The Athanasian Creed, by Thomas Keeble. Athanasius' Creed ought thoroughly to be received and believed, for it may be proved by the most certain warrants of Holy Scripture. Article 8. I look back with much pleasure to the visit I had from my friend Mr. Woodnot, the Bristol merchant I before spoke of. He stayed with me some days, and we had many agreeable rambles and discussions together, which were to me peculiarly interesting, from the wide experience he had had of men and things, and of places too, as he had often been abroad, in Switzerland, in Turkey, and on different parts of the American continent, where he had spent some years. Two or three days after our meeting with Richard Nelson, as stated before, we took our walk, it being a pleasant evening towards the end of August, along the side of a little stream, which we traced for a mile or two down the valley, returning by a kind of natural terrace, which terminated my favourite beach walk. The sun was low when we got here, and we stood still, it was not far from Nelson's garden hedge, to admire its rich glow on the opposite side of the valley. 
I was pointing out to my friend a bold and almost mountainous outline of hills rising in the distance, far to the west in Lancashire. Pendle Hill, as I fancied, and other lofty tracts in the neighbourhood of Clitheroe. We were speculating of the distance they might be from us. Sir, said a voice which startled me from my not observing that anyone was near, Pendle Hill must be full fifty miles off. What you see is most likely some of the high ground beyond Halifax. Why, Richard, said I, what are you doing down there? For I could scarcely see more than his head. You seem to be making a strong entrenchment round your castle. No, I dare say, sir, he answered. You may wonder what I'm about, but at this time of year, when the springs are low, I generally spend an hour, when I have leisure in an evening, in repairing the garden mound, that it may be fit to stand against the assaults of what I may call my two winter enemies. What can they be? I asked. I did not know that you had any enemies. Oh, yes, sir, I have, he replied. At least my garden had two. Land floods and Scotch ponies. Almost every winter, once if not twice, there is a violent land flood from the high ground behind the house, and if this ditch were not kept clear to take the water off immediately, the garden would not recover the damage all the next year. To be sure, this kind of flood does not commonly last many hours. That is long enough, you know, sir, to spoil the labour of weeks and months. That I can understand, I answered. But how can you be in any alarm about highland ponies? I cannot imagine. Why, said he, you know, sir, that there is a fair at the town every year, early in the spring, where a great many of these ponies are bought and sold. And for many years past, Mr. Savall, the owner of this field, has led it for one day and night to the horse dealer, a well-known man out of Lincolnshire, to turn those ponies into, as well as other horses he may have purchased at the fair. The first year I was here, I was not aware of this custom, and had taken no precaution against it. So these little mountaineers got in at a weak place in the hedge during the night, and trod the garden, as one may say, to a mummy. So to protect myself for the future against such mischievous visitors, I put this fence along, which I was now repairing. And if you will please to look at it, I think you, sir, will allow that it was not badly contrived, though I say it who should not say it. All along the whole length of the garden, which might be perhaps nearly one hundred yards, on that side which was next the footpath, he had fixed very neatly, but halfway up the slope of the ditch on the opposite side, a double indented line of strong, sharp stakes, pointing upwards, presenting a sort of chevaux de frise, an impenetrable barrier which no pony, highland or lowland, could possibly get through or over. We said something in commendation of his skill and precaution, on which he observed, I'm glad, sir, that you approve of what I've done, for it has cost me a good deal of labour. And my neighbour, Farmer Yawn, who has been standing by me for the last three quarters of an hour and just went away as you came up, he says I'm taking a great deal of trouble and very likely for nothing. How can I be sure there will be a land flood, or that the man will turn in the ponies? And besides, says he, neither land flood nor ponies would stay twelve hours. But I know better, sir, than to take Mr Yawn's advice, for if my bit of garden should be ruined for a twelvemonth, it would be no comfort afterwards to think that perhaps it might not have happened, or that the mischief was quickly done, or that with timely precaution it might have been prevented. After a few more words, we wished him a good evening, and walked on a little way in silence, which my companion put an end to by saying, It must be confessed that our friend Nelson is a sensible man, and not the less so, added he with a smile, because I am sure he would agree with me in opinion. For in the course of our walk, we had been discussing rather earnestly the subject of the Athanasian Creed, the question between us not being as to the doctrines contained in it, but as to the expediency of retaining it in the liturgy, supposing any changes should take place in that also as in everything else. Not that there was any real difference of opinion between us on that point either, but wishing to know his views on the subject, I had been urging the various objections, such of them at least as are most plausible, and had been gratified with observing how little weight he attached to them. And my satisfaction was the greater, because, from his education and profession, as a layman and a merchant, he could not be accused of what had been scornfully designated as academical and clerical prejudices. In the course of our conversation, he had expressed himself most earnestly in favour of the Athanasian creed. 
alleging for this his opinion, various reasons, and among others the following, that he regarded this creed in the light of a fence or bullock, set up to protect the truth against all innovations and encroachments, and that to take it away, particularly in times when popular opinion, or rather feeling, was against it, would be almost high treason against God. That was his word would be, so far as in us lies, willfully to expose the truth to be trodden down by its enemies. Now, said he, whilst you were talking to our friend Nelson, it struck me that his care about his garden very aptly expresses our duty in respect to this very subject. For why is this creed so obnoxious? Simply because it is so sharply and strongly worded. Because it leaves no opening for a semi-Socinian or a five-quarter latitudinarian to creep in at because it presents an insurmountable obstacle to every intruder who would trample underfoot the Lord's vineyard. And even if the aspect of things were more favourable, even if there were no sign of danger at hand, I would much rather advise that, like Nelson, we should look forward to probable or possible inroads, than venture to neglect, much less to remove, our fences. But, he continued, in the present condition of what is, by courtesy one might almost say facetiously, called the Christian world, it were in my judgment little less than madness to yield to so strong a position. One, too, which if once lost, can never be recovered. And then he referred to what he had before been insisting on, the great mistake made by the American church in rejecting the Athanasian creed from her liturgy, and how, from personal observation during his residence first at New York and afterwards at Charleston, he was sure the time would come when its loss would be felt and acknowledged by the true sons of that church. And I wish, added he, as we concluded our walk and our discussion together, we would endeavour to ascertain what are the sentiments of our friend Nelson on the subject, for I have no doubt he has turned it over in his mind, and his opinion must certainly be of value, because happily for himself he has not been, I suppose, in the way of hearing the profane absurdities that are daily written and spoken against an inestimable creed. Yes, said I, whatever his opinions are, I doubt not they will be found candid and free from unreasonable prejudice, and I would take an early opportunity of ascertaining them. Soon after this my friend left me, and I promised to communicate to him the result of my inquiries. The Sunday following, it being a serene autumnal morning, according to the description of the divine poet, most calm, most bright. I proceeded earlier than usual towards the school. When I came up to Richard's cottage, he was standing at the gate with his infant child in his arms, looking as if he could envy no man, as if Sunday were to him what it should be to us all, the couch of time, cares, balm, and bay. "'You're rather earlier, sir, than usual,' he said. "'Yes,' I answered. The morning is so lovely, so Sunday-like, I could not endure to stay any longer within doors. After some few observations had passed between us, in which he expressed with an unaffected solemnity of manner peculiar to himself, his sense of the value of each returning Lord's Day, calling it, and I think he used, though unconsciously, Isaac Walton's very words, a step towards a blessed eternity. I asked him if he would have any objection to take two or three turns with me in the beach walk, as it still wanted a considerable time to school. He answered that he would gladly accompany me, especially as it might be better for the child to be taken under the shade of the trees. Richard, I said, my friend Mr. Woodnot, and I may call him your friend too, was much amused with your plan for keeping off the enemies of your garden. He commended it highly and thinks you therein set a good example to all true churchmen, and especially to us of the clergy. In what respect, sir? he asked. Why, I replied, in keeping your fences strong and sharp, and contrived in the best possible way to serve the purpose of fences, namely, to preserve one's property from injury. For we understood you to say, that were it not for a little observation and foresight, however well all might be for 364 days in the year, in one twenty-four hours all might be laid waste, either by the torrent from the high ground above you, or by the cattle from your neighbour's field. Indeed, sir, he answered, that is no more than the truth. But I confess I do not exactly see how in acting thus I have set any particularly good example. 
No person of common sense could do otherwise. As to that, I replied, perhaps what some witty man said of common honesty, he might too have said of common sense, that it is a very uncommon thing. But be that as it may, it would certainly appear to me to be no mark of sense nor of honesty either, if we Christians who are put in trust, as St. Paul speaks, with the gospel, were to draw back from our strong advanced positions in the vain hope that the enemy would be content with this success and encroach no further. May I ask, sir, he said, what it is you refer to? Why, Richard, I replied, of course you have heard that a great many people think that the church prayer book ought to be altered, and that first and foremost the Athanasian creed ought to be put out of it. Sir, said he, oh, I've heard more than one person make this observation, but I never took much account of it till about a year or eighteen months ago, when a brother-in-law of mine, who was fond of poring over the newspapers, told me he'd been reading extracts from the works of a famous preacher, one Dr. Hoadley, which I am sorry to say he was inclined to admire. For in these extracts there were objections made to other parts of the church service, and particularly to the Athanasian Creed, which, the doctor said, was a great blot in the prayer book, and that he wished we were well rid of it, with other such disrespectful expressions. Now, sir, it seemed to me such a thing for a clergyman who had signed the articles and the prayer book, and had his maintenance from the church, and had taken an oath before God and man to teach the truth to his flock, according to the prayer book, that a church minister should take upon him to omit so remarkable a portion of the church service, nay more, should speak so slightingly of what he had solemnly assented to, and was even sworn to. This seemed to me to be astonishing, and, I must confess to you, even shocking. And, sir, I thought of what my mother had said to me in her last illness about the danger of trifling with God Almighty. I thought, too, if there should be many such clergymen as this Dr. Hoadley, what confusion and perplexity they would throw people's minds into driving some, perhaps, into downright infidelity. And then I went on to reflect, what if my poor children should hereafter fall into the way of some such false teachers, and learn to deny the Lord that bought them, and to despise the spirit of grace? This I thought I could not endure, so I resolved that with God's gracious help I would search the matter out for myself. For surely, sir, it is a matter in which not the clergy only, but we all are deeply interested." You say right, I replied. The knowledge of God's truth must be the greatest earthly treasure to us all. It unquestionably concerns the laity full as much as it does the clergy to ascertain the truth and to keep it, also to hand it on pure and uncorrupted to their children after them. He proceeded. My plan was this. First to endeavour to make out what was the intention of the church in appointing this and the other two creeds to be occasionally used, and then to try this Athanasian creed by scripture rules. And if I could not reconcile it to them, why then certainly, however unwillingly, I should have joined an opinion with those who wished to have left it out of the prayer book. A very good plan, said I. But you must recollect that the enemies of this creed would ask what possible reason you could have for being unwilling to part with it, especially when you know that great numbers of people have so vehement a dislike to it. Sir, said he, I've long made up my mind that on questions of this kind, relating to God and eternity, people's likings and dislikings are not much in the scale either way. But I think, sir, I can offer one or two good excuses for my being unwilling to have this creed laid aside. In the first place, it would give me pain to have any great alterations made in such a book as the prayer book, which I've been used to from my infancy, which as a child I was always taught to reverence, and which... I'm not ashamed to say, I do reverence from my heart more and more the older I grow. In the next place, I am sure all must allow that some parts of the Athanasian Creed are very noble and beautiful to hear, especially when they are well read or repeated. And again, even a child may see that if this creed be put away, great encouragement will be given not only to protest infidels, but also to many wild, thoughtless persons who would fain believe that religion, like everything else, needs to be radically reformed. But Richard, I said, you are not, I suppose, so vain as to imagine that our church reformers would be willing to keep the prayer book just as it is, 
Merely because you and I and a few more admire some of the clauses in this creed? Sir, said he, you may be sure I never imagined such a thing. I was not presuming to give an opinion whether or not the prayer book is likely to be improved by any alterations which may be made in it. I was only excusing myself for being loath to part with the Athanasian creed. But, said I, will you now tell me what conclusion you came to in your inquiry into the intention of the church in appointing this and the other two creeds to be used? I remembered, he said, that I had heard you, sir, or someone whose opinion I could take on these subjects, make an observation that the three creeds were not written all at the same time, but at three different periods. That the Apostles' Creed was made first, either in the time of the Apostles, or very soon after. That the Nicene Creed came next, after an interval of 200 years or more. And that then again, after another considerable space, I think I understood more than a century, followed the Creed of St. Athanasius, as it was called. So it came to my thoughts that the church seemed to act like a tender mother, very anxious for her children from the very first, but growing still more and more anxious as they grew older, are more exposed to dangers, and yet less and less willing to yield themselves to her control. Thus it may seem that in the most ancient, the Apostles' Creed, a plain, simple rule of faith is given. In the next, the Nicene Creed, the same rule is laid down, but at more length, and in a tone of anxiety and caution as if the enemy were at hand. But in the last, the Athanasian Creed, where still the very same rule of faith is laid down, the alarm is loudly sounded. There is throughout an expression of urgent warning, as needful for persons in the very midst of foes, some open and more secret foes, who would rob God of his honour and man of the everlasting inheritance purchased for him by his Saviour's blood. Indeed, said I, it is fearful to think what lengths the pride of human reason will draw to those who yield to it. Before you proceed with your statement, I should wish to know what opinion you have come to respecting what are so falsely, not to say profanely, called the damnatory clauses in the Athanasian Creed. You are doubtless aware that many good sort of persons who profess not to disapprove of the other parts of the Creed are, or at least fancy themselves, much offended and hurt in their feelings by these clauses. Observe, I am not now exactly referring to persons who speak harshly or disrespectfully of this creed, but rather to persons of piety and learning, who with all reverence for it as an ancient and true confession of faith, have yet thought that some of the expressions in it are unnecessarily strong, and what they cannot endure to repeat or to hear. Sir, he replied, if it is not presumptuous in me to pass my opinion on the conduct of such persons as you represent, I should say to them, if you can endure to believe these things, you may also to endure to acknowledge such your belief, and to hear it confirmed by the voice of the church. The parent who cannot endure to correct his child will doubtless live to repent his mistaken tenderness, as we are taught in Scripture. And if the church or her ministers through like false pity, should no longer endure to hold out to our consciences the terrors of the Lord, we of the people shall no doubt have cause to lament their mistaken tenderness. Even though now, like overindulged children, we may many of us be impatient of strict restraint, or of warning seemingly severe. Yet if the church will be firm to her sacred trust, many souls will doubtless in the end bless God for these very warnings and threatenings, which now they fancy to be almost intolerable. But as to persons who scruple not to speak scornfully and reproachfully of this creed, or any part of it, I must think such language as theirs shows rashness and ignorance too, very unbecoming a Christian. For it may well be asked, is a mother to be blamed who, seeing her child in imminent danger, warns them of it in language the most powerful her tongue can give utterance to? If the gospel of Christ be indeed our only hope, is not the church a true friend to us in telling us so, in making us confess it, as one may almost say, whether we choose or no? If the gospel of the Lord Jesus be our only hope, is this not kind? Indeed, said I, your argument is most just. It is the truest kindness to warn people of their danger. But as it is too often a thankless office, so in the present instance... 
For as you know, these which may fittingly be called the warning clauses, or the monetary clauses, are especially reviled. As in fact, the tendency of the whole creed is accounted to be unscriptural and uncharitable, even by some who think themselves, and desire to be thought by others, very serious Christians. Sir, said he, to any Christian who was disposed to think so ill of it, I should like just to mention a conversation I had some time last year with the man of our parish, Edmund Plush, the man that has set up the new beer house. You know, sir, I dare say that he was once a gentleman's servant. I have heard so, I answered. But as I see some of the boys coming, it is time for me to leave you and make the best of my way to the school. And I, said he, will take the child back, be after you in a quarter of an hour. But in the evening I shall hope, sir, to have some further conversation with you. I hope so too, I answered. But as it happened, I was called to go after the evening service to visit a sick person in a distant part of the parish, and a week or two passed away before we again met. He then happened to come to my house one evening to settle an account. I desired he might come with me into my study. When we had concluded our business, I told him I wished he would stay half an hour, that we might finish the conversation which we had broken off so abruptly before. He said, if I were disengaged, he would be glad to stay, and not without some difficulty, I prevailed on him to sit down. Richard, I said, if you recollect, you were going to tell me of a conversation you had with Edmund Plush. Yes, sir, he replied. I had two or three days' work pointing his garden wall, for Edmund is very curious about his fruit, especially about some favourite Orlean plums. And one day, as he was standing by me, and running on with his talk about alterations and reforms, he said, among other observations, not very moderate, that the church prayer book wanted to be altered and reformed as much as anything. To this I replied that alteration was one thing and reform was another, and that if the prayer book was altered, it did not follow that it would be reformed. He then went on to say that while he was footman at Squire Martingale's over in Cheshire one day, when he was waiting at table, and there were three or four gentlemen at dinner, they were talking about the prayer book, and whether it was not now time for it to be altered. And the squire gave it as his opinion that there was one word in particular which he wished very much to see put entirely out of the book, and that was the word damnation. Such words as that, he said, ought not to be in a book, which gentlefolks were expected to sit and hear. Edmund went on to say that there was a gentleman at the table who observed it would be better to alter the word to condemnation, which the company very much approved, though, as Plush himself remarked, it was not easy to see what was gained by the alteration. Now, sir, it does seem to me that Squire Martingill and his friends forgot, when they made such short work with the prayer book, that there was the Bible still in their way, quite as much needing to be corrected and amended. And I told Edmund so, and I also told him that if I were in his place, I should not like to go about repeating private conversations which he might have overheard at his master's table, especially when they were so little calculated to be of use. However, Edmund must do as he pleases. But for myself, sir, I do assure you that after giving the subject the best consideration of my power, the objections which people make against the Athanasian Creed are, to my thinking, not at all more substantial than Squire Martingale's against the prayer book and Bible. Indeed, sir, it is my opinion that there is nothing in that creed either unscriptural or uncharitable, but quite the very contrary. That it is essentially as I once heard you call the combination service, in its matter Christian truth, and in its manner Christian love. And, sir, if you will not be weary of me, I will try to show you how I came to this conclusion. Richard, said I, you need not fear that you will tire me. Well, sir, he proceeded, it seemed to me plain from the scriptures, what no one indeed will deny or question, that the great almighty God should be the object of all our love and adoration. From the same scriptures it also appeared that the Lord Jesus Christ, our only Saviour and hope, is entitled to all our love and adoration. And again, from the same scriptures it appears that the Holy Spirit of God, the only sanctifier, guide and guardian of his church, is entitled to all our love and adoration. Certainly, I replied, no one who believes the scriptures can doubt this. And is not this, he said, the very doctrine of the first part of the creed, 
that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. And yet they are not three gods, but one God. In like manner, if any man inquire for the very foundation of Christian hope and consolation, surely it is the doctrine that God our Saviour took on him our frail and mortal nature, that he was perfect man as well as perfect God. Without this doctrine, the peculiar hopes and consolations of the gospel fade away and disappear. Now this is the great truth pressed on our thoughts in the second part of the Athanasian Creed, where we are taught boldly to maintain that the right faith is that we believe and confess. Not believe only, but believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man. Yes, I answered. It is difficult to imagine how anyone who acknowledges the truth of the Scriptures can deny and question this. But you must, I am sure, be aware that many people object that this doctrine is not simply stated, and so left to everyone's own conscience to approve, but that attempts are made to draw out distinctions and explanations which are not in the Scripture, and which no one can understand. And then, after all, people are made to say that whoever does not believe all this has no chance of salvation. Sir, he replied, there is a verse in the Psalms which seems to give an answer to such objections. If I should say like them, I should condemn the generation of God's children. No one will dare deny that those who frame this creed, and those who put into our prayer book, were good and holy men, sincerely anxious for the honour of Almighty God, and for the salvation of men's souls. It was surely not their fault that these distinctions and explanations, if they are to be so called, became necessary, but the fault of rash or loose-minded people who attempted to corrupt the hearts of the simple with their false distinctions and false explanations. Against such, the church, as a good parent should, warns her sons in the strongest terms, and if stronger terms could have been found, no doubt she would have used them. And it seems to me that it is not at all the intention of the church, in this creed or anywhere else, to endeavour to explain what is above human comprehension, but only to warn us that quibbled and pretended distinctions have been made of old, and will be again, against the essential doctrines of the gospel, and that, come in whatever shape they may, they are to be opposed at once with a sharp and strong denial, to be at once, and as the article says, thoroughly rejected. And the absolute need of some such strong and penetrable fence appears from what I have heard that there have been church people, and even clergymen who denied these doctrines, and, as might be expected, scorned this creed. How could they reconcile their conduct to their consciences? It is not for me to say. But it is plain that if the fence were taken away and weakened, the danger to the fold would be much increased. And I fully agree with you, was my reply. But you know those who dislike this creed assert that the fence, as you call it, is much sharper and stronger than it need be, and that it would be better to have no monetary clauses at all than any expressed in such strong and, as they call them, violent terms. Sir, he answered, you know that in different parts of the New Testament we are taught that adultery, fornication, drunkenness and other such crimes are entirely unsuitable to the Christian profession, and that persons who are guilty of them do in practice renounce the gospel. Now, Supposing it should be thought well by the governors of the church to set forth a solemn warning to profligates thus worded, Whosoever shall be saved, before all things it is necessary that he avoid the crimes of adultery, whoredom, drunkenness, and blasphemy, which crimes, unless every one do carefully abstain from, without doubt he shall perish everlastingly. And if then there were to follow some solemn admonitions, setting forth, according to the sense, though not in the very words of Scripture, the necessity of self-denial, mortification, and constant communion with Almighty God in prayer and at his holy table, so that the affections may be kept set on high and heavenly things, and all concluding thus, this is the rule of Christian purity, which except a man observe faithfully he cannot be saved. Do not you, sir, think such warnings would be quite agreeable to Scripture and to Christian charity? <laughs> Indeed I think so, I replied. And yet, he proceeded, Supposing such an admonition as this were to be made by authority in order to be printed in all the prayer books and to be read twelve times a year in every church in England, do you not think that there will be a great outcry against it? 
and that many people, when it was going to be read, would shut their books, or perhaps go out of the church? It is too probable, I replied, considering how little account is made of crimes of this kind, even by many who are thought religious people. Indeed, I have understood from a person I can rely on, otherwise I would not have credited her, that one of the objections that Mr. Cartwright himself brought against the prayer book was that in the litany, fornication is termed a deadly sin. It is strange indeed, sir, said he, and sad to think that anyone who believes the scriptures could offer such an objection. But it confirms an opinion I was going to express to you. For if a good kind of man, as Mr. Cartwright is said to be, objects to the litany on such grounds, how much more is it to be expected that such an admonition as that which I have spoken of will be frequently scorned and hooted at? And then, continued he, Supposing such an admonition as this had been made and used in the church for hundreds of years, and it were now to be left out in the reformed prayer book, would not such a measure give great satisfaction and encouragement to all the loose, dissolute people throughout the country? That cannot be doubted, I answered. But there is one objection, absurd enough to be sure, which people offer against the Athanasian Creed, which you have not noticed, perhaps because you have never heard of it. The objection, I mean, is that this creed leaves no allowance for unavoidable ignorance, or bad education, nor any chance even for persons of weak, doubting minds, no, not for idiots or children, to escape from its heavy censures. It is obviously an absurd objection, yet it is what people do urge, and people too who make pretension to reason and religion. Sir, said he, I can never suppose that any really conscientious person whose mind was free from prejudice, could offer such an objection. It must be quite plain to all candid minds that as in the scripture itself, so in the church prayer book, we are always instructed to believe that our merciful God makes allowance for our weakness and blindness in matters of knowledge and faith, as well as in other things. As in the scriptures, so in the church prayer book, we are always taught that occasional doubt and perplexity are no proof of want of faith, that he truly believes who acts, if I may say so, upon trust, who, like Abraham, the father of the faithful, obeys and goes on obeying, not knowing whither he goes, knowing only that if he follow God's guidance, he must be right. It is, too, always taught, as in the scriptures, so in the prayer book, that upon true repentance, sincere faith in the blood and mediation of the one Redeemer, and entire submission to the guidance of the one sanctifier, it is, I say, always taught that the door of mercy is open even to the most inveterate sinners, whatever the nature of their sins might have been, unless indeed the sin against the Holy Ghost be considered an exception, to guard Christians against which may be supposed one great and surely charitable purpose of this creed. How then, he proceeded, can the church with any show of reason be called uncharitable, which, with this evangelical doctrine implied in all her services, uses occasionally the strongest language of warning, or even of threatening, against fatal sins and errors, if by any means she may preserve the souls committed to her charge steadfast in the faith, the faith which was once delivered unto the saints? Yes, said I, once for all, never to be changed or frittered away in base compliance with the ever-varying customs and fancies of worldly and self-conceited men. And, sir, he proceeded, I put it to myself in this way. What a fearful thing it would be for a person on his deathbed to deny the Son of God, the only Redeemer, and the Spirit of God, the only Comforter. Now the Church Prayer Book considers us all, as it were, on our deathbeds, or at least but a little way from them. The services for the visitation of the sick and the burial of the dead come very close after baptism and the catechism. As we should wish to die, so the church would have us live. If it be an awful thought to pass into eternity in will for ignorance or negligence of the essential truths of the gospel, is it not also an awful thought that people should spend this their probationary time in such ignorance or negligence? And again, I would ask, can the church be called uncharitable, which earnestly and incessantly, and in the plainest, strongest words that the English language can supply, warns her members of their danger in this respect? Certainly, Richard, I replied. 
what you say is most worthy to be thought on by all persons who find fault with this creed. But I wish you to recollect that many of them take what they call high ground in their argument. They confidently assert that it is bigoted, unscriptural, unchristian, and other such hard names, to pretend that modes of faith, that is their term, are of any great importance, or indeed of any importance at all. That if a man's life is in the right, his faith can't be wrong. That of course adultery and those kind of things are forbidden in the Testament, but there are a few passages, or as some of them say, none at all, which can be brought forward in support of the opinions put forth in the Athanasian Creed. Much less, they assert, can any passages be found, denouncing so heavy a woe against those who reject these opinions. Sir, he replied with more than even his usual energy, I will be bold to say that there are as many passages in the New Testament distinctly proving and supporting the great doctrines put forth in the Athanasian Creed as there are passages expressly forbidding adultery and other such crimes. But supposing it were otherwise, it really does not appear to me that the case would be different. Gambling is not in words forbidden, so far as I can recollect, in any part or passage of the Old or New Testament. Yet no one doubts, I mean no serious thinking person, that it is one of the most fatal habits a person can get into. Not because it is expressly forbidden in any part or passage, but because it is against the whole gospel, utterly inconsistent with a Christian's practice. Now, sir, it really does appear to me that to deny the great doctrines contained in this noble creed is not merely to go against express passages of Scripture. Passages, I mean, wherein our Lord Jesus and the Blessed Spirit are spoken of as God. But more than this, it is against the whole gospel, utterly inconsistent with a Christian's faith. Well, Richard, I said, the considerations you have suggested are certainly such as should lead all Christians to pause before they encourage in themselves, or others, any dislike of this ancient, and as you justly call it, this noble creed. Sir, he replied, in my poor judgment, it is indeed a noble, a magnificent confession. But still, noble and magnificent as it is, if it, or any part of it, were against scripture, or against Christian charity, I, for one, should not be easy to were put out of the prayer book. How happy, then, am I to think that it breathes the very spirit of pure Christian charity, of love more than parental, of love like his, sir, who so often would have gathered his children together as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but they would not. Yes, Richard, I said. And often as this tender yearning anxiety for men's souls is displayed in the conduct and words of our adored master, I have frequently thought it nowhere more strikingly appears than in that pathetic chapter of warnings to which you refer, the 23rd of St. Matthew, a chapter truly of monetary clauses. Sir, he answered, it might almost be expected of those who rashly accuse the Church of uncharitableness for retaining the Athanasian Creed that they should also wish to have that chapter left out of the calendar. As indeed, I have heard that they do wish many of the Psalms to be omitted on some such ground. But now, it is time for me to wish you good evening, hoping, sir, that I have not taken too great a liberty in thus speaking out my opinions, or wearied you by staying too long. Richard, said I, once for all, believe me, it is one of the chief comforts and encouragements I have to be with you at church and at school and to talk with you on these great subjects. End of Tract 22